Desperate Remedies by Thomas Hardy Part 2 12 The Events of 10 Months December to April Week after week, month after month, the time had flown by. Christmas had passed, dreary winter with dark evenings had given place to more dreary winter with light evenings. Thaws had ended in rain, rain in wind, wind in dust. Showery days had come the period of pink dawns and white sunsets, with the third week in April the cuckoo had appeared, with the fourth, the nightingale. Edward Springrove was in London, attending to the duties of his new office, and it had become known throughout the neighborhood of Carry Ford that the engagement between himself and Miss Adelaide Hinton would terminate in marriage at the end of the year. The only occasion on which her lover of the idle delicious days at Budmouth Watering Place had been seen by Cytherea after the time of the decisive correspondence, was once in church, when he sat in front of her, and beside Miss Hinton. The Renko Unter was quite an accident. Spring Grove had come there in the full belief that Cytherea was away from home with Miss Aldclyffe, and he continued ignorant of her presence throughout the service. It is at such moments as these when a sensitive nature writhes under the conception that its most cherished emotions have been treated with contumely, that the sphere descended made, music, friend of pleasure at other times, becomes a positive enemy racking, bewildering, unrelenting. The congregation sang the first psalm and came to the verse. Like some fair tree which, fed by streams, with timely fruit doth bend, he still shall flourish, and success. All his designs attend. Cytherea's lips did not move, nor did any sound escape her, but could she help singing the words in the depths of her being, although the man to whom she applied them sat at her rival's side? Perhaps the moral compensation for all a woman's petty cleverness under thriving conditions is the real nobility that lies in her extreme foolishness at these other times, her sheer inability to be simply just her exercise of an illogical power entirely denied to men in general the power not only of kissing, but of delighting to kiss the rod by a punctilious observance of the self-immolating doctrines in the Sermon on the Mount. As for Edward a little like other men of his temperament, to whom, it is somewhat humiliating to think, the aberrancy of a given love is in itself a recommendation his sentiment, as he looked over his cousin's book, was of a lower rank, Horatian rather than Samotic. Oh. What hast thou of her, of her? Whose every look did love inspire? Whose every breathing fanned my fire? And stole me from myself away? Then, without letting him see her, Cytherea slipped out of church early, and went home, the tones of the organ still lingering in her ears as she tried bravely to kill a jealous thought that would nevertheless live, my nature is one capable of more, far more. Intense feeling than hers she can't appreciate all the sides of him she never will he is more tangible to me even now, as a thought, than his presence itself is to her she was less noble then. But she continually repressed her misery and bitterness of heart till the effort to do so showed signs of lessening. At length she even tried to hope that her lost lover and her rival would love one another very dearly. The scene and the sentiment dropped into the past. Meanwhile, Manston continued visibly before her. He, though quiet and subdued in his bearing for a long time after the calamity of November, had not simulated a grief that he did not feel. At first his loss seemed so to absorb him though as a startling change rather than as a heavy sorrow that he paid Cytherea no attention whatever. His conduct was uniformly kind and respectful, but little more. Then, as the date of the catastrophe grew remoter, he began to wear a different aspect towards her. He always contrived to obliterate by his manner all recollection on her side that she was comparatively more dependent than himself making much of her womanhood, nothing of her situation. Prompt to aid her whenever occasion offered, and full of delightful petty so-ins at all times, he was not officious. In this way he irresistibly won for himself a position as her friend, and the more easily in that he allowed not the faintest symptom of the old love to be apparent. Matters stood thus in the middle of the spring when the next move on his behalf was made by Miss Aldclyffe. The 3rd of May. She led Cytherea to a summer house called the Fane, built in the private grounds about the mansion in the form of a Grecian temple, it overlooked the lake, the island on it, the trees, and their undisturbed reflection in the smooth still water. Here the old and young maid halted, here they stood, side by side, 
mentally imbibing the scene. The month was May the time, morning. Cuckoos, thrushes, blackbirds, and sparrows gave forth a perfect confusion of song and twitter. The road was spotted white with the fallen leaves of apple blossoms, and the sparkling grey dew still lingered on the grass and flowers. Two swans floated into view in front of the women, and then crossed the water towards them. They seem to come to us without any will of their own quite involuntarily don't they, said Cytheria, looking at the bird's graceful advance. Yes, but if you look narrowly you can see their hips just beneath the water, working with the greatest energy. I'd rather not see that, it spoils the idea of proud indifference to direction which we associate with a swan. It does, we'll have involuntarily. Ah, now this reminds me of something. Of what? Of a human being who involuntarily comes towards yourself. Cytheria looked into Miss Aldclyffe's face, her eyes grew round as circles, and lines of wonderment came visibly upon her countenance. She had not once regarded Manston as a lover since his wife's sudden appearance and subsequent death. The death of a wife, and such a death, was an overwhelming matter in her ideas of things. Is it a man or woman, she said, quite innocently. M. R. Manston, said Miss Aldclyffe quietly. M. R. Manston attracted by me now, said Cytheria, standing at gaze. Didn't you know it? Certainly I did not. Why, his poor wife has only been dead six months. Of course he knows that. But loving is not done by months, or method, or rule, or nobody would ever have invented such a phrase as falling in love. He does not want his love to be observed just yet, on the very account you mention, but conceal it as he may from himself in us, it exists definitely and very intensely, I assure you. I suppose then, that if he can't help it, it is no harm of him, said Cytheria naively, and beginning to ponder. Of course it isn't you know that well enough. She was a great burden and trouble to him. This may become a great good to you both. A rush of feeling at remembering that the same woman, before Manston's arrival, had just as frankly advocated Edward's claims, checked Cytheria's utterance for a while. There, don't look at me like that, for heaven's sake said Miss Aldclyffe. You could almost kill a person by the force of reproach you can put into those eyes of yours, I verily believe. Edward once in the young lady's thoughts, there was no getting rid of him. She wanted to be alone. Do you want me here, she said. Now there, there, you want to be off, and have a good cry, said Miss Aldclyffe, taking her hand. But you mustn't, my dear. There's nothing in the past for you to regret. Compare Mr. Manston's honorable conduct towards his wife and yourself, with Spring Grove towards his betrothed and yourself, and then see which appears the more worthy of your thoughts. From the 4th of May to the 21st of June. The next stage in Manston's advances towards her hand was a clearly defined courtship. She was sadly perplexed, and some contrivance was necessary on his part in order to meet with her. But it is next to impossible for an appreciative woman to have a positive repugnance towards an unusually handsome and gifted man, even though she may not be inclined to love him. Hence Cytheria was not so alarmed at the sight of him as to render a meeting and conversation with her more than a matter of difficulty. Coming and going from church was his grand opportunity. Manston was very religious now. It is commonly said that no man was ever converted by argument, but there is a single one which will make any Laodicean in England, let him be once love sick, wear prayer books and become a zealous Episcopalian the argument that his sweetheart can be seen from his pew. Manston introduced into his method a system of bewitching flattery, everywhere pervasive, yet, too, so transitory and intangible, that, as in the case of the poet Wordsworth and the wandering voice, though she felt it present, she could never find it. As a foil to heighten its effect, he occasionally spoke philosophically of the evanescence of female beauty the worthlessness of mere appearance. Handsome is that handsome does he considered a proverb which should be written on the looking glass of every woman in the land. Your form, your motions, your heart have won me, he said in a tone of playful sadness. They are beautiful. But I see these things, and it comes into my mind that they are doomed, they are gliding to nothing as I look. Poor eyes, 
poor mouth, poor face, poor maiden where will her glories be in twenty years? I say. Where will all of her be in a hundred? Then I think it is cruel that you should bloom a day, and fade forever and ever. It seems hard and sad that you will die as ordinarily as I, and be buried, be food for roots and worms, be forgotten and come to earth, and grow up a mere blade of churchyard grass and an ivy leaf. Then, Miss Gray, when I see you are a lovely nothing, I pity you, and the love I feel then is better and sounder, larger, and more lasting than that I felt at the beginning. Again an ardent flash of his handsome eyes. It was by this route that he ventured on an indirect declaration and offer of his hand. She implied in the same indirect manner that she did not love him enough to accept it. An actual refusal was more than he had expected. Cursing himself for what he called his egregious folly in making himself the slave of a mere lady's attendant, and for having given the parish, should they know of her refusal, a chance of sneering at him certainly a ground for thinking less of his standing than before he went home to the old house, and walked indecisively up and down his backyard. Turning aside, he leant his arms upon the edge of the rainwater butt standing in the corner, and looked into it. The reflection from the smooth stagnant surface tinged his face with the greenish shades of Correggio's nudes. Staves of sunlight slanted down through the still pool, lighting it up with wonderful distinctness. Hundreds of thousands of minute living creatures sported and tumbled in its depth with every contortion that gaiety could suggest, perfectly happy, though consisting only of a head, or a tail, or at most a head and a tail, and all doomed to die within the twenty-four hours. Damn my position why shouldn't I be happy through my little day too? Let the parish sneer at my repulses, let it. I'll get her, if I move heaven and earth to do it. Indeed, the inexperienced Cytherea had, towards Edward in the first place, and Manston afterwards, unconsciously adopted bearings that would have been the very tactics of a professional fisher of men who wished to have them each successively dangling at her heels. For if any rule at all can be laid down in a matter which, for men collectively, is notoriously beyond regulation, it is that to snub a petted man, and to pet a snubbed man, is the way to win in suits of both kinds. Manston with Springrove's encouragement would have become indifferent. Edward with Manston's repulses would have sheared off at the outset, as he did afterwards. Her supreme indifference added fuel to Manston's ardor it completely disarmed his pride. The invulnerable nobody seemed greater to him than a susceptible princess. From the 21st of June to the end of July, Cytheria had in the meantime received the following letter from her brother. It was the first definite notification of the enlargement of that cloud no bigger than a man's hand which had for nearly a twelve month hung before them in the distance, and which was soon to give a color to their whole sky from horizon to horizon. Budmouth Regis Saturday Darling sis I have delayed telling you for a long time of a little matter which, though not one to be seriously alarmed about, is sufficiently vexing, and it would be unfair in me to keep it from you any longer. It is that for some time past I have again been distressed by that lameness which I first distinctly felt when we went to Lulstead Cove, and again when I left Knapwater that morning early. It is an unusual pain in my left leg, between the knee and the ankle. I had just found fresh symptoms of it when you were here for that half hour about a month ago when you said in fun that I began to move like an old man. I had a good mind to tell you then, but fancying it would go off in a few days, I thought it was not worth while. Since that time it has increased, but I am still able to work in the office, sitting on the stool. My great fear is that Mr. G will have some outdoor measuring work for me to do soon, and that I shall be obliged to decline it. However, we will hope for the best. How it came, what was its origin, or what it tends to, I cannot think. You shall hear again in a day or two, if it is no better, your loving brother, Owen. This she answered, begging to know the worst, which she could bear, but suspense and anxiety never. In two days came another letter from him, of which the subjoined paragraph is a portion. I had quite decided to let you know the worst, and to assure you that it was the worst, before you wrote to ask it. And again I give you my word that I will conceal nothing so that there will be no excuse whatever for your wearing yourself out with fears that I am worse than I say. This morning then, for the first time, 
I have been obliged to stay away from the office. Don't be frightened at this, dear Cytherea. Rest is all that is wanted, and by nursing myself now for a week, I may avoid an illness of six months. After a visit from her he wrote again. Drive Chestman has seen me. He said that the ailment was some sort of rheumatism, and I am now undergoing proper treatment for its cure. My leg and foot have been placed in hot bran, liniments have been applied, and also severe friction with a pad. He says I shall be as right as ever in a very short time. Directly I am I shall run up by the train to see you. Don't trouble to come to me if Miss Aldclyffe grumbles again about your being away, for I am going on capitally. You shall hear again at the end of the week. At the time mentioned came the following. I am sorry to tell you, because I know it will be so disheartening after my last letter, that I am not so well as I was then, and that there has been a sort of hitch in the proceedings. After I had been treated for rheumatism a few days longer in which treatment they pricked the place with a long needle several times, I saw that Dr. Chestman was in doubt about something, and I requested that he would call in a brother professional man to see me as well. They consulted together and then told me that rheumatism was not the disease after all, but erysipelas. They then began treating it differently, as became a different matter. Blisters, flour, and starch? seem to be the order of the day now medicine, of course, besides. M. R. Gradfield has been in to inquire about me. He says he has been obliged to get a designer in my place, which grieves me very much, though, of course, it could not be avoided. A month passed away, throughout this period, Cytherea visited him as often as the limited time at her command would allow and wore as cheerful a countenance as the womanly determination to do nothing which might depress him could enable her to wear. Another letter from him then told her these additional facts. The doctors find they are again on the wrong tack. They cannot make out what the disease is. Oh Cytherea how I wish they knew this suspense is wearing me out. Could not Miss Aldclyffe spare you for a day? Do come to me. We will talk about the best course then. I am sorry to complain, but I am worn out. Cytherea went to Miss Aldclyffe, and told her of the melancholy turn her brother's illness had taken. Miss Aldclyffe at once said that Cytherea might go, and offered to do anything to assist her which lay in her power. Cytherea's eyes beamed gratitude as she turned to leave the room, and hastened to the station. Oh, Cytherea, said Miss Aldclyffe, calling her back, just one word. Has Mr. Manston spoken to you lately? Yes, said Cytherea, blushing timorously. He proposed. Yes. And you refused him? Yes. Tut, tut now listen to my advice, said Miss Aldclyffe emphatically, and accept him before he changes his mind. The chance which he offers you of settling in life is one that may possibly, probably, not occur again. His position is good and secure, and the life of his wife would be a happy one. You may not be sure that you love him madly, but suppose you are not sure? My father used to say to me as a child when he was teaching me whist, when in doubt win the trick that advice is ten times as valuable to a woman on the subject of matrimony. In refusing a man there is always the risk that you may never get another offer. Why didn't you win the trick when you were a girl, said Cytherea. Come. My lady pert, I'm not the text, said Miss Aldclyffe, her face glowing like fire. Cytherea laughed stealthily. I was about to say, resumed Miss Aldclyffe severely, that here is Mr. Manston waiting with the tenderest solicitude for you, and you overlooking it, as if it were altogether beneath you. Think how you might benefit your sick brother if you were Mrs. Manston. You will please me very much by giving him some encouragement. You understand me, Scythe dear. Cytherea was silent. And, said Miss Aldclyffe, still more emphatically, on your promising that you will accept him some time this year, I will take a special care of your brother. You are listening, Cytherea. Yes, she whispered, leaving the room. She went to Budmouth, passed the day with her brother, and returned to nap water wretched and full of foreboding. Owen had looked startlingly thin and pale thinner and paler than ever she had seen him before. 
The brother and sister had that day decided that notwithstanding the drain upon their slender resources, another surgeon should see him. Time was everything. Owen told her the result in his next letter. The three practitioners between them have at last hit the nail on the head, I hope. They probed the place, and discovered that the secret lay in the bone. I underwent an operation for its removal three days ago after taking chloroform. Thank God it is over. Though I am so weak, my spirits are rather better. I wonder when I shall be at work again? I asked the surgeons how long it would be first. I said a month. They shook their heads. A year? I said. Not so long, they said. Six months? I inquired. They would not, or could not, tell me. But never mind. Run down, when you have half a day to spare, for the hours drag on so drearily. Oh Cytheria, you can't think how drearily. She went. Immediately on her departure Miss Aldclyffe sent a note to the old house, to Manston. On the maiden's return, tired and sick at heart as usual, she found Manston at the station awaiting her. He asked politely if he might accompany her to nap water. She tacitly acquiesced. During their walk he inquired the particulars of her brother's illness, and with an irresistible desire to pour out her trouble to someone, she told him of the length of time which must elapse before he could be strong again, and of the lack of comfort in lodgings. Manston was silent a while. Then he said impetuously, Miss Gray, I will not mince matters I love you you know it. Stratagem they say is fair in love, and I am compelled to adopt it now. Forgive me, for I cannot help it. Consent to be my wife at any time that may suit you any remote day you may name will satisfy me and you shall find him well provided for. For the first time in her life she truly dreaded the handsome man at her side who pleaded thus selfishly, and shrank from the hot voluptuous nature of his passion for her, which, disguise it as he might under a quiet and polished exterior, at times radiated forth with a scorching white heat. She perceived how animal was the love which bargained. I do not love you, Mr. Manston, she replied coldly. From the 1st to the 27th of August. The long sunny days of the later summer time brought only the same dreary accounts from Budmouth, and saw Cytheria paying the same sad visits. She grew perceptibly weaker, in body and mind. Manston still persisted in his suit but with more of his former indirectness, now that he saw how unexpectedly well she stood an open attack. His was the system of dares at the Sicilian games. He, like a captain who beleaguers round. Some strong-built castle on a rising ground. Views all the approaches with observing eyes. This and that other part again he tries. And more on industry than force relies. Miss Aldclyffe made it appear more clearly than ever that aid to Owen from herself depended entirely upon Cytheria's acceptance of her steward. Hemmed in and distressed, Cytheria's answers to his importunities grew less uniform, they were firm, or wavering, as Owen's malady fluctuated. Had a register of her pitiful oscillations been kept, it would have rivaled in pathos the diary wherein De Quincey tabulates his combat with opium perhaps as noticeable an instance as any in which a thrilling dramatic power has been given to mere numerals. Thus she wearily and monotonously lived through the month, listening on Sundays to the well-known round of chapters narrating the history of Elijah and Alicia in famine and drought, on weekdays to buzzing flies in hot sunny rooms. So like, so very like, was day to day. Extreme lassitude seemed all that the world could show her. Her state was in this wise, when one afternoon, having been with her brother, she met the surgeon, and begged him to tell the actual truth concerning Owen's condition. The reply was that he feared that the first operation had not been thorough, that although the wound had healed, another attempt might still be necessary, unless nature were left to effect her own cure. But the time such a self-healing proceeding would occupy might be ruinous. How long would it be, she said. It is impossible to say. A year or two, more or less. And suppose he submitted to another artificial extraction. Then he might be well in four or six months. Now the remainder of his and her possessions, together with the sum he had borrowed, would not provide him with necessary comforts for half that time. 
To combat the misfortune, there were two courses open her becoming betrothed to Manston, or the sending Owen to the county hospital. Thus terrified, driven into a corner, panting and fluttering about for some loophole of escape, yet still shrinking from the idea of being Manston's wife, the poor little bird endeavoured to find out from Miss Aldclyffe whether it was likely Owen would be well treated in the hospital. County Hospital said Miss Aldclyffe, why, it is only another name for slaughterhouse in surgical cases at any rate. Certainly if anything about your body is snapped in two they do join you together in a fashion, but tis so askew and ugly, that you may as well be apart again. Then she terrified the inquiring and anxious maiden by relating horrid stories of how the legs and arms of poor people were cut off at a moment's notice, especially in cases where the restorative treatment was likely to be long and tedious. You know how willing I am to help you, Cytheria, she added reproachfully. You know it. Why are you so obstinate then? Why do you selfishly bar the clear, honourable and only sisterly path which leads out of this difficulty? I cannot, on my conscience, countenance you, no, I cannot. Manston once more repeated his offer, and once more she refused, but this time weakly, and with signs of an internal struggle. Manston's eye sparkled, he saw for the hundredth time in his life, that perseverance, if only systematic, was irresistible by womankind. The 27th of August On going to Budmouth three days later, she found to her surprise that the steward had been there, had introduced himself, and had seen her brother. A few delicacies had been brought him also by the same hand. Owen spoke in warm terms of Manston and his free and unceremonious call, as he could not have refrained from doing of any person, of any kind, whose presence had served to help away the tedious hours of a long day, and who had, moreover, shown that sort of consideration for him which the accompanying basket implied antecedent consideration, so telling upon all invalids and which he so seldom experienced except from the hands of his sister. How should he perceive, amid this tithe paying of mint and anise and cumin, the weightier matters which were left undone? Again the steward met her at Carry Ford Road Station on her return journey. Instead of being frigid as at the former meeting at the same place, she was embarrassed by a strife of thought, and murmured brokenly her thanks for what he had done. The same request that he might see her home was made. He had perceived his error in making his kindness to Owen a conditional kindness, and had hastened to efface all recollection of it. Though I let my offer on her brother's my friend's behalf, seem dependent on my lady's graciousness to me, he whispered wooingly in the course of their walk, I could not conscientiously adhere to my statement, it was said with all the impulsive selfishness of love. Whether you choose to have me, or whether you don't, I love you too devotedly to be anything but kind to your brother. Miss Gray, Cytheria, I will do anything, he continued earnestly, to give you pleasure indeed I will. She saw on the one hand her poor and much loved Owen recovering from his illness and troubles by the disinterested kindness of the man beside her, on the other she drew him dying wholly by reason of her self-enforced poverty. To marry this man was obviously the course of common sense, to refuse him was impolitic temerity. There was reason in this. But there was more behind than a hundred reasons a woman's gratitude and her impulse to be kind. The wavering of her mind was visible in her tell-tale face. He noticed it, and caught at the opportunity. They were standing by the ruinous foundations of an old mill in the midst of a meadow. Between grey and half-overgrown stonework the only signs of masonry remaining the water gurgled down from the old millpond to a lower level, under the cloak of rank broad leaves the sensuous natures of the vegetable world. On the right hand the sun, resting on the horizon line, streamed across the ground from below copper-coloured and lilac clouds, stretched out in flats beneath a sky of pale soft green. All dark objects on the earth that lay towards the sun were overspread by a purple haze, against which a swarm of wailing gnats shone forth luminously, rising upward and floating away like sparks of fire. The stillness oppressed and reduced her to mere passivity. The only wish the humidity of the place left in her was to stand motionless. The helpless flatness of the landscape gave her, as it gives all such temperaments, a sense of bare equality with, and no superiority to, a single entity under the sky. He came so close that their clothes touched. 
Will you try to love me? Do try to love me he said, in a whisper, taking her hand. He had never taken it before. She could feel his hand trembling exceedingly as it held hers in its clasp. Considering his kindness to her brother, his love for herself, and Edward's fickleness, ought she to forbid him to do this? How truly pitiful it was to feel his hand tremble so all for her should she withdraw her hand. She would think whether she would. Thinking, and hesitating, she looked as far as the autumnal haze on the marshy ground would allow her to see distinctly. There was the fragment of a hedge all that remained of a wet old garden standing in the middle of the mead, without a definite beginning or ending, purposeless and valueless. It was overgrown, and choked with mandrakes, and she could almost fancy she heard their shrieks. Should she withdraw her hand? No, she could not withdraw it now, it was too late, the act would not imply refusal. She felt as one in a boat without oars, drifting with closed eyes down a river she knew not whither. He gave her hand a gentle pressure, and relinquished it. Then it seemed as if he were coming to the point again. No, he was not going to urge his suit that evening. Another respite. The early part of September. Saturday came, and she went on some trivial errand to the village post office. It was a little grey cottage with a luxuriant jasmine encircling the doorway, and before going in Cytheria paused to admire this pleasing feature of the exterior. Hearing a step on the gravel behind the corner of the house, she resigned the jasmine and entered. Nobody was in the room. She could hear Mrs. Leet, the widow who acted as postmistress, walking about over her head. Cytheria was going to the foot of the stairs to call Mrs. Leet, but before she had accomplished her object, Another form stood at the half-open door. Manston came in. Both on the same errand, he said gracefully. I will call her, said Cytheria, moving in haste to the foot of the stairs. One moment. He glided to her side. Don't call her for a moment, he repeated. But she had said, M.R.S. Leet. He seized Cytheria's hand, kissed it tenderly, and carefully replaced it by her side. She had that morning determined to check his further advances, until she had thoroughly considered her position. The remonstrance was now on her tongue, but as accident would have it, before the word could be spoken Mrs. Leet was stepping from the last stair to the floor, and no remonstrance came. With the subtlety which characterized him in all his dealings with her, he quickly concluded his own errand, bade her a goodbye in the tones of which love was so garnished with pure politeness that it only showed its presence to herself, and left the house putting it out of her power to refuse him her companionship homeward, or to object to his late action of kissing her hand. The Friday of the next week brought another letter from her brother. In this he informed her that, in absolute grief lest he should distress her unnecessarily, he had some time earlier borrowed a few pounds. A week ago, he said, his creditor became importunate, but that on the day on which he wrote, the creditor had told him there was no hurry for a settlement, that his sister's suitor had guaranteed the sum. Is he Mr. Manston? Tell me, Cytheria, said Owen. He also mentioned that a wheeled chair had been anonymously hired for his especial use, though as yet he was hardly far enough advanced towards convalescence to avail himself of the luxury. Is this Mr. Manston's doing? he inquired. She could dally with her perplexity, evade it, trust to time for guidance, no longer. The matter had come to a crisis, she must once and for all choose between the dictates of her understanding and those of her heart. She longed, till her soul seemed nigh to bursting, for her lost mother's return to earth, but for one minute, that she might have tender counsel to guide her through this, her great difficulty. As for her heart, she half fancied that it was not Edward's to quite the extent that it once had been, she thought him cruel in conducting himself towards her as he did at Budmouth, cruel afterwards in making so light of her. She knew he had stifled his love for her was utterly lost to her. But for all that she could not help indulging in a woman's pleasure of recreating defunct agonies, and lacerating herself with them now and then. If I were rich, she thought. I would give way to the luxury of being morbidly faithful to him forever without his knowledge. But she considered, in the first place she was a homeless dependent, 
and what did practical wisdom tell her to do under such desperate circumstances? To provide herself with some place of refuge from poverty, and with means to aid her brother Owen. This was to be Mr. Manston's wife. She did not love him. But what was love without a home? Misery. What was a home without love? Alas, not much, but still a kind of home. Yes, she thought, I am urged by my common sense to marry Mr. Manston. Did anything nobler in her say so too? With the death to her of Edward her heart's occupation was gone. Was it necessary or even right for her to tend it and take care of it as she used to in the old time, when it was still a capable minister? By a slight sacrifice here she could give happiness to at least two hearts whose emotional activities were still unwounded. She would do good to two men whose lives were far more important than hers. Yes, she said again, even Christianity urges me to marry Mr. Manston. Directly Cytheria had persuaded herself that a kind of heroic self-abnegation had to do with the matter, she became much more content in the consideration of it. A willful indifference to the future was what really prevailed in her, ill and worn out, as she was, by the perpetual harassments of her sad fortune, and she regarded this indifference, as gushing natures will do under such circumstances, as genuine resignation and devotedness. Manston met her again the following day, indeed there was no escaping him now. At the end of a short conversation between them, which took place in the hollow of the park by the waterfall, obscured on the outer side by the low-hanging branches of the limes, she tacitly assented to his assumption of a privilege greater than any that had preceded it. He stooped and kissed her brow. Before going to bed she wrote to Owen explaining the whole matter. It was too late in the evening for the postman's visit, and she placed the letter on the mantelpiece to send it the next day. The morning Sunday brought a hurried postscript to Owen's letter of the day before. September Dear Cytheria I have received a frank and friendly letter from Mr. Manston explaining the position in which he stands now, and also that in which he hopes to stand towards you. Can't you love him? Why not? Try, for he is a good, and not only that, but a cultured man. Think of the weary and laborious future that awaits you if you continue for life in your present position, and do you see any way of escape from it except by marriage? I don't. Don't go against your heart, Cytheria, but be wise ever affectionately yours, Owen. She thought that probably he had replied to Mr. Manston in the same favoring mood. She had a conviction that that day would settle her doom. Yet. So true a fool is love. That even now she nourished a half-hope that something would happen at the last moment to thwart her deliberately formed intentions, and favor the old emotion she was using all her strength to thrust down. The 10th of September The Sunday was the 13th after Trinity, and the afternoon service at Carry Ford was nearly over. The people were singing the evening hymn. Manston was at church as usual in his accustomed place two seats forward from the large square pew occupied by Miss Aldclyffe and Cytheria. The ordinary sadness of an autumnal evening service seemed, in Cytheria's eyes, to be doubled on this particular occasion. She looked at all the people as they stood and sang, waving backwards and forwards like a forest of pines swayed by a gentle breeze, then at the village children singing too, their heads inclined to one side, their eyes listlessly tracing some crack in the old walls, or following the movement of a distant bough or bird with features petrified almost to painfulness. Then she looked at Manston, he was already regarding her with some purpose in his glance. It is coming this evening, she said in her mind. A minute later, at the end of the hymn, when the congregation began to move out, Manston came down the aisle. He was opposite the end of her seat as she stepped from it, the remainder of their progress to the door being in contact with each other. Miss Aldclyffe had lingered behind. Don't let's hurry, he said when Cytheria was about to enter the private path to the house as usual. Would you mind turning down this way for a minute till Miss Aldclyffe has passed? She could not very well refuse now. They turned into a secluded path on their left, leading round through a thicket of laurels to the other gate of the churchyard, walking very slowly. By the time the further gate was reached, the church was closed. They met the sexton with the keys in his hand. We are going inside for a minute said Manston to him, 
taking the keys unceremoniously. I will bring them to you when we return. The sexton nodded his assent, and Cytheria and Manston walked into the porch, and up the nave. They did not speak a word during their progress, or in any way interfere with the stillness and silence that prevailed everywhere around them. Everything in the place was the embodiment of decay, the fading red glare from the setting sun, which came in at the west window, emphasizing the end of the day and all its cheerful doings, the mildewed walls, the uneven paving stones, the wormy pews, the sense of recent occupation, and the dank air of death which had gathered with the evening, would have made grave a lighter mood than Cytherea's was then. What sensations does the place impress you with, she said at last, very sadly. I feel imperatively called upon to be honest, from very despair of achieving anything by stratagem in a world where the materials are such as these. He, too, spoke in a depressed voice, purposely or otherwise. I feel as if I were almost ashamed to be seen walking such a world, she murmured, that's the effect it has upon me, but it does not induce me to be honest particularly. He took her hand in both his, and looked down upon the lids of her eyes. I pity you sometimes, he said more emphatically. I am pitiable, perhaps, so are many people. Why do you pity me? I think that you make yourself needlessly sad. Not needlessly. Yes, needlessly. Why should you be separated from your brother so much, when you might have him to stay with you till he is well? That can't be, she said, turning away. He went on. I think the real and only good thing that can be done for him is to get him away from Budmouth a while, and I have been wondering whether it could not be managed for him to come to my house to live for a few weeks. Only a quarter of a mile from you. How pleasant it would be. It would. He moved himself round immediately to the front of her, and held her hand more firmly, as he continued, Cytheria, why do you say it would, so entirely in the tone of abstract supposition? I want him there, I want him to be my brother, too. Then make him so, and be my wife I cannot live without you. Oh Cytheria, my darling, my love, come and be my wife. His face bent closer and closer to hers, and the last words sank to a whisper as weak as the emotion inspiring it was strong. She said firmly and distinctly, yes, I will. Next month, he said on the instant, before taking breath. No, not next month. The next. No. December. Christmas Day, say. I don't mind. Oh, you darling he was about to imprint a kiss upon her pale, cold mouth, but she hastily covered it with her hand. Don't kiss me at least where we are now she whispered imploringly. Why? We are too near God. He gave a sudden start, and his face flushed. She had spoken so emphatically that the words near God echoed back again through the hollow building from the far end of the chancel. What a thing to say he exclaimed, surely a pure kiss is not inappropriate to the place. No, she replied, with a swelling heart, I don't know why I burst out so I can't tell what has come over me will you forgive me. How shall I say yes without judging you? How shall I say no without losing the pleasure of saying yes? He was himself again. I don't know, she absently murmured. I'll say yes, he answered daintily. It is sweeter to fancy we are forgiven, than to think we have not sinned, and you shall have the sweetness without the need. She did not reply, and they moved away. The church was nearly dark now, and melancholy in the extreme. She stood beside him while he locked the door, then took the arm he gave her and wound her way out of the churchyard with him. Then they walked to the house together, but the great matter having been set at rest, she persisted in talking only on indifferent subjects. Christmas Day, then, he said, as they were parting at the end of the shrubbery. I meant old Christmas Day, she said evasively. Hmm, people do not usually attach that meaning to the words. No, but I should like it best if it could not be till then. It seemed to be still her instinct to delay the marriage to the utmost. Very well, love, he said gently. Tis a fortnight longer still, but never mind. Old Christmas Day. The 11th of September. 
there. It will be on a Friday. She sat upon a little footstool gazing intently into the fire. It was the afternoon of the day following that of the steward's successful solicitation of her hand. I wonder if it would be proper in me to run across the park and tell him it is a Friday, she said to herself, rising to her feet, looking at her hat lying near, and then out of the window towards the old house. Proper or not, she felt that she must at all hazards remove the disagreeable, though, as she herself owned, unfounded impression the coincidence had occasioned. She left the house directly, and went to search for him. Manston was in the timber yard, looking at the sawyers as they worked. Cytherea came up to him hesitatingly. Till within a distance of a few yards she had hurried forward with alacrity now that the practical expression of his face became visible she wished almost she had never sought him on such an errand, in his business mood he was perhaps very stern. It will be on a Friday, she said confusedly, and without any preface. Come this way said Manston, in the tone he used for workmen, not being able to alter at an instant's notice. He gave her his arm and led her back into the avenue, by which time he was lover again. On a Friday, will it, dearest? You do not mind Fridays, surely? That's nonsense. Not seriously mind them, exactly but if it could be any other day. Well, let us say old Christmas Eve, then. Shall it be old Christmas Eve? Yes, old Christmas Eve. Your word is solemn, and irrevocable now. Certainly, I have solemnly pledged my word, I should not have promised to marry you if I had not meant it. Don't think I should. She spoke the words with a dignified impressiveness. You must not be vexed at my remark, dearest. Can you think the worse of an ardent man, Cytherea, for showing some anxiety in love? No, no she could not say more. She was always ill at ease when he spoke of himself as a piece of human nature in that analytical way, and wanted to be out of his presence. The time of day, and the proximity of the house, afforded her a means of escape. I must be with Miss Aldclyffe now will you excuse my hasty coming and going, she said prettily. Before he had replied she had parted from him. Cytherea was it Mr. Manston I saw you scudding away from in the avenue just now, said Miss Aldclyffe, when Cytherea joined her. Yes. Yes. Come, why don't you say more than that? I hate those taciturn yeses of yours. I tell you everything, and yet you are as close as wax with me. I parted from him because I wanted to come in. What a novel and important announcement well, is the day fixed? Yes. Miss Aldclyffe's face kindled into intense interest at once. Is it indeed? When is it to be? On old Christmas Eve. Old Christmas Eve. Miss Aldclyffe drew Cytherea round to her front, and took a hand in each of her own. And then you will be a bride, she said slowly, looking with critical thoughtfulness upon the maiden's delicately rounded cheeks. The normal area of the color upon each of them decreased perceptibly after that slow and emphatic utterance by the elder lady. Miss Aldclyffe continued impressively, You did not say old Christmas Eve as a fiancé should have said the words, and you don't receive my remark with the warm excitement that foreshadows a bright future. How many weeks are there to the time? I have not reckoned them. Not. Fancy a girl not counting the weeks I find I must take the lead in this matter you are so childish, or frightened, or stupid, or something, about it. Bring me my diary, and we will count them at once. Cytherea silently fetched the book. Miss Aldclyffe opened the diary at the page containing the almanac, and counted sixteen weeks, which brought her to the thirty-first of December a Sunday. Cytherea stood by looking on as if she had no appetite for the scene. Sixteen to the thirty-first. Then let me see, Monday will be the first of January, Tuesday the second, Wednesday third, Thursday fourth, Friday fifth you have chosen a Friday, as I declare. A Thursday, surely, said Cytherea. No, old Christmas Day comes on a Saturday. The perturbed little brain had reckoned wrong. Well, it must be a Friday, she murmured in a reverie. No, have it altered, of course, said Miss Aldclyffe cheerfully. 
There's nothing bad in Friday, but such a creature as you will be thinking about its being unlucky in fact, I wouldn't choose a Friday myself to be married on, since all the other days are equally available. I shall not have it altered, said Cytherea firmly, it has been altered once already, I shall let it be. 13 The Events of One Day The 5th of January Before dawn We pass over the intervening weeks. The time of the story is thus advanced more than a quarter of a year. On the midnight preceding the morning which would make her the wife of a man whose presence fascinated her into involuntariness of bearing, and whom in absence she almost dreaded, Cytherea lay in her little bed, vainly endeavouring to sleep. She had been looking back amid the years of her short though varied past, and thinking of the threshold upon which she stood. Days and months had dimmed the form of Edward Springrove like the gauzes of a vanishing stage scene, but his dying voice could still be heard faintly behind. That a soft small chord in her still vibrated true to his memory, she would not admit, that she did not approach Manston with feelings which could by any stretch of words be called hymeneal, she calmly owned. Why do I marry him? she said to herself. Because Owen, dear Owen my brother, wishes me to marry him. Because Mr. Manston is, and has been, uniformly kind to Owen, and to me. Act in obedience to the dictates of common sense, Owen said, and dread the sharp sting of poverty. How many thousands of women like you marry every year for the same reason, to secure a home, and mere ordinary, material comforts, which after all go far to make life endurable, even if not supremely happy. Tis right, I suppose, for him to say that. Oh, if people only knew what a timidity and melancholy upon the subject of her future grows up in the heart of a friendless woman who is blown about like a reed shaken with the wind, as I am, they would not call this resignation of oneself by the name of scheming to get a husband. Scheme to marry? I'd rather scheme to die I know I am not pleasing my heart, I know that if I only were concerned, I should like risking a single future. But why should I please my useless self over much, when by doing otherwise I please those who are more valuable than I? In the midst of desultory reflections like these, which alternated with surmises as to the inexplicable connection that appeared to exist between her intended husband and Miss Aldclyffe, she heard dull noises outside the walls of the house which she could not quite fancy to be caused by the wind. She seemed doomed to such disturbances at critical periods of her existence. It is strange, she pondered, that this my last night in Knapp Waterhouse should be disturbed precisely as my first was, no occurrence of the kind having intervened. As the minutes glided by the noise increased, sounding as if someone were beating the wall below her window with a bunch of switches. She would gladly have left her room and gone to stay with one of the maids, but they were without doubt all asleep. The only person in the house likely to be awake, or who would have brains enough to comprehend her nervousness, was Miss Aldclyffe, but Cytherea never cared to go to Miss Aldclyffe's room, though she was always welcome there, and was often almost compelled to go against her will. The oft-repeated noise of switches grew heavier upon the wall, and was now intermingled with creaks and a rattling like the rattling of dice. The wind blew stronger, there came first a snapping, then a crash, and some portion of the mystery was revealed. It was the breaking off and fall of a branch from one of the large trees outside. The smacking against the wall, and the intermediate rattling, ceased from that time. Well, it was the tree which had caused the noises. The unexplained matter was that neither of the trees ever touched the walls of the house during the highest wind, and that trees could not rattle like a man playing castanets or shaking dice. She thought, is it the intention of fate that something connected with these noises shall influence my future as in the last case of the kind? During the dilemma she fell into a troubled sleep, and dreamt that she was being whipped with dry bones suspended on strings, which rattled at every blow like those of a malefactor on a gibbet, that she shifted and shrank and avoided every blow, and they fell then upon the wall to which she was tied. She could not see the face of the executioner for his mask, but his form was like Manston's. Thank heaven she said, when she awoke and saw a faint light struggling through her blind. Now what were those noises? To settle that question seemed more to her than the event of the day. She pulled the blind aside and looked out. All was plain. 
The evening previous had closed in with a grey drizzle, borne upon a piercing air from the north, and now its effects were visible. The hoary drizzle still continued, but the trees and shrubs were laden with icicles to an extent such as she had never before witnessed. A shoot of the diameter of a pin's head was iced as thick as her finger, all the boughs in the park were bent almost to the earth with the immense weight of the glistening encumbrance, the walks were like a looking glass. Many boughs had snapped beneath their burden, and lay in heaps upon the icy grass. Opposite her eye, on the nearest tree, was a fresh yellow scar, showing where the branch that had terrified her had been splintered from the trunk. I never could have believed it possible, she thought, surveying the bowed down branches, that trees would bend so far out of their true positions without breaking. By watching a twig she could see a drop collect upon it from the hoary fog, sink to the lowest point, and there become coagulated as the others had done. Or that I could so exactly have imitated them, she continued. On this morning I am to be married unless this is a scheme of the Great Mother to hinder a union of which she does not approve. Is it possible for my wedding to take place in the face of such weather as this? Morning. Her brother Owen was staying with Manston at the old house. Contrary to the opinion of the doctors, the wound had healed after the first surgical operation, and his leg was gradually acquiring strength, though he could only as yet get about on crutches, or ride, or be dragged in a chair. Miss Aldclyffe had arranged that Cytheria should be married from Knapwater House, and not from her brother's lodgings at Budmouth, which was Cytheria's first idea. Owen, too, seemed to prefer the plan. The capricious old maid had latterly taken to the contemplation of the wedding with even greater warmth than had at first inspired her, and appeared determined to do everything in her power, consistent with her dignity, to render the adjuncts of the ceremony pleasing and complete. But the weather seemed in flat contradiction of the whole proceeding. At eight o'clock the coachman crept up to the house almost upon his hands and knees, entered the kitchen, and stood with his back to the fire panting from his exertions in pedestrianism. The kitchen was by far the pleasantest apartment in Knapwater House on such a morning as this. The vast fire was the center of the whole system, like a sun, and threw its warm rays upon the figures of the domestics, wheeling about it in true planetary style. A nervously feeble imitation of its flicker was continually attempted by a family of polished metallic utensils standing in rows and groups against the walls opposite the whole collection of shines nearly annihilating the weak daylight from outside. A step further in, and the nostrils were greeted by the scent of green herbs just gathered, and the eye by the plump form of the cook, wholesome, white-aproned, and flowery looking as edible as the food she manipulated her movements being supported and assisted by her satellites, the kitchen, and scullery maids. Minute recurrent sounds prevailed the click of the smoke jack, the flap of the flames, and the light touches of the women's slippers upon the stone floor. The coachman hemmed, spread his feet more firmly upon the hearthstone, and looked hard at a small plate in the extreme corner of the dresser. No wedding this morning that's my opinion. In fact, there can't be, he said abruptly, as if the words were the mere torso of a many-membered thought that had existed complete in his head. The kitchen maid was toasting a slice of bread at the end of a very long toasting fork which she held at arm's length towards the unapproachable fire, travestying the flanconade in fencing. Bad out of doors, isn't it, she said, with a look of commiseration for things in general. Bad. Not even a livened soul, gentle or simple, can stand on level ground. As to getting uphill to the church, tis perfect lunacy. And I speak of foot passengers. As to horses and carriage, "'Tis murder to think of em. "'I am going to send straight as a line into the breakfast room, "'and say tis a closer. "'Hello here's Clerk Cricket and John Day a common now just look at em "'and picture a weddin' if you can.' "'All eyes were turned to the window, "'from which the clerk and gardener were seen crossing the court, "'bowed and stooping like Bell and Nebo. "'You'll have to go if it breaks all the horse's legs in the county,' "'said the cook, turning from the spectacle knocking open the oven door with the tongs, glancing critically in, and slamming it together with a clang. Oh, oh, why shall I? asked the coachman, including in his auditory by a glance the clerk and gardener who had just entered. Because Mr. Manston is in the business. 
Did you ever know him to give up for weather of any kind, or for any other mortal thing in heaven or earth? Mornin' so such as it is interrupted Mr. Cricket cheerily, coming forward to the blaze and warming one hand without looking at the fire. M.R. Manston G.I.E. up for anything in heaven or earth, did you say? You might ha cut it short by sayin' to Miss Aldclyffe, and leaven out heaven and earth as trifles. But it might be put off, puttin off a thing isn't gettin rid of a thing, if that thing is a woman. Oh no, no. The coachman and gardener now naturally subsided into secondaries. The cook went on rather sharply, as she dribbled milk into the exact center of a little crater of flour in a platter. It might be in this case, she's so indifferent. Dang my old sides and so it might be. I have a bit of news I thought there was something upon my tongue, but tis a secret, not a word, mind, not a word. Why, Miss Hinton took a holiday yesterday. Yes, inquired the cook, looking up with perplexed curiosity. Do you think that's all? Don't be so three cunning if it is all, deliver you from the evil of raising a woman's expectations wrongfully. I'll skimmer your pate as sure as you cry amen. Well, it isn't all. When I got home last night my wife said, Miss Adelaide took a holiday this morning, says she my wife, that is, walked over to Netherminton, met the common man, and got married says she. Got married what, Lord a mercy, did Springgrove come? Springgrove, no no Springgrove's nothing to do wi it twas Farmer Bollins. They've been playing Bo Peep for these two or three months seemingly. Whilst Master Teddy Springgrove has been daddlin, and hawkin, and spettin' about having her, she's quietly left him all for Sook. Serve him right. I don't blame the little woman a bit. Farmer Bollins is old enough to be her father. I, quite, and rich enough to be ten fathers. They say he's so rich that he has business in every bank, and measures his money in half-pint cups. Lord, I wish it was me, don't I wish twas me said the scullery maid. Yes, twas as neat a bit of stitching as ever I heard of, continued the clerk, with a fixed eye, as if he were watching the process from a distance. Not a soul knew anything about it, and my wife is the only one in our parish who knows it yet. Miss Hinton came back from the wedding, went to Mr. Manston, puffed herself out large, and said she was Mrs. Bollins, but that if he wished, she had no objection to keep on the house till the regular time of giving notice had expired, or till he could get another tenant. Just like her independence, said the cook. Well, independent or no, she's Mrs. Bollins now. Ah, I shall never forget once when I went by Farmer Bollins's garden years ago now years, when he was taking up ash leaf toddies. A merry feller I was at that time, a very merry feller for twas before I took holy orders and it didn't prick my conscience as twould now. Farmer, says I, little toddies seem to turn out small this year, don't em? Oh no, cricket, says he, some be fair-sized. He's a dull man Farmer Bollins as he always was. However, that's neither here nor there, he's a married to a sharp woman, and if I don't make a mistake she'll bring him a pretty good family, g.i.e. her time. Well, it don't matter. There's a providence in it, said the scullery maid. God a mighty always sends bread as well as children. But tis the bread to one house and the children to another very often. However, I think I can see my lady Hinton's reason for chosen yesterday to sickness or health it. Your young miss, and that one, had crossed one another's path in regard to young master Springgrove, and I expect that when Addie Hinton found Miss Gray wasn't Karen to have an she thought she'd be beforehand with her old enemy in marrying somebody else too. That's maid's logic all over, and maid's malice likewise. Women who are bad enough to divide against themselves under a man's partiality are good enough to instantly unite in a common cause against his attack. I'll just tell you one thing then, said the cook, shaking out her words to the time of a whisk she was beating eggs with. Whatever maid's logic is and maid's malice too, if Cytheria Gray even now knows that young Springgrove is free again, she'll fling over the steward as soon as look at him. No, no, not now, the coachman broke in like a moderator. There's honor in that maid, if ever there was in one. No Miss Hinton's tricks in her. 
She'll stick to Manston. Piff. Don't let a word be said till the wedding is over, for heaven's sake, the clerk continued. Miss Aldclyffe would fairly hang and quarter me, if my news broke off that their wedding at a last minute like this. Then you had better get your wife to bolt you in the closet for an hour or two, for you'll chatter it yourself to the whole boiling parish if she don't tis a poor womanly feller. You shouldn't ha begun it, clerk. I knew how twould be, said the gardener soothingly, in a whisper to the clerk's mangled remains. The clerk turned and smiled at the fire, and warmed his other hand. Noon. The weather gave way. In half an hour there began a rapid thaw. By ten o'clock the roads, though still dangerous, were practicable to the extent of the half-mile required by the people of Knapwater Park. One mass of heavy leaden clouds spread over the whole sky, the air began to feel damp and mild out of doors, though still cold and frosty within. They reached the church and passed up the nave, the deep-colored glass of the narrow windows rendering the gloom of the morning almost night itself inside the building. Then the ceremony began. The only warmth or spirit imported into it came from the bridegroom, who retained a vigorous even Spencerian bridal mood throughout the morning. Cytheria was as firm as he at this critical moment, but as cold as the air surrounding her. The few persons forming the wedding party were constrained in movement and tone, and from the nave of the church came occasional coughs, emitted by those who, in spite of the weather, had assembled to see the termination of Cytheria's existence as a single woman. Many poor people loved her. They pitied her success, why, they could not tell, except that it was because she seemed to stand more like a statue than Cytheria Grey. Yet she was prettily and carefully dressed, a strange contradiction in a man's idea of things a saddening, perplexing contradiction. Are there any points in which a difference of sex amounts to a difference of nature? Then this is surely one. Not so much, as it is commonly put in regard to the amount of consideration given, but in the conception of the thing considered. A man emasculated by coxcombry may spend more time upon the arrangement of his clothes than any woman, but even then there is no fetishism in his idea of them they are still only a covering he uses for a time. But here was Cytheria, in the bottom of her heart almost indifferent to life, yet possessing an instinct with which her heart had nothing to do, the instinct to be particularly regardful of those sorry trifles, her robe, her flowers, her veil, and her gloves. The irrevocable words were soon spoken the indelible writing soon written and they came out of the vestry. Candles had been necessary here to enable them to sign their names, and on their return to the church the light from the candles streamed from the small open door, and across the chancel to a black chestnut screen on the south side, dividing it from a small chapel or chantry, erected for the soul's piece of some old clife of the past. Through the open work of this screen could now be seen illuminated, inside the chantry, the reclining figures of cross-legged knights, damp and green with age, and above them a huge classic monument, also inscribed to the Aldclyffe family, heavily sculptured in cadaverous marble. Leaning here almost hanging to the monument was Edward Springrove, or his spirit. The weak daylight would never have revealed him, shaded as he was by the screen but the unexpected rays of candle light in the front showed him forth in startling relief to any and all of those whose eyes wandered in that direction. The sight was a sad one sad beyond all description. His eyes were wild, their orbits leaden. His face was of a sickly paleness, his hair dry and disordered, his lips parted as if he could get no breath. His figure was spectre thin. His actions seemed beyond his own control. Manston did not see him. Cytheria did. The healing effect upon her heart of a year's silence a year and a half's separation was undone in an instant. One of those strange revivals of passion by mere sight commoner in women than in men, and in oppressed women commonest of all had taken place in her so transcendently, that even to herself it seemed more like a new creation than a revival. Marrying for a home what a mockery it was. It may be said that the means most potent for rekindling old love in a maiden's heart are, to see her lover in laughter and good spirits in her despite when the breach has been owing to a slight from herself, when owing to a slight from him, to see him suffering for his own fault. If he is happy in a clear conscience, she blames him, if he is miserable because deeply to blame, she blames herself. 
The latter was Cytheria's case now. First, an agony of face told of the suppressed misery within her, which presently could be suppressed no longer. When they were coming out of the porch, there broke from her in a low plaintive scream the words, He's dying dying oh God, save us she began to sink down, and would have fallen had not Manston caught her. The chief bridesmaid applied her vinaigrette. What did she say? inquired Manston. Owen was the only one to whom the words were intelligible, and he was far too deeply impressed, or rather alarmed, to reply. She did not faint, and soon began to recover her self-command. Owen took advantage of the hindrance to step back to where the apparition had been seen. He was enraged with Springrove for what he considered an unwarrantable intrusion. But Edward was not in the chantry. As he had come, so he had gone, nobody could tell how or whither. Afternoon It might almost have been believed that a transmutation had taken place in Cytheria's idiosyncrasy, that her moral nature had fled. The wedding party returned to the house. As soon as he could find an opportunity, Owen took his sister aside to speak privately with her on what had happened. The expression of her face was hard, wild, and unreal an expression he had never seen there before, and it disturbed him. He spoke to her severely and sadly. Cytheria, he said, I know the cause of this emotion of yours. But remember this, there was no excuse for it. You should have been woman enough to control yourself. Remember whose wife you are, and don't think anything more of a mean-spirited fellow like Springrove, he had no business to come there as he did. You are altogether wrong, Cytheria, and I am vexed with you more than I can say very vexed. Say ashamed of me at once, she bitterly answered. I am ashamed of you, he retorted angrily, the mood has not left you yet, then. Owen, she said, and paused. Her lip trembled. Her eye told of sensations too deep for tears. No, Owen, it has not left me, and I will be honest. I own now to you, without any disguise of words, what last night I did not own to myself, because I hardly knew of it. I love Edward Springrove with all my strength and heart and soul. You call me a wanton for it, don't you? I don't care. I have gone beyond caring for anything she looked stonily into his face and made the speech calmly. Well, poor Cytheria, don't talk like that he said, alarmed at her manner. I thought that I did not love him at all, she went on hysterically. A year and a half had passed since we met. I could go by the gate of his garden without thinking of him look at his seat in church and not care. But I saw him this morning dying because he loves me so I know it is that can I help loving him too? No, I cannot, and I will love him, and I don't care we have been separated somehow by some contrivance I know we have. Oh, if I could only die. He held her in his arms. Many a woman has gone to ruin herself, he said, and brought those who love her into disgrace, by acting upon such impulses as possess you now. I have a reputation to lose as well as you. It seems that do what I will by way of remedying the stains which fell upon us, it is all doomed to be undone again. His voice grew husky as he made the reply. The right and only effective chord had been touched. Since she had seen Edward, she had thought only of herself and him. Oh and her name position future had been as if they did not exist. I won't give way and become a disgrace to you, at any rate, she said. Besides, your duty to society, and those about you, requires that you should live with at any rate all the appearance of a good wife, and try to love your husband. Yes my duty to society, she murmured. But ah, Owen, it is difficult to adjust our outer and inner life with perfect honesty to although it may be right to care more for the benefit of the many than for the indulgence of your own single self, when you consider that the many, and duty to them, only exist to you through your own existence what can be said. What do our own acquaintances care about us? Not much. I think of mine. Mine will now do they learn all the wicked frailty of my heart in this affair look at me, smile sickly, and condemn me. And perhaps, far in time to come, when I am dead and gone, some other's accent, or some other's song, or thought, like an old one of mine, will carry them back to what I used to say 
and hurt their hearts a little that they blamed me so soon. And they will pause just for an instant, and give a sigh to me, and think, poor girl believing they do great justice to my memory by this. But they will never, never realize that it was my single opportunity of existence, as well as of doing my duty, which they are regarding, they will not feel that what to them is but a thought, easily held in those two words of pity, poor girl was a whole life to me, as full of hours, minutes and peculiar minutes, of hopes and dreads, smiles, whisperings, tears, as theirs, that it was my world, what is to them their world, and they in that life of mine, however much I cared for them, only as the thought I seemed to them to be. Nobody can enter into another's nature truly, that's what is so grievous. Well, it cannot be helped, said Owen. But we must not stay here, she continued, starting up and going. We shall be missed. I'll do my best, Owen I will, indeed. It had been decided that on account of the wretched state of the roads, the newly married pair should not drive to the station till the latest hour in the afternoon at which they could get a train to take them to Southampton their destination that night by a reasonable time in the evening. They intended the next morning to cross to Haver, and thence to Paris a place Cytheria had never visited for their wedding tour. The afternoon drew on. The packing was done. Cytheria was so restless that she could stay still nowhere. Miss Aldclyffe, who, though she took little part in the day's proceedings, was, as it were, instinctively conscious of all their movements, put down her charge's agitation for once as the natural result of the novel event, and Manston himself was as indulgent as could be wished. At length Cytheria wandered alone into the conservatory. When in it, she thought she would run across to the hothouse in the outer garden, having in her heart a whimsical desire that she should also like to take a last look at the familiar flowers and luxuriant leaves collected there. She pulled on a pair of overshows, and thither she went. Not a soul was in or around the place. The gardener was making merry on Manston's and her account. The happiness that a generous spirit derives from the belief that it exists in others is often greater than the primary happiness itself. The gardener thought how happy they are and the thought made him happier than they. Coming out of the forcing house again, she was on the point of returning indoors, when a feeling that these moments of solitude would be her last of freedom induced her to prolong them a little, and she stood still, unheeding the wintry aspect of the curly-leaved plants, the straw-covered beds, and the bare fruit trees around her. The garden, no part of which was visible from the house, sloped down to a narrow river at the foot, dividing it from the meadows without. A man was lingering along the public path on the other side of the river, she fancied she knew the form. Her resolutions, taken in the presence of Owen, did not fail her now. She hoped and prayed that it might not be one who had stolen her heart away, and still kept it. Why should he have reappeared at all, when he had declared that he went out of her sight forever? She hastily hid herself, in the lowest corner of the garden close to the river. A large dead tree, thickly robed in ivy, had been considerably depressed by its icy load of the morning, and hung low over the stream, which here ran slow and deep. The tree screened her from the eyes of any passer on the other side. She waited timidly, and her timidity increased. She would not allow herself to see him she would hear him pass, and then look to see if it had been Edward. But, before she heard anything, she became aware of an object reflected in the water from under the tree which hung over the river in such a way that, though hiding the actual path, and objects upon it, it permitted their reflected images to pass beneath its boughs. The reflected form was that of the man she had seen further off, but being inverted, she could not definitely characterize him. He was looking at the upper windows of the house at hers was it Edward, indeed? If so he was probably thinking he would like to say one parting word. He came closer, gazed into the stream, and walked very slowly. She was almost certain that it was Edward. She kept more safely hidden. Conscience told her that she ought not to see him. But she suddenly asked herself a question, can it be possible that he sees my reflected image, as I see his? Of course he does. He was looking at her in the water. She could not help herself now. 
she stepped forward just as he emerged from the other side of the tree and appeared erect before her. It was Edward Springrove till the inverted vision met his eye, dreaming no more of seeing his Cytherea there than of seeing the dead themselves. Cytherea. M. R. Springrove, she returned, in a low voice, across the stream. He was the first to speak again. Since we have met, I want to tell you something, before we become quite as strangers to each other. No not now I did not mean to speak it is not right, Edward. She spoke hurriedly and turned away from him, beating the air with her hand. Not one common word of explanation, he implored. Don't think I am bad enough to try to lead you astray. Well, go it is better. Their eyes met again. She was nearly choked. Oh, how she longed and dreaded to hear his explanation. What is it, she said desperately. It is that I did not come to the church this morning in order to distress you, I did not, Cytherea. It was to try to speak to you before you were married. He stepped closer, and went on, you know what has taken place. Surely you do, my cousin is married, and I am free. Married and not to you. Cytherea faltered, in a weak whisper. Yes, she was married yesterday a rich man had appeared, and she jilted me. She said she never would have jilted a stranger, but that by jilting me, she only exercised the right everybody has of snubbing their own relations. But that's nothing now. I came to you to ask once more if. But I was too late. But, Edward, what's that, what's that, she cried, in an agony of reproach. Why did you leave me to return to her? Why did you write me that cruel, cruel letter that nearly killed me? Cytherea why, you had grown to love like Mr. Manston, and how could you be anything to me or care for me? Surely I acted naturally. Oh no never I loved you only you not him always you till lately. I try to love him now. But that can't be correct Miss Aldclyffe told me that you wanted to hear no more of me proved it to me said Edward. Never she couldn't. She did, Cytherea. And she sent me a letter a love letter you wrote to Mr. Manston. A love letter I wrote. Yes, a love letter you could not meet him just then, you said you were sorry, but the emotion you had felt with him made you forgetful of realities. The strife of thought in the unhappy girl who listened to this distortion of her meaning could find no vent in words. And then there followed the slow revelation in return, bringing with it all the misery of an explanation which comes too late. The question whether Miss Aldclyffe were schemer or dupe was almost passed over by Cytherea, under the immediate oppressiveness of her despair in the sense that her position was irretrievable. Not so Springrove. He saw through all the cunning half-misrepresentations worse than downright lies which had just been sufficient to turn the scale both with him and with her, and from the bottom of his soul he cursed the woman and man who had brought all this agony upon him and his love but he could not add more misery to the future of the poor child by revealing too much. The whole scheme she should never know. I was indifferent to my own future, Edward said, and was urged to promise adherence to my engagement with my cousin Adelaide by Miss Aldclyffe, now you are married I cannot tell you how, but it was on account of my father. Being forbidden to think of you, what did I care about anything? My new thought that you still loved me was first raised by what my father said in the letter announcing my cousin's marriage. He said that although you were to be married on old Christmas Day that is tomorrow he had noticed your appearance with pity, he thought you loved me still. It was enough for me I came down by the earliest morning train, thinking I could see you sometime today, the day, as I thought, before your marriage, hoping, but hardly daring to hope, that you might be induced to marry me. I hurried from the station, when I reached the village I saw idlers about the church, and the private gate leading to the house open. I ran into the church by the small door and saw you come out of the vestry, I was too late. I have now told you. I was compelled to tell you. Oh, my lost darling, now I shall live content or die content. I am to blame, Edward, I am, she said mournfully, I was taught to dread pauperism. My nights were made sleepless, there was continually reiterated in my ears till I believed it. The world and its ways have a certain worth. And to press a point where these oppose. 
were a simple policy. But I will say nothing about who influenced who persuaded. The act is mine, after all. Edward, I married to escape dependence for my bread upon the whim of Miss Aldclyffe, or others like her. It was clearly represented to me that dependence is bearable if we have another place which we can call home, but to be a dependent and to have no other spot for the heart to anchor upon oh, it is mournful and harassing. But that without which all persuasion would have been as air, was added by my miserable conviction that you were false, that did it, that turned me you were to be considered as nobody to me, and Mr. Manston was invariably kind. Well, the deed is done I must abide by it. I shall never let him know that I do not love him never. If things had only remained as they seemed to be, if you had really forgotten me and married another woman, I could have borne it better. I wish I did not know the truth as I know it now but our life, what is it? Let us be brave, Edward, and live out our few remaining years with dignity. They will not be long. Oh, I hope they will not be long. Now, goodbye, goodbye. I wish I could be near and touch you once, just once, said Springrove in a voice which he vainly endeavoured to keep firm and clear. They looked at the river, then into it, a shoal of minnows was floating over the sandy bottom, like the black dashes on Miniver, though narrow, the stream was deep, and there was no bridge. Cytherea, reach out your hand that I may just touch it with mine. She stepped to the brink and stretched out her hand and fingers towards his, but not into them. The river was too wide. Never mind said Cytherea, her voice broken by agitation, I must be going. God bless and keep you, my Edward God bless you. I must touch you, I must press your hand, he said. They came near nearer nearer still their fingers met. There was a long firm clasp, so close and still that each hand could feel the other's pulse throbbing beside its own. My Cytherea my stolen pet lamb. She glanced a mute farewell from her large perturbed eyes, turned, and ran up the garden without looking back. All was over between them. The river flowed on as quietly and obtusely as ever, and the minnows gathered again in their favorite spot as if they had never been disturbed. Nobody indoors guessed from her countenance and bearing that her heart was near to breaking with the intensity of the misery which gnawed there. At these times a woman does not faint, or weep, or scream as she will in the moment of sudden shocks. When lanced by a mental agony of such refined and special torture that it is indescribable by men's words, she moves among her acquaintances much as before, and contrives so to cast her actions in the old moulds that she is only considered to be rather duller than usual. Half past two to five o'clock p.m. Owen accompanied the newly married couple to the railway station, and in his anxiety to see the last of his sister, left the brougham and stood upon his crutches whilst the train was starting. When the husband and wife were about to enter the railway carriage they saw one of the porters looking frequently and furtively at them. He was pale, and apparently very ill. Look at that poor sick man, said Cytherea compassionately, surely he ought not to be here. He's been very queer today, madam, very queer, another porter answered. He do hardly hear when he's spoken to, and D seemed giddy, or as if something was on his mind. He's been like it for this month past, but nothing so bad as he is today. Poor thing! She could not resist an innate desire to do some just thing on this most deceitful and wretched day of her life. Going up to him she gave him money, and told him to send to the old manor house for wine or whatever he wanted. The train moved off as the trembling man was murmuring his incoherent thanks. Owen waved his hand. Cytherea smiled back to him as if it were unknown to her that she wept all the while. Owen was driven back to the old house. But he could not rest in the lonely place. His conscience began to reproach him for having forced on the marriage of his sister with a little too much peremptoriness. Taking up his crutches he went out of doors and wandered about the muddy roads with no object in view save that of getting rid of time. The clouds which had hung so low and densely during the day cleared from the west just now as the sun was setting, calling forth a weekly twitter from a few small birds. Owen crawled down the path to the waterfall, and lingered there about till the solitude of the place oppressed him, when he turned back and into the road to the village. He was sad, he said to himself. 
if there is ever any meaning in those heavy feelings which are called presentiments and I don't believe there is there will be in mine today. Poor little Cytherea! At that moment the last low rays of the sun touched the head and shoulders of a man who was approaching, and showed him up to Owen's view. It was old Mr. Springrove. They had grown familiar with each other by reason of Owen's visits to Knapp Water during the past year. The farmer inquired how Owen's foot was progressing, and was glad to see him so nimble again. How is your son? said Owen mechanically. He is at home, sitting by the fire, said the farmer, in a sad voice. This morning he slipped indoors from God knows where, and there he sits and mopes and thinks and thinks, and presses his head so hard, that I can't help feeling for him. Is he married? said Owen. Cytheria had feared to tell him of the interview in the garden. No I can't quite understand how the matter rests. Ah Edward, too, who started with such promise, that he should now have become such a careless fellow not a month in one place. There, Mr. Gray, I know what it is mainly owing to. If it hadn't been for that heart affair, he might have done but the less said about him the better. I don't know what we should have done if Miss Aldclyffe had insisted upon the conditions of the leases. Your brother-in-law, the steward, had a hand in making it light for us, I know, and I heartily thank him for it. He ceased speaking, and looked round at the sky. Have you heard oh what's happened, he said suddenly, I was just coming out to learn about it. I haven't heard of anything. It is something very serious, though I don't know what. All I know is what I heard a man call out by now that it very much concerns somebody who lives in the parish. It seems singular enough, even to minds who have no dim beliefs in adumbration and presentiment, that at that moment not the shadow of a thought crossed Owen's mind that the somebody whom the matter concerned might be himself, or any belonging to him. The event about to transpire was as portentous to the woman whose welfare was more dear to him than his own, as any, short of death itself could possibly be, and ever afterwards, when he considered the effect of the knowledge the next half-hour conveyed to his brain, even his practical good sense could not refrain from wonder that he should have walked toward the village after hearing those words of the farmer, in so leisurely and unconcerned a way. How unutterably mean must my intelligence have appeared to the eye of a foreseeing God, he frequently said in after time. Columbus on the eve of his discovery of a world was not so contemptibly unaware. After a few additional words of commonplace the farmer left him, and, as has been said, Owen proceeded slowly and indifferently towards the village. The laboring men had just left work, and passed the park gate, which opened into the street as Owen came down towards it. They went along in a drift, earnestly talking, and were finally about to turn in at their respective doorways. But upon seeing him they looked significantly at one another, and paused. He came into the road, on that side of the village green which was opposite the row of cottages, and turned round to the right. When Owen turned, all eyes turned, one or two men went hurriedly indoors, and afterwards appeared at the doorstep with their wives, who also contemplated him, talking as they looked. They seemed uncertain how to act in some matter. If they want me, surely they will call me, he thought, wondering more and more. He could no longer doubt that he was connected with the subject of their discourse. The first who approached him was a boy. What has occurred? said Owen. Oh, a man ha got crazy religious, and sent for the pa son. Is that all? Yes, sir. He wished he was dead, he said, and he's almost out of his mind wi wishin' it so much. That was before Mr. Ronham came. Who is he? said Owen. Joseph Chinney, one of the railway porters, he used to be night porter. Ah the man who was ill this afternoon, by the way, he was told to come to the old house for something, but he hasn't been. But has anything else happened anything that concerns the wedding today? No, sir. Concluding that the connection which had seemed to be traced between himself and the event must in some way have arisen from Cytheria's friendliness towards the man. Owen turned about and went homewards in a much quieter frame of mind yet scarcely satisfied with the solution. The route he had chosen led through the dairy yard, and he opened the gate. Five minutes before this point of time, 
Edward Springrove was looking over one of his father's fields at an outlying hamlet of three or four cottages some mile and a half distant. A turnpike gate was closed by the gate of the field. The carrier to Casterbridge came up as Edward stepped into the road, and jumped down from the van to pay toll. He recognized Springrove. This is a pretty set to in your place, sir, he said. You don't know about it, I suppose. What? said Springrove. The carrier paid his dues, came up to Edward, and spoke ten words in a confidential whisper, then sprang upon the shafts of his vehicle, gave a clinching nod of significance to Springrove, and rattled away. Edward turned pale with the intelligence. His first thought was, bring her home. The next did Owen Gray know what had been discovered? He probably did by that time but no risks of probability must be run by a woman he loved dearer than all the world besides. He would at any rate make perfectly sure that her brother was in possession of the knowledge, by telling it him with his own lips. Off he ran in the direction of the old manor house. The path was across arable land, and was ploughed up with the rest of the field every autumn, after which it was trodden out afresh. The thaw had so loosened the soft earth that lumps of stiff mud were lifted by his feet at every leap he took, and flung against him by his rapid motion, as it were doggedly impeding him, and increasing tenfold the customary effort of running. But he ran on uphill, and downhill, the same pace alike like the shadow of a cloud. His nearest direction, too, like Owen's, was through the dairy barton, and as Owen entered it he saw the figure of Edward rapidly descending the opposite hill, at a distance of two or three hundred yards. Owen advanced amid the cows. The dairyman, who had hitherto been talking loudly on some absorbing subject to the maids and men milking around him, turned his face towards the head of the cow when Owen passed, and ceased speaking. Owen approached him and said, A singular thing has happened, I hear. The man is not insane, I suppose. Not he he's sensible enough, said the dairyman and paused. He was a man noisy with his associates stolid and taciturn with strangers. Is it true that he is Chinny, the railway porter? That's the man, sir. The mates and men sitting under the cows were all attentively listening to this discourse, milking irregularly, and softly directing the jets against the sides of the pail. Owen could contain himself no longer, much as his mind dreaded anything of the nature of ridicule. The people all seem to look at me, as if something seriously concerned me, is it this stupid matter, or what is it? Surely, sir, you know better than anybody else if such a strange thing concerns you. What strange thing? Don't you know his confessing to Parson Ronham? What did he confess? Tell me. If you really ha and he heard, tis this. He was as usual on duty at the station on the night of the fire last year otherwise he wouldn't ha known it. Known what? For God's sake tell, man. But at this instant the two opposite gates of the dairy yard, one on the east, the other on the west side, slammed almost simultaneously. The rector from one, Spring Grove from the other, came striding across the barton. Edward was nearest, and spoke first. He said in a low voice, your sister is not legally married his first wife is still living how it comes out I don't know. Oh, here you are at last, Mr. Gray, thank heaven said the rector breathlessly. I have been to the old house, and then to Miss Aldclyffe's looking for you something very extraordinary. He beckoned to Owen, afterwards included Springrove in his glance, and the three stepped aside together. A porter at the station. He was a curious nervous man. He had been in a strange state all day, but he wouldn't go home. Your sister was kind to him, it seems, this afternoon. When she and her husband had gone, he went on with his work, shifting luggage vans. Well, he got in the way, as if he were quite lost to what was going on, and they sent him home at last. Then he wished to see me. I went directly. There was something on his mind, he said, and told it. About the time when the fire of last November twelve month was got under, whilst he was by himself in the porter's room, almost asleep, somebody came to the station and tried to open the door. 
He went out and found the person to be the lady he had accompanied to Carryford earlier in the evening, Mrs. Manston. She asked, when would be another train to London? The first the next morning, he told her, was at a quarter past six o'clock from Budmouth, but that it was express, and didn't stop at Carryford Road it didn't stop till it got to Anglebury. How far is it to Anglebury, she said. He told her, and she thanked him and went away up the line. In a short time she ran back and took out her purse. Don't on any account say a word in the village or anywhere that I have been here, or a single breath about me I'm ashamed ever to have come. He promised, she took out two sovereigns. Swear it on the testament in the waiting room, she said, and I'll pay you these. He got the book, took an oath upon it, received the money, and she left him. He was off duty at half past five. He has kept silence all through the intervening time till now, but lately the knowledge he possessed weighed heavily upon his conscience and weak mind. Yet the nearer came the wedding day, the more he feared to tell. The actual marriage filled him with remorse. He says your sister's kindness afterwards was like a knife going through his heart. He thought he had ruined her. But whatever can be done? Why didn't he speak sooner? cried Owen. He actually called at my house twice yesterday, the rector continued, resolved, it seems, to unburden his mind. I was out both times he left no message, and, they say, he looked relieved that his object was defeated. Then he says he resolved to come to you at the old house last night started, reached the door, and dreaded to knock and then went home again. Here will be a tale for the newsmongers of the county, said Owen bitterly. The idea of his not opening his mouth sooner the criminality of the thing. Ah, that's the inconsistency of a weak nature. But now that it is put to us in this way, how much more probable it seems that she should have escaped than have been burnt. You will, of course, go straight to Mr. Manston, and ask him what it all means. Edward interrupted. Of course I shall Manston has no right to carry off my sister unless he's her husband, said Owen. I shall go and separate them. Certainly you will, said the rector. Where's the man? In his cottage. Tis no use going to him, either. I must go off at once and overtake them lay the case before Manston, and ask him for additional and certain proofs of his first wife's death. An up train passes soon, I think. Where have they gone? said Edward. To Paris as far as Southampton this afternoon, to proceed tomorrow morning. Where in Southampton? I really don't know some hotel. I only have their Paris address. But I shall find them by making a few inquiries. The rector had in the meantime been taking out his pocket book, and now opened it at the first page whereon it was his custom every month to gum a small railway timetable cut from the local newspaper. The afternoon express is just gone, he said, holding open the page, and the next train to Southampton passes at ten minutes to six o'clock. Now it wants let me see five and forty minutes to that time. Mr. Gray, my advice is that you come with me to the porter's cottage, where I will shortly write out the substance of what he has said, and get him to sign it. You will then have far better grounds for interfering between Mr. and Mrs. Manston than if you went to them with a mere hearsay story. The suggestion seemed a good one. Yes, there will be time before the train starts, said Owen. Edward had been musing restlessly. Let me go to Southampton in your place, on account of your lameness, he said suddenly to Gray. I am much obliged to you, but I think I can scarcely accept the offer, returned Owen coldly. M. R. Manston is an honorable man, and I had much better see him myself. There is no doubt, said Mr. Ronham, that the death of his wife was fully believed in by himself. None whatever, said Owen, and the news must be broken to him, and the question of other proofs asked, in a friendly way. It would not do for Mr. Springrove to appear in the case at all. He still spoke rather coldly, the recollection of the attachment between his sister and Edward was not a pleasant one to him. You will never find them, said Edward. You have never been to Southampton, and I know every house there. That makes little difference, said the rector, he will have a cab. 
Certainly Mr. Gray is the proper man to go on the errand. Stay, I'll telegraph to ask them to meet me when I arrive at the terminus, said Owen, that is, if their train has not already arrived. Mr. Ronham pulled out his pocketbook again. The 2.30 train reached Southampton a quarter of an hour ago, he said. It was too late to catch them at the station. Nevertheless, the rector suggested that it would be worthwhile to direct a message to all the respectable hotels in Southampton, on the chance of its finding them, and thus saving a deal of personal labor to Owen in searching about the place. I'll go and telegraph, whilst you return to the man, said Edward an offer which was accepted. Gray and the rector then turned off in the direction of the porter's cottage. Edward, to dispatch the message at once, hurriedly followed the road towards the station, still restlessly thinking. All Owen's proceedings were based on the assumption, natural under the circumstances, of Manston's good faith, and that he would readily acquiesce in any arrangement which should clear up the mystery. But, thought Edward, suppose and heaven forgive me. I cannot help supposing it that Manston is not that honourable man, what will a young and inexperienced fellow like Owen do? Will he not be hoodwinked by some specious story or another, framed to last till Manston gets tired of poor Cytheria? And then the disclosure of the truth will ruin and blacken both their futures irremediably. However, he proceeded to execute his commission. This he put in the form of a simple request from Owen to Manston, that Manston would come to the Southampton platform, and wait for Owen's arrival, as he valued his reputation. The message was directed as the rector had suggested, Edward guaranteeing to the clerk who sent it off that every expense connected with the search would be paid. No sooner had the telegram been dispatched than his heart sank within him at the want of foresight shown in sending it. Had Manston, all the time, a knowledge that his first wife lived, the telegram would be a forewarning which might enable him to defeat Owen still more signally. Whilst the machine was still giving off its multitudinous series of raps, Edward heard a powerful rush under the shed outside, followed by a long sonorous creak. It was a train of some sort, stealing softly into the station, and it was an up train. There was the ring of a bell. It was certainly a passenger train. Yet the booking office window was closed. Ho, ho, John, seventeen minutes after time and only three stations up the line. The incline again. The voice was the station master's, and the reply seemed to come from the guard. Yes, the other side of the cutting. The thaw has made it all in a perfect cloud of fog, and the rails are as slippery as glass. We had to bring them through the cutting at twice. Anybody else for the 445 Express, the voice continued. The few passengers, having crossed over to the other side long before this time, had taken their places at once. A conviction suddenly broke in upon Edward's mind, then a wish overwhelmed him. The conviction as startling as it was sudden was that Manston was a villain, who at some earlier time had discovered that his wife lived, and had bribed her to keep out of sight, that he might possess Cytherea. The wish was to proceed at once by this very train that was starting find Manston before he would expect from the words of the telegram if he got it that anybody from Carry Ford could be with him charge him boldly with the crime, and trust to his consequent confusion if he were guilty for a solution of the extraordinary riddle, and the release of Cytherea. The ticket office had been locked up at the expiration of the time at which the train was due. Rushing out as the guard blew his whistle, Edward opened the door of a carriage and leapt in. The train moved along, and he was soon out of sight. Spring Grove had long since passed that peculiar line which lies across the course of falling in love if, indeed, it may not be called the initial itself of the complete passion a longing to cherish, when the woman is shifted in a man's mind from the region of mere admiration to the region of warm fellowship. At this assumption of her nature, she changes to him in tone, hue, and expression. All about the loved one that said she before, says we now. Eyes that were to be subdued become eyes to be feared for, a brain that was to be probed by cynicism becomes a brain that is to be tenderly assisted, feet that were to be tested in the dance become feet that are not to be distressed, the once criticized accent, manner, and dress, become the clients of a special pleader. 5 to 8 o'clock p.m. Now that he was fairly on the track, and had begun to cool down, 
Edward remembered that he had nothing to show no legal authority whatever to question Manston or interfere between him and Cytherea as husband and wife. He now saw the wisdom of the rector in obtaining a signed confession from the porter. The document would not be a deathbed confession perhaps not worth anything legally but it would be held by Owen, and he alone, as Cytherea's natural guardian, could separate them on the mere ground of an unproved probability, or what might perhaps be called the hallucination of an idiot. Edward himself, however, was as firmly convinced as the rector had been of the truth of the man's story, and paced backward and forward the solitary compartment as the train wound through the dark heathery plains, the mazy woods, and moaning coppices, as resolved as ever to pounce on Manston, and charge him with the crime during the critical interval between the reception of the telegram and the hour at which Owen's train would arrive trusting to circumstances for what he should say and do. Afterwards, but making up his mind to be a ready second to Owen in any emergency that might arise. At thirty-three minutes past seven he stood on the platform of the station at Southampton a clear hour before the train containing Owen could possibly arrive. Making a few inquiries here, but too impatient to pursue his investigation carefully and inductively, he went into the town. At the expiration of another half-hour he had visited seven hotels and inns, large and small, asking the same questions at each, and always receiving the same reply nobody of that name, or answering to that description, had been there. A boy from the telegraph office had called, asking for the same persons, if they recollected rightly. He reflected a while, struck again by a painful thought that they might possibly have decided to cross the channel by the night boat. Then he hastened off to another quarter of the town to pursue his inquiries among hotels of the more old-fashioned and quiet class. His stained and weary appearance obtained for him but a modicum of civility, wherever he went, which made his task yet more difficult. He called at three several houses in this neighborhood, with the same result as before. He entered the door of the fourth house whilst the clock of the nearest church was striking eight. Have a tall gentleman named Manston, and a young wife arrived here this evening, he asked again, in words which had grown odd to his ears from very familiarity. A new married couple, did you say? They are, though I didn't say so. They have taken a sitting room and bedroom, number thirteen. Are they indoors? I don't know. Eliza. Yes, M.M. See if number 13 is in that gentleman and his wife. Yes, M.M. Has any telegram come for them, said Edward, when the maid had gone on her errand. No nothing that I know of. Somebody did come and ask if a Mr. and Mrs. Masters, or some such name, were here this evening, said another voice from the back of the bar parlor. And did they get the message? Of course they did not they were not here they didn't come till half an hour after that. The man who made inquiries left no message. I told them when they came that they, or a name something like theirs, had been asked for, but they didn't seem to understand why it should be, and so the matter dropped. The chambermaid came back. The gentleman is not in, but the lady is. Who shall I say? Nobody, said Edward for it now became necessary to reflect upon his method of proceeding. His object in finding their whereabouts apart from the wish to assist Owen had been to see Manston, ask him flatly for an explanation, and confirm the request of the message in the presence of Cytherea so as to prevent the possibility of the steward's palming off a story upon Cytherea, or eluding her brother when he came. But here were two important modifications of the expected condition of affairs. The telegram had not been received, and Cytherea was in the house alone. He hesitated as to the propriety of intruding upon her in Manston's absence. Besides, the women at the bottom of the stairs would see him his intrusion would seem odd and Manston might return at any moment. He certainly might call, and wait for Manston with the accusation upon his tongue, as he had intended. But it was a doubtful course. That idea had been based upon the assumption that Cytherea was not married. If the first wife were really dead after all and he felt sick at the thought Cytherea as the steward's wife might in after years perhaps, at once be subjected to indignity and cruelty on account of an old lover's interference now. Yes, perhaps the announcement would come most properly and safely for her from her brother Owen, the time of whose arrival had almost expired. But, 
On turning round, he saw that the staircase and passage were quite deserted. He and his errand had as completely died from the minds of the attendants as if they had never been. There was absolutely nothing between him and Cytherea's presence. Reason was powerless now, he must see her right or wrong, fair or unfair to Manston offensive to her brother or no. His lips must be the first to tell the alarming story to her. Who loved her as he he went back lightly through the hall, up the stairs, two at a time, and followed the corridor till he came to the door numbered thirteen. He knocked softly, nobody answered. There was no time to lose if he would speak to Cytherea before Manston came. He turned the handle of the door and looked in. The lamp on the table burned low, and showed writing materials open beside it, the chief light came from the fire, the direct rays of which were obscured by a sweet familiar outline of head and shoulders still as precious to him as ever. A quarter past eight o'clock p.m. There is an attitude approximately called pensive in which the soul of a human being, and especially of a woman, dominates outwardly and expresses its presence so strongly, that the intangible essence seems more apparent than the body itself. This was Cytherea's expression now. What old days and sunny eves at Budmouth Bay was she picturing? Her reverie had caused her not to notice his knock. Cytherea he said softly. She let drop her hand, and turned her head, evidently thinking that her visitor could be no other than Manston, yet puzzled at the voice. There was no preface on Springrove's tongue, he forgot his position hers that he had come to ask quietly if Manston had other proofs of being a widower everything and jumped to a conclusion. You are not his wife, Cytherea come away, he has a wife living he cried in an agitated whisper. Owen will be here directly. She started up, recognized the tidings first, the bearer of them afterwards. Not his wife. Oh, what is it what who is living? She awoke by degrees. What must I do? Edward, it is you why did you come? Where is Owen? What has Manston shown you in proof of the death of his other wife? Tell me quick. Nothing we have never spoken of the subject. Where is my brother Owen? I want him, I want him. He is coming by and by. Come to the station to meet him do, implored Springrove. If Mr. Manston comes, he will keep you from me, I am nobody, he added bitterly, feeling the reproach her words had faintly shadowed forth. M. R. Manston is only gone out to post a letter he has just written, she said, and without being distinctly cognizant of the action, she wildly looked for her bonnet and cloak, and began putting them on, but in the act of fastening them uttered a spasmodic cry. No, I'll not go out with you, she said, flinging the articles down again. Running to the door she flitted along the passage, and downstairs. Give me a private room quite private she said breathlessly to someone below. Number twelve is a single room, madam, and unoccupied, said some tongue in astonishment. Without waiting for any person to show her into it, Cytherea hurried upstairs again, brushed through the corridor, entered the room specified, and closed the door. Edward heard her sob out. Nobody but Owen shall speak to me nobody. He will be here directly, said Springrove, close against the panel and then went towards the stairs. He had seen her, it was enough. He descended, stepped into the street, and hastened to meet Owen at the railway station. As for the poor maiden who had received the news, she knew not what to think. She listened till the echo of Edward's footsteps had died away, then bowed her face upon the bed. Her sudden impulse had been to escape from sight. Her weariness after the unwanted strain, mental and bodily, which had been put upon her by the scenes she had passed through during the long day, rendered her much more timid and shaken by her position than she would naturally have been. She thought and thought of that single fact which had been told her that the first Mrs. Manston was still living till her brain seemed ready to burst its confinement with excess of throbbing. It was only natural that she should, by degrees, be unable to separate the discovery, which was matter of fact, from the suspicion of treachery on her husband's part which was only matter of inference. And thus there arose in her a personal fear of him. Suppose he should come in now and seize me this at first mere frenzied supposition grew by degrees to a definite horror of his presence, and especially of his intense gaze. 
Thus she raised herself to a heat of excitement, which was none the less real for being vented in no cry of any kind. No, she could not meet Manston's eye alone, she would only see him in her brother's company. Almost delirious with this idea, she ran and locked the door to prevent all possibility of her intentions being nullified, or a look or word being flung at her by anybody whilst she knew not what she was. Half past eight o'clock p.m. Then Cytheria felt her way amid the darkness of the room till she came to the head of the bed, where she searched for the bell rope and gave it a pull. Her summons was speedily answered by the landlady herself, whose curiosity to know the meaning of these strange proceedings knew no bounds. The landlady attempted to turn the handle of the door. Cytheria kept the door locked. Please tell Mr. Manston when he comes that I am ill, she said from the inside, and that I cannot see him. Certainly I will, madam, said the landlady. Won't you have a fire? No, thank you. Nor a light. I don't want one, thank you. Nor anything. Nothing. The landlady withdrew, thinking her visitor half insane. Manston came in about five minutes later, and went at once up to the sitting room, fully expecting to find his wife there. He looked round, rang, and was told the words Cytheria had said, that she was too ill to be seen. She is in number twelve room, added the maid. Manston was alarmed, and knocked at the door. Cytheria. I am unwell, I cannot see you, she said. Are you seriously ill, dearest? Surely not. No, not seriously. Let me come in, I will get a doctor. No, he can't see me either. She won't open the door, sir, not to nobody at all, said the chambermaid, with wonder waiting eyes. Hold your tongue, and be off, said Manston with a snap. The maid vanished. Come, Cytheria, this is foolish indeed it is not opening the door. I cannot comprehend what can be the matter with you. Nor can a doctor either, unless he sees you. Her voice had trembled more and more at each answer she gave, but nothing could induce her to come out and confront him. Hating scenes, Manston went back to the sitting room, greatly irritated and perplexed. And there Cytheria from the adjoining room could hear him pacing up and down. She thought, suppose he insists upon seeing me he probably may and will burst open the door this notion increased, and she sank into a corner in a half-somnolent state, but with ears alive to the slightest sound. Reason could not overthrow the delirious fancy that outside her door stood Manston and all the people in the hotel, waiting to laugh her to scorn. Half past eight to eleven p.m. In the meantime, Springgrove was pacing up and down the arrival platform of the railway station. Half past eight o'clock the time at which Owen's train was due had come, and passed, but no train appeared. When will the 8.30 train be in? he asked of a man who was sweeping the mud from the steps. She is not expected yet this hour. How is that? Christmas time, you see, tis always so. People are running about to see their friends. The trains have been like it ever since Christmas Eve, and will be for another week yet. Edward again went on walking and waiting under the drafty roof. He found it utterly impossible to leave the spot. His mind was so intent upon the importance of meeting with Owen, and informing him of Cytheria's whereabouts, that he could not but fancy Owen might leave the station unobserved if he turned his back, and become lost to him in the streets of the town. The hour expired. Ten o'clock struck. When will the train be in? said Edward to the telegraph clerk. In five and thirty minutes. She's now at L. They have extra passengers, and the rails are bad today. At last, at a quarter to eleven, the train came in. The first to alight from it was Owen, looking pale and cold. He casually glanced round upon the nearly deserted platform, and was hurrying to the outlet, when his eyes fell upon Edward. At sight of his friend he was quite bewildered, and could not speak. Here I am, Mr. Gray, said Edward cheerfully. I have seen Cytheria, and she has been waiting for you these two or three hours. Owen took Edward's hand, pressed it, and looked at him in silence. Such was the concentration of his mind, 
that not till many minutes after did he think of inquiring how Spring Grove had contrived to be there before him. 11 o'clock p.m. On their arrival at the door of the hotel, it was arranged between Spring Grove and Gray that the latter only should enter, Edward waiting outside. Owen had remembered continually what his friend had frequently overlooked, that there was yet a possibility of his sister being Manston's wife, and the recollection taught him to avoid any rashness in his proceedings which might lead to bitterness hereafter. Entering the room, he found Manston sitting in the chair which had been occupied by Cytherea on Edward's visit, three hours earlier. Before Owen had spoken, Manston arose and stepping past him closed the door. His face appeared harassed much more troubled than the slight circumstance which had as yet come to his knowledge seemed to account for. Manston could form no reason for Owen's presence, but intuitively linked it with Cytherea's seclusion. Altogether this is most unseemly, he said, whatever it may mean. Don't think there is meant anything unfriendly by my coming here, said Owen earnestly, but listen to this, and think if I could do otherwise than come. He took from his pocket the confession of Chinny the porter, as hastily written out by the vicar, and read it aloud. The aspects of Manston's face whilst he listened to the opening words were strange, dark, and mysterious enough to have justified suspicions that no deceit could be too complicated for the possessor of such impulses, had there not overridden them all, as the reading went on, a new and irrepressible expression one unmistakably honest. It was that of unqualified amazement in the steward's mind at the news he heard. Owen looked up and saw it. The sight only confirmed him in the belief he had held throughout, in antagonism to Edward's suspicions. There could no longer be a shadow of doubt that if the first Mrs. Manston lived, her husband was ignorant of the fact. What he could have feared by his ghastly look at first, and now have ceased to fear, it was quite futile to conjecture. Now I do not for a moment doubt your complete ignorance of the whole matter, you cannot suppose for an instant that I do, said Owen when he had finished reading. But is it not best for both that Cytherea should come back with me till the matter is cleared up? In fact, under the circumstances, no other course is left open to me than to request it. Whatever Manston's original feelings had been, all in him now gave way to irritation, an irritation to rage. He paced up and down the room till he had mastered it, then said in ordinary tones. Certainly, I know no more than you and others know it was a gratuitous unpleasantness in you to say you did not doubt me. Why should you, or anybody, have doubted me? Well, where is my sister, said Owen. Locked in the next room. His own answer reminded Manston that Cytherea must, by some inscrutable means, have had an inkling of the event. Owen had gone to the door of Cytherea's room. Cytherea, darling tis Owen, he said, outside the door. A rustling of clothes, soft footsteps, and a voice saying from the inside, Is it really you, Owen is it really? It is. Oh, will you take care of me? Always. She unlocked the door, and retreated again. Manston came forward from the other room with a candle in his hand, as Owen pushed open the door. Her frightened eyes were unnaturally large, and shone like stars in the darkness of the background, as the light fell upon them. She leapt up to Owen in one bound, her small taper fingers extended like the leaves of a lupin. Then she clasped her cold and trembling hands round his neck and shivered. The sight of her again kindled all Manston's passions into activity. She shall not go with you, he said firmly and stepping a pace or two closer, unless you prove that she is not my wife, and you can't do it. This is proof, said Owen, holding up the paper. No proof at all, said Manston hotly. Tis not a deathbed confession, and those are the only things of the kind held as good evidence. Send for a lawyer, Owen returned, and let him tell us the proper course to adopt. Never mind the law let me go with Owen cried Cytherea still holding on to him. You will let me go with him, won't you, sir, she said, turning appealingly to Manston. We'll have it all right and square, said Manston, with more quietness. I have no objection to your brother sending for a lawyer, if he wants to. It was getting on for twelve o'clock, but the proprietor of the hotel had not yet gone to bed on account of the mystery on the first floor, 
which was an occurrence unusual in the quiet family lodging. Owen looked over the banisters, and saw him standing in the hall. It struck Grey that the wisest course would be to take the landlord to a certain extent into their confidence, appeal to his honour as a gentleman, and so on, in order to acquire the information he wanted, and also to prevent the episode of the evening from becoming a public piece of news. He called the landlord up to where they stood, and told him the main facts of the story. The landlord was fortunately a quiet, prejudiced man, and a meditative smoker. I know the very man you want to see the very man, he said, looking at the general features of the candle flame. Sharp as a needle, and not over rich. Tim's will put you all straight in no time trust Tim's for that. He's in bed by this time for certain, said Owen. Never mind that Tim's knows me, I know him. He'll oblige me as a personal favor. Wait here a bit. Perhaps, too. He's up at some party or another he's a nice, jovial fellow, sharp as a needle, too, mind you, sharp as a needle, too. He went downstairs, put on his overcoat, and left the house, the three persons most concerned entering the room, and standing motionless, awkward and silent in the midst of it. Cytheria pictured to herself the long weary minutes she would have to stand there, whilst a sleepy man could be prepared for consultation till the constraint between them seemed unendurable to her she could never last out the time. Owen was annoyed that Manston had not quietly arranged with him at once, Manston at Owen's homeliness of idea in proposing to send for an attorney, as if he would be a touchstone of infallible proof. Reflection was cut short by the approach of footsteps, and in a few moments the proprietor of the hotel entered, introducing his friend. M.R. Timms has not been in bed, he said. He had just returned from dining with a few friends, so there's no trouble given. To save time I explained the matter as we came along. It occurred to Owen and Manston both that they might get a misty exposition of the law from Mr. Timms at that moment of concluding dinner with a few friends. As far as I can see, said the lawyer, yawning, and turning his vision inward by main force, it is quite a matter for private arrangement between the parties, whoever the parties are at least at present. I speak more as a father than as a lawyer, it is true, but, let the young lady stay with her father, or guardian, safe out of shame's way, until the mystery is sifted, whatever the mystery is. Should the evidence prove to be false, or trumped up by anybody to get her away from you, her husband, you may sue them for the damages accruing from the delay. Yes, yes, said Manston, who had completely recovered his self-possession and common sense, let it all be settled by herself. Turning to Cytheria he whispered so softly that Owen did not hear the words. Do you wish to go back with your brother, dearest, and leave me here miserable, and lonely, or will you stay with me, your own husband? I'll go back with Owen. Very well. He relinquished his coaxing tone, and went on sternly, and remember this, Cytheria, I am as innocent of deception in this thing as you are yourself. Do you believe me? I do, she said. I had no shadow of suspicion that my first wife lived. I don't think she does even now. Do you believe me? I believe you, she said. And now, good evening, he continued, opening the door and politely intimating to the three men standing by that there was no further necessity for their remaining in his room. In three days I shall claim her. The lawyer and the hotel keeper retired first. Owen, gathering up as much of his sister's clothing as lay about the room, took her upon his arm, and followed them. Edward, to whom she owed everything, who had been left standing in the street like a dog without a home, was utterly forgotten. Owen paid the landlord and the lawyer for the trouble he had occasioned them, looked to the packing, and went to the door. A fly which somewhat unaccountably was seen lingering in front of the house, was called up, and Cytheria's luggage put upon it. Do you know of any hotel near the station that is open for night arrivals? Owen inquired of the driver. A place has been bespoke for you, sir, at the White Unicorn and the gentleman wished me to give you this. Bespoken by Springrove, who ordered the fly, of course, said Owen to himself. By the light of the street lamp he read these lines, hurriedly traced in pencil. 
I have gone home by the mail train. It is better for all parties that I should be out of the way. Tell Cytheria that I apologize for having caused her such unnecessary pain, as it seems I did but it cannot be helped now. Yes. Owen handed his sister into the vehicle, and told the flyman to drive on. Poor Springgrove I think we have served him rather badly, he said to Cytheria, repeating the words of the note to her. A thrill of pleasure passed through her bosom as she listened to them. They were the genuine reproach of a lover to his mistress, the trifling coldness of her answer to him would have been noticed by no man who was only a friend. But, in entertaining that sweet thought, she had forgotten herself, and her position for the instant. Was she still Manston's wife that was the terrible supposition, and her future seemed still a possible misery to her. For, on account of the late jarring accident, a life with Manston which would otherwise have been only a sadness, must become a burden of unutterable sorrow. Then she thought of the misrepresentation and scandal that would ensue if she were no wife. One cause for thankfulness accompanied the reflection, Edward knew the truth. They soon reached the quiet old inn, which had been selected for them by the forethought of the man who loved her well. Here they installed themselves for the night, arranging to go to Budmouth by the first train the next day. At this hour Edward Springrove was fast approaching his native county on the wheels of the night mail. 14 The Events of Five Weeks From the 6th to the 13th of January Manston had evidently resolved to do nothing in a hurry. This much was plain, that his earnest desire and intention was to raise in Cytheria's bosom no feelings of permanent aversion to him. The instant after the first burst of disappointment had escaped him in the hotel at Southampton, he had seen how far better it would be to lose her presence for a week than her respect for ever. She shall be mine, I will claim the young thing yet, he insisted. And then he seemed to reason over methods for compassing that object, which, to all those who were in any degree acquainted with the recent event, appeared the least likely of possible contingencies. He returned to Knapwater late the next day, and was preparing to call on Miss Aldclyffe, when the conclusion forced itself upon him that nothing would be gained by such a step. No, every action of his should be done openly even religiously. At least, he called on the rector, and stated this to be his resolve. Certainly, said Mr. Ronham, it is best to proceed candidly and fairly, or undue suspicion may fall on you. You should, in my opinion, take active steps at once. I will do the utmost that lies in my power to clear up the mystery, and silence the hubbub of gossip that has been set going about me. But what can I do? They say that the man who comes first in the chain of inquiry is not to be found I mean the porter. I am sorry to say that he is not. When I returned from the station last night, after seeing Owen Gray off, I went again to the cottage where he has been lodging, to get more intelligence, as I thought. He was not there. He had gone out at dusk, saying he would be back soon. But he has not come back yet. I rather doubt if we shall see him again. Had I known of this, I would have done what in my flurry I did not think of doing set a watch upon him. But why not advertise for your missing wife as a preliminary, consulting your solicitor in the meantime? Advertise. I'll think about it, said Manston, lingering on the word as he pronounced it. Yes, that seems a right thing quite a right thing. He went home and remained moodily indoors all the next day and the next for nearly a week, in short. Then, one evening at dusk, he went out with an uncertain air as to the direction of his walk, which resulted, however, in leading him again to the rectory. He saw Mr. Ronham. Have you done anything yet? the rector inquired. No I have not, said Manston absently. But I am going to set about it. He hesitated, as if ashamed of some weakness he was about to betray. My object in calling was to ask if you had heard any tidings from Budmouth of my Cytheria. You used to speak of her as one you were interested in. There was, at any rate, real sadness in Manston's tone now, and the rector paused to weigh his words ere he replied. I have not heard directly from her, he said gently. But her brother has communicated with some people in the parish. The Springgroves, I suppose, said Manston gloomily. Yes, 
and they tell me that she is very ill, and I am sorry to say, likely to be for some days. Surely, surely, I must go and see her, Manston cried. I would advise you not to go, said Ronham. But do this instead be as quick as you can in making a movement towards ascertaining the truth as regards the existence of your wife. You see, Mr. Manston, an outstep place like this is not like a city, and there is nobody to busy himself for the good of the community, whilst poor Cytheria and her brother are socially too dependent to be able to make much stir in the matter, which is a greater reason still why you should be disinterestedly prompt. The steward murmured an assent. Still there was the same indecision not the indecision of weakness the indecision of conscious perplexity. On Manston's return from this interview at the rectory, he passed the door of the Rising Sun Inn. Finding he had no light for his cigar, and it being three quarters of a mile to his residence in the park, he entered the tavern to get one. Nobody was in the outer portion of the front room where Manston stood, but a space round the fire was screened off from the remainder, and inside the high oak settle, forming a part of the screen, he heard voices conversing. The speakers had not noticed his footsteps, and continued their discourse. One of the two he recognized as a well-known night poacher, the man who had met him with tidings of his wife's death on the evening of the conflagration. The other seemed to be a stranger following the same mode of life. The conversation was carried on in the emphatic and confidential tone of men who are slightly intoxicated, its subject being an unaccountable experience that one of them had had on the night of the fire. What the steward heard was enough, and more than enough, to lead him to forget or to renounce his motive in entering. The effect upon him was strange and strong. His first object seemed to be to escape from the house again without being seen or heard. Having accomplished this, he went in at the park gate, and strode off under the trees to the old house. There sitting down by the fire, and burying himself in reflection, he allowed the minutes to pass by unheeded. First the candle burnt down in its socket and stunk, he did not notice it. Then the fire went out, he did not see it. His feet grew cold, still he thought on. It may be remarked that a lady, a year and a quarter before this time, had, under the same conditions an unrestricted mental absorption shown nearly the same peculiarities as this man evinced now. The lady was Miss Aldclyffe. It was half past twelve when Manston moved, as if he had come to a determination. The first thing he did the next morning was to call at Knapwater House, where he found that Miss Aldclyffe was not well enough to see him. She had been ailing from slight internal hemorrhage ever since the confession of the porter Chinney. Apparently not much aggrieved at the denial, he shortly afterwards went to the railway station and took his departure for London leaving a letter for Miss Aldclyffe, stating the reason of his journey thither to recover traces of his missing wife. During the remainder of the week paragraphs appeared in the local and other newspapers, drawing attention to the facts of this singular case. The writers, with scarcely an exception, dwelt forcibly upon a feature which had at first escaped the observation of the villagers, including Mr. Ronham that if the announcement of the Manchini were true, it seemed extremely probable that Mrs. Manston left her watch and keys behind on purpose to blind people as to her escape, and that therefore she would not now let herself be discovered, unless a strong pressure were put upon her. The writers added that the police were on the track of the porter, who very possibly had absconded in the fear that his reticence was criminal, and that Mr. Manston, the husband, was, with praiseworthy energy, making every effort to clear the whole matter up. From the 18th to the end of January. Five days from the time of his departure, Manston returned from London and Liverpool, looking very fatigued and thoughtful. He explained to the rector and other of his acquaintance that all the inquiries he had made at his wife's old lodgings and his own had been totally barren of results. But he seemed inclined to push the affair to a clear conclusion now that he had commenced. After the lapse of another day or two, he proceeded to fulfill his promise to the rector and advertised for the missing woman in three of the London papers. The advertisement was a carefully considered and even attractive effusion, calculated to win the heart, or at least the understanding, of any woman who had a spark of her own nature left in her. There was no answer. Three days later he repeated the experiment, with the same result as before. I cannot try any further, 
said Manston speciously to the rector, his sole auditor throughout the proceedings. M.R. Ronham, I'll tell you the truth plainly, I don't love her, I do love Cytheria, and the whole of this business of searching for the other woman goes altogether against me. I hope to God I shall never see her again. But you will do your duty at least, said Mr. Ronham. I have done it, said Manston. If ever a man on the face of this earth has done his duty towards an absent wife, I have towards her living or dead at least, he added, correcting himself, since I have lived at Knapwater. I neglected her before that time I own that, as I have owned it before. I should, if I were you, adopt other means to get tidings of her if advertising fails, in spite of my feelings, said the rector emphatically. But at any rate, try advertising once more. There's a satisfaction in having made any attempt three several times. When Manston had left the study, the rector stood looking at the fire for a considerable length of time, lost in profound reflection. He went to his private diary, and after many pauses, which he varied only by dipping his pen, letting it dry, wiping it on his sleeve, and then dipping it again, he took the following note of events. January Mr. Manston has just seen me for the third time on the subject of his lost wife. There have been these peculiarities attending the three interviews. The first. My visitor, whilst expressing by words his great anxiety to do everything for her recovery, showed plainly by his bearing that he was convinced he should never see her again. The second. He had left off feigning anxiety to do rightly by his first wife, and honestly asked after Cytheria's welfare. The third and most remarkable. He seemed to have lost all consistency. Whilst expressing his love for Cytheria which certainly is strong and evincing the usual indifference to the first Mrs. Manston's fate, he was unable to conceal the intensity of his eagerness for me to advise him to advertise again for her. A week after the second, the third advertisement was inserted. A paragraph was attached, which stated that this would be the last time the announcement would appear. The 1st of February. At this, the 11th hour, the postman brought a letter for Manston, directed in a woman's hand. A bachelor friend of the stewards, Mr. Dixon by name, who was somewhat of a chatterer plenus rimerum and who boasted of an endless string of acquaintances, had come over from Casterbridge the preceding day by invitation an invitation which had been a pleasant surprise to Dixon himself, insomuch that Manston, as a rule, voted him a bore almost to his face. He had stayed over the night, and was sitting at breakfast with his host when the important missive arrived. Manston did not attempt to conceal the subject of the letter, or the name of the writer. First glancing the pages through, he read aloud as follows. My husband I implore your forgiveness. During the last thirteen months I have repeated to myself a hundred times that you should never discover what I voluntarily tell you now, namely, that I am alive and in perfect health. I have seen all your advertisements. Nothing but your persistence has won me round. Surely, I thought, he must love me still. Why else should he try to win back a woman who, faithful unto death as she will be, can, in a social sense, aid him towards acquiring nothing, rather the reverse, indeed? You yourself state my own mind that the only grounds upon which we can meet and live together, with a reasonable hope of happiness, must be a mutual consent to bury in oblivion all past differences. I heartily and willingly forget everything and forgive everything. You will do the same as your actions show. There will be plenty of opportunity for me to explain the few facts relating to my escape on the night of the fire. I will only give the heads in this hurried note. I was grieved at your not coming to fetch me, more grieved at your absence from the station, most of all by your absence from home. On my journey to the inn I writhed under a passionate sense of wrong done me. When I had been shown to my room I waited and hoped for you till the landlord had gone upstairs to bed. I still found that you did not come, and then I finally made up my mind to leave. I had half undressed, but I put on my things again, forgetting my watch and I suppose dropping my keys, though I am not sure where in my hurry, and slipped out of the house. They. Well, that's a rum story, said Mr. Dixon, interrupting. What's a rum story, said Manston hastily, 
and flushing in the face. Forgetting her watch and dropping her keys in her hurry. I don't see anything particularly wonderful in it. Any woman might do such a thing. Any woman might if escaping from fire or shipwreck, or any such immediate danger. But it seems incomprehensible to me that any woman in her senses, who quietly decides to leave a house, should be so forgetful. All that is required to reconcile your seeming with her facts is to assume that she was not in her senses, for that's what she did plainly, or how could the things have been found there? Besides, she's truthful enough. He spoke eagerly and peremptorily. Yes, yes, I know that. I merely meant that it seemed rather odd. Oh yes. Manston read on. And slipped out of the house. The rubbish heap was burning up brightly, but the thought that the house was in danger did not strike me, I did not consider that it might be thatched. I idled in the lane behind the wood till the last down train had come in, not being in a mood to face strangers. Whilst I was there the fire broke out, and this perplexed me still more. However, I was still determined not to stay in the place. I went to the railway station, which was now quiet, and inquired of the solitary man on duty there concerning the trains. It was not till I had left the man that I saw the effect the fire might have on my history. I considered also, though not in any detailed manner, that the event, by attracting the attention of the village to my former abode, might set people on my track should they doubt my death, and a sudden dread of having to go back again to nap water a place which had seemed inimical to me from first to last prompted me to run back and bribe the porter to secrecy. I then walked on to Angleberry lingering about the outskirts of the town till the morning train came in, when I proceeded by it to London, and then took these lodgings, where I have been supporting myself ever since by needlework, endeavouring to save enough money to pay my passage home to America, but making melancholy progress in my attempt. However, all that is changed can I be otherwise than happy at it? Of course not. I am happy. Tell me what I am to do and believe me still to be your faithful wife, Eunice. My name here is as before. M.R.S. Rondley, and my address. Addington Street. Lambeth. The name and address were written on a separate slip of paper. So it's to be all right at last then, said Manston's friend. But after all there's another woman in the case. You don't seem very sorry for the little thing who is put to such distress by this turn of affairs? I wonder you can let her go so coolly. The speaker was looking out between the mullions of the window noticing that some of the lights were glazed in lozenges, some in squares as he said the words, otherwise he would have seen the passionate expression of agonized hopelessness that flitted across the steward's countenance when the remark was made. He did not see it, and Manston answered after a short interval. The way in which he spoke of the young girl who had believed herself his wife, whom, a few short days ago, he had openly idolized, and whom, in his secret heart, he idolized still, as far as such a form of love was compatible with his nature, showed that from policy or otherwise, he meant to act up to the requirements of the position into which fate appeared determined to drive him. That's neither here nor there, he said, it is a point of honor to do as I am doing and there's an end of it. Yes. Only I thought you used not to care over much about your first bargain. I certainly did not at one time. One is apt to feel rather weary of wives when they are so devilish civil under all aspects, as she used to be. But anything for a change Abigail is lost, but Michael is recovered. You would hardly believe it, but she seems in fancy to be quite another bride in fact, almost as if she had really risen from the dead instead of having only done so virtually. You let the young pink one know that the other has come or is coming. Cui bono. The steward meditated critically, showing a portion of his intensely white and regular teeth within the ruby lips. I cannot say anything to her that will do any good, he resumed. It would be awkward either seeing or communicating with her again. The best plan to adopt will be to let matters take their course she'll find it all out soon enough. Manston found himself alone a few minutes later. He buried his face in his hands, and murmured, Oh my lost one oh my Cytherea that it should come to this is hard for me tis now all darkness a land of darkness as darkness itself, 
and of the shadow of death without any order, and where the light is as darkness. Yes, the artificial bearing which this extraordinary man had adopted before strangers ever since he had overheard the conversation at the inn, left him now, and he mourned for Cytherea aloud. The 12th of February Knapwater Park is the picture at 11 o'clock on a muddy, quiet, hazy, but bright morning a morning without any blue sky, and without any shadows, the earth being enlivened and lit up rather by the spirit of an invisible sun than by its bodily presence. The local hunt had met for the day's sport on the open space of ground immediately in front of the steward's residence called in the list of appointments, Old House, Knapwater the meat being here once every season, for the pleasure of Miss Aldclyffe and her friends. Leaning out from one of the first floor windows, and surveying with the keenest interest the lively picture of pink and black coats, rich colored horses, and sparkling bits and spurs, was the returned and long lost woman, Mrs. Manston. The eyes of those forming the brilliant group were occasionally turned towards her, showing plainly that her adventures were the subject of conversation equally with or more than the chances of the coming day. She did not flush beneath their scrutiny, on the contrary, she seemed rather to enjoy it, her eyes being kindled with a light of contented exultation, subdued to square with the circumstances of her matronly position. She was, at the distance from which they surveyed her, an attractive woman comely as the tents of Keter. But to a close observer it was palpable enough that God did not do all the picture. Appearing at least seven years older than Cytherea, she was probably her senior by double the number, the artificial means employed to heighten the natural good appearance of her face being very cleverly applied. Her form was full and round, its voluptuous maturity standing out in strong contrast to the memory of Cytherea's lissom girlishness. It seems to be an almost universal rule that a woman who once has courted, or who eventually will court, the society of men on terms dangerous to her honor cannot refrain from flinging the meaning glance whenever the moment arrives in which the glance is strongly asked for, even if her life and whole future depended upon that moment's abstinence. Had a cautious, uxorious husband seen in his wife's countenance what might now have been seen in this dark-eyed woman's as she caught a stray glance of flirtation from one or other of the red-coated gallants outside, he would have passed many days in an agony of restless jealousy and doubt. But Manston was not such a husband, and he was, moreover, calmly attending to his business at the other end of the manor. The steward had fetched home his wife in the most matter-of-fact way a few days earlier, walking round the village with her the very next morning at once putting an end, by this simple solution, to all the riddling inquiries and surmises that were rank in the village and its neighborhood. Some men said that this woman was as far inferior to Cytherea as earth to heaven, others, older and sager, thought Manston better off with such a wife than he would have been with one of Cytherea's youthful impulses, and inexperience in household management. All felt their curiosity dying out of them. It was the same in Carryford as in other parts of the world immediately circumstantial evidence became exchanged for direct, the loungers in court yawned, gave a final survey, and turned away to a subject which would afford more scope for speculation. 15 The Events of Three Weeks From the 12th of February to the 2nd of March Owen Gray's recovery from the illness that had incapacitated him for so long a time was, professionally, the dawn of a brighter prospect for him in every direction, though the change was at first very gradual, and his movements and efforts were little more than mechanical. With the lengthening of the days, and the revival of building operations for the forthcoming season, he saw himself, for the first time, on a road which, pursued with care, would probably lead to a comfortable income at some future day. But he was still very low down the hill as yet. The first undertaking entrusted to him in the new year began about a month after his return from Southampton. Mr. Gradfield had come back to him in the wake of his restored health, and offered him the superintendence, as clerk of works, of a church which was to be nearly rebuilt at the village of Tollchurch, fifteen or sixteen miles from Budmouth, and about half that distance from Carry Ford. I am now being paid at the rate of a hundred and fifty pounds a year, he said to his sister in a burst of thankfulness and you shall never, Cytherea, be at any tyrannous lady's beck and call again as long as I live. Never pine or think about what has happened, dear, it's no disgrace to you. Cheer up, you'll be somebody's happy wife yet. 
he did not say Edward Springroves, for, greatly to his disappointment, a report had reached his ears that the friend to whom Cytheria owed so much had been about to pack up his things and sail for Australia. However, this was before the uncertainty concerning Mrs. Manston's existence had been dispersed by her return, a phenomenon that altered the cloudy relationship in which Cytheria had lately been standing towards her old lover, to one of distinctness, which result would have been delightful but for circumstances about to be mentioned. Cytheria was still pale from her recent illness, and still greatly dejected. Until the news of Mrs. Manston's return had reached them, she had kept herself closely shut up during the daytime, never venturing forth except at night. Sleeping and waking she had been in perpetual dread lest she should still be claimed by a man whom, only a few weeks earlier, she had regarded in the light of a future husband with quiet assent, not unmixed with cheerfulness. But the removal of the uneasiness in this direction by Mrs. Manston's arrival, and her own consequent freedom had been the imposition of pain in another. Utterly fictitious details of the finding of Cytheria and Manston had been invented and circulated, unavoidably reaching her ears in the course of time. Thus the freedom brought no happiness, and it seemed well nigh impossible that she could ever again show herself the sparkling creature she once had been. Apt to entice a deity. On this account, and for the first time in his life, Owen made a point of concealing from her the real state of his feelings with regard to the unhappy transaction. He writhed in secret under the humiliation to which they had been subjected, till the resentment it gave rise to, and for which there was no vent, was sometimes beyond endurance, it induced a mood that did serious damage to the material and plodding perseverance necessary if he would secure permanently the comforts of a home for them. They gave up their lodgings at Budmouth and went to Toll Church as soon as the work commenced. Here they were domiciled in one half of an old farmhouse, standing not far from the ivy-covered church tower which was all that was to remain of the original structure. The long steep roof of this picturesque dwelling sloped nearly down to the ground, the old tiles that covered it being overgrown with rich olive-hued moss. New red tiles in twos and threes had been used for patching the holes wrought by decay lighting up the whole harmonious surface with dots of brilliant scarlet. The chief internal features of this snug abode were a wide fireplace, enormous cupboards, a brown settle, and several sketches on the wood mantel, done in outline with the point of a hot poker the subjects mainly consisting of old men walking painfully erect, with a curly-tailed dog behind. After a week or two of residence in Tollchurch, and rambles amid the quaint scenery circumscribing it, a tranquillity began to spread itself through the mind of the maiden, which Grey hoped would be a preface to her complete restoration. She felt ready and willing to live the whole remainder of her days in the retirement of their present quarters, she began to sing about the house in low tremulous snatches. I said, if there's peace to be found in the world. A heart that is humble may hope for it here. The 3rd of March Her convalescence had arrived at this point on a certain evening towards the end of the winter, when Owen had come in from the building hard by, and was changing his muddy boots for slippers, previously to sitting down to toast and tea. A prolonged though quiet knocking came to the door. The only person who ever knocked at their door in that way was the new vicar, the prime mover in the church building. But he was that evening dining with the squire. Cytheria was uneasy at the sound she did not know why, unless it was because her nerves were weakened by the sickness she had undergone. Instead of opening the door she ran out of the room, and upstairs. What nonsense, Cytheria said her brother, going to the door. Edward Springrove stood in the grey light outside. Capital not gone to Australia, and not going, of course cried Owen. What's the use of going to such a place as that, I never believed that you would. I am going back to London again tomorrow, said Springrove, and I called to say a word before going. Where is? She has just run upstairs. Come in never mind scraping your shoes we are regular cottagers now, stone floor, yawning chimney corner, and all, you see. M.R.S. Manston came, said Edward awkwardly, when he had sat down in the chimney corner by preference. Yes. At mention of one of his skeletons Owen lost his blitheness at once, and fell into a reverie. The history of her escape is very simple. Very. You know I always had wondered, 
when my father was telling any of the circumstances of the fire to me, how it could be that a woman could sleep so soundly as to be unaware of her horrid position till it was too late even to give shout or sound of any kind. Well, I think that would have been possible, considering her long wearisome journey. People have often been suffocated in their beds before they awoke. But it was hardly likely a body would be completely burnt to ashes as this was assumed to be, though nobody seemed to see it at the time. And how positive the surgeon was too, about those bits of bone why he should have been so, nobody can tell. I cannot help saying that if it has ever been possible to find pure stupidity incarnate, it was in that jury of Carrie Ford. There existed in the mass the stupidity of twelve and not the penetration of one. Is she quite well? said Springrove. Who, oh, my sister, Cytheria. Thank you, nearly well, now. I'll call her. Wait one minute. I have a word to say to you. Owen sat down again. You know, without my saying it, that I love Cytheria as dearly as ever. I think she loves me too does she really? There was in Owen enough of that worldly policy on the subject of matchmaking which naturally resides in the breasts of parents and guardians, to give him a certain caution in replying, and, younger as he was by five years than Edward, it had an odd effect. Well, she may possibly love you still, he said, as if rather in doubt as to the truth of his words. Springgrove's countenance instantly saddened, he had expected a simple yes, at the very least. He continued in a tone of greater depression. Supposing she does love me, would it be fair to you and to her if I made her an offer of marriage, with these dreary conditions attached that we lived for a few years on the narrowest system, till a great debt, which all honor and duty require me to pay off, shall be paid? My father, by reason of the misfortune that befell him, is under a great obligation to Miss Aldclyffe. He is getting old, and losing his energies. I am attempting to work free of the burden. This makes my prospects gloomy enough at present. But consider again, he went on. Cytheria has been left in a nameless and unsatisfactory, though innocent state, by this unfortunate, and now void, marriage with Manston. A marriage with me, though under the materially untoward conditions I have mentioned, would make us happy, it would give her a locus standi. If she wished to be out of the sound of her misfortunes we would go to another part of England emigrate do anything. I'll call Cytheria, said Owen. It is a matter which she alone can settle. He did not speak warmly. His pride could not endure the pity which Edward's visit and errand tacitly implied. Yet, in the other affair, his heart went with Edward, he was on the same beat for paying off old debts himself. Scythe, Mr. Springgrove is here he said, at the foot of the staircase. His sister descended the creaking old steps with a faltering tread, and stood in the firelight from the hearth. She extended her hand to Springgrove, welcoming him by a mere motion of the lip, her eyes averted a habit which had engendered itself in her since the beginning of her illness and defamation. Owen opened the door and went out leaving the lovers alone. It was the first time they had met since the memorable night at Southampton. I will get a light she said, with a little embarrassment. No don't, please, Cytheria, said Edward softly, come and sit down with me. Oh yes. I ought to have asked you to, she returned timidly. Everybody sits in the chimney corner in this parish. You sit on that side. I'll sit here. Two recesses one on the right, one on the left hand were cut in the inside of the fireplace, and here they sat down facing each other on benches fitted to the recesses, the fire glowing on the hearth between their feet. Its ruddy light shone on the underslopes of their faces, and spread out over the floor of the room with the low horizontally of the setting sun, giving to every grain of sand and two more in the paving a long shadow towards the door. Edward looked at his pale love through the thin azure twines of smoke that went up like ringlets between them, and invested her, as seen through its medium, with the shadowy appearance of a phantom. Nothing is so potent for coaxing back the lost eyes of a woman as a discreet silence in the man who has so lost them and thus the patient Edward coaxed hers. After lingering on the hearth for half a minute, waiting in vain for another word from him, they were lifted into his face. He was ready primed to receive them. 
Cytheria, will you marry me? he said. He could not wait in his original position till the answer came. Stepping across the front of the fire to her own side of the chimney corner, he reclined at her feet, and searched for her hand. She continued in silence a while. Edward, I can never be anybody's wife, she then said sadly, and with firmness. Think of it in every light, he pleaded, the light of love, first. Then, when you have done that, see how wise a step it would be. I can only offer you poverty as yet, but I want I do so long to secure you from the intrusion of that unpleasant past, which will often and always be thrust before you as long as you live the shrinking solitary life you do now a life which purity chooses, it may be, but to the outside world it appears like the enforced loneliness of neglect and scorn and tongues are busy inventing a reason for it which does not exist. I know all about it, she said hastily, and those are the grounds of my refusal. You and Owen know the whole truth the two I love best on earth and I am content. But the scandal will be continually repeated, and I can never give anyone the opportunity of saying to you that your wife. She utterly broke down and wept. Don't, my own darling he entreated. Don't, Cytheria. Please to leave me we will be friends, Edward but don't press me my mind is made up I cannot I will not marry you or any man under the present ambiguous circumstances never will I I have said it, never. They were both silent. He listlessly regarded the illuminated blackness overhead, where long flakes of soot floated from the sides and bars of the chimney throat like tattered banners in ancient aisles, whilst through the square opening in the midst one or two bright stars looked down upon them from the grey March sky. The sight seemed to cheer him. At any rate you will love me, he murmured to her. Yes always forever and forever. He kissed her once, twice, three times, and arose to his feet, slowly withdrawing himself from her side towards the door. Cytheria remained with her gaze fixed on the fire. Edward went out grieving, but hope was not extinguished even now. He smelt the fragrance of a cigar and immediately afterwards saw a small red star of fire against the darkness of the hedge. Gray was pacing up and down the lane, smoking as he walked. Spring Grove told him the result of the interview. You are a good fellow, Edward, he said, but I think my sister is right. I wish you would believe Manston a villain, as I do, said Spring Grove. It would be absurd of me to say that I like him now family feeling prevents it but I cannot in honesty say deliberately that he is a bad man. Edward could keep the secret of Manston's coercion of Miss Aldclyffe in the matter of the houses a secret no longer. He told Owen the whole story. That's one thing, he continued, but not all. What do you think of this I have discovered that he went to Budmouth Post Office for a letter the day before the first advertisement for his wife appeared in the papers. One was there for him, and it was directed in his wife's handwriting as I can prove. This was not till after the marriage with Cytheria, it is true, but if as it seems to show the advertising was a farce, there is a strong presumption that the rest of the piece was. Owen was too astounded to speak. He dropped his cigar, and fixed his eyes upon his companion. Collusion. Yes. With his first wife. Yes with his wife. I am firmly persuaded of it. What did you discover? that he fetched from the post office at Budmouth a letter from her the day before the first advertisement appeared. Gray was lost in a long consideration. Ah, he said, it would be difficult to prove anything of that sort now. The writing could not be sworn to, and if he is guilty the letter is destroyed. I have other suspicions. Yes as you said interrupted Owen, who had not till now been able to form the complicated set of ideas necessary for picturing the position. Yes, there is this to be remembered Cytheria had been taken from him before that letter came and his knowledge of his wife's existence could not have originated till after the wedding. I could have sworn he believed her dead then. His manner was unmistakable. Well, I have other suspicions, repeated Edward, and if I only had the right if I were her husband or brother, he should be convicted of bigamy yet. The reproof was not needed, said Owen, with a little bitterness. What can I do a man with neither money nor friends whilst Manston has Miss Aldclyffe and all her fortune to back him up? God only knows what lies between the mistress and her steward, 
but since this has transpired if it is true I can believe the connection to be even an unworthy one a thing I certainly never so much as owned to myself before. The 5th of March Edward's disclosure had the effect of directing Owen Gray's thoughts into an entirely new and uncommon channel. On the Monday after Springgrove's visit, Owen had walked to the top of a hill in the neighborhood of Tolchurch a wild hill that had no name, beside a barren down where it never looked like summer. In the intensity of his meditations on the ever-present subject, he sat down on a weather-beaten boundary stone gazing towards the distant valley seeing only Manston's imagined form. Had his defenseless sister been trifled with? That was the question which affected him. Her refusal of Edward as a husband was, he knew, dictated solely by a humiliated sense of inadequacy to him in repute, and had not been formed till since the slanderous tale accounting for her seclusion had been circulated. Was it not true, as Edward had hinted, that he, her brother, was neglecting his duty towards her in allowing Manston to thrive unquestioned? whilst she was hiding her head for no fault at all. Was it possible that Manston was sensuous villain enough to have contemplated, at any moment before the marriage with Cytherea, the return of his first wife, when he should have grown weary of his new toy? Had he believed that, by a skillful manipulation of such circumstances as chance would throw in his way, he could escape all suspicion of having known that she lived? Only one fact within his own direct knowledge afforded the least ground for such a supposition. It was that, possessed by a woman only in the humble and unprotected station of a lady's hired companion, his sister's beauty might scarcely have been sufficient to induce a selfish man like Manston to make her his wife, unless he had foreseen the possibility of getting rid of her again. But for that stratagem of Manston's in relation to the Springgroves, Owen thought, Scythe might now have been the happy wife of Edward. True, that he influenced Miss Aldclyffe only rests on Edward's suspicions, but the grounds are good the probability is strong. He went indoors and questioned Cytherea. On the night of the fire, who first said that Mrs. Manston was burnt, he asked. I don't know who started the report. Was it Manston? It was certainly not he. All doubt on the subject was removed before he came to the spot that I am certain of. Everybody knew that she did not escape after the house was on fire, and thus all overlooked the fact that she might have left before of course that would have seemed such an improbable thing for anybody to do. Yes, until the porter's story of her irritation and doubt as to her course made it natural. What settled the matter at the inquest, said Cytherea, was Mr. Manston's evidence that the watch was his wife's. He was sure of that, wasn't he? I believe he said he was certain of it. It might have been hers left behind in her perturbation, as they say it was impossible as that seems at first sight. Yes on the whole, he might have believed in her death. I know by several proofs that then, and at least for some time after, he had no other thought than that she was dead. I now think that before the porter's confession he knew something about her though not that she lived. Why do you? From what he said to me on the evening of the wedding day, when I had fastened myself in the room at the hotel, after Edward's visit. He must have suspected that I knew something, for he was irritated, and in a passion of uneasy doubt. He said, You don't suppose my first wife is come to light again, madam, surely. Directly he had let the remark slip out, he seemed anxious to withdraw it. That's odd, said Owen. I thought it very odd. Still we must remember he might only have hit upon the thought by accident, in doubt as to your motive. Yes, the great point to discover remains the same as ever did he doubt his first impression of her death before he married you. I can't help thinking he did, although he was so astounded at our news that night. Edward swears he did. It was perhaps only a short time before, said Cytherea, when he could hardly recede from having me. Seasoning justice with mercy as usual, Cytherea. Tis unfair to yourself to talk like that. If I could only bring him to ruin as a bigamist supposing him to be one I should die happy. That's what we must find out by fair means or foul was he a willful bigamist. It is no use trying, Owen. You would have to employ a solicitor, and how can you do that? I can't at all I know that very well but neither do I altogether wish to at present a lawyer must have a case facts to go upon, that means. 
Now they are scarce at present as scarce as money is with us, until we have found more money there is no hurry for a lawyer. Perhaps by the time we have the facts we shall have the money. The only thing we lose in working alone in this way, is time not the issue, for the fruit that one mind matures in a twelve month forms a more perfectly organized whole than that of twelve minds in one month, especially if the interests of the single one are vitally concerned, and those of the twelve are only hired. But there is not only my mind available you are a shrewd woman, Scythe, and Edward is an earnest ally. Then, if we really get a sure footing for a criminal prosecution, the Crown will take up the case. I don't much care to press on in the matter, she murmured. What good can it do us, Owen, after all? Selfishly speaking, it will do this good that all the facts of your journey to Southampton will become known, and the scandal will die. Besides, Manston will have to suffer it's an act of justice to you and to other women, and to Edward Springrove. He now thought it necessary to tell her of the real nature of the Springrove's obligation to Miss Aldclyffe and their nearly certain knowledge that Manston was the prime mover in effecting their embarrassment. Her face flushed as she listened. And now, he said, our first undertaking is to find out where Mrs. Manston lived during the separation, next, when the first communications passed between them after the fire. If we only had Miss Aldclyffe's countenance and assistance as I used to have them, Cytheria returned, how strong we should be oh, what power is it that he exercises over her, swaying her just as he wishes she loves me now. Mrs. Morris in her letter said that Miss Aldclyffe prayed for me yes, she heard her praying for me, and crying. Miss Aldclyffe did not mind an old friend like Mrs. Morris knowing it, either. Yet in opposition to this, notice her dead silence and inaction throughout this proceeding. It is a mystery but never mind that now, said Owen impressively. About where Mrs. Manston has been living. We must get this part of it first learn the place of her stay in the early stage of their separation, during the period of Manston's arrival here, and so on, for that was where she was first communicated with on the subject of coming to nap water, before the fire, and that address, too, was her point of departure when she came to her husband by stealth in the night you know the time I visited you in the evening and went home early in the morning, and it was found that he had been visited too. Ah couldn't we inquire of Mrs. Leet, who keeps the post office at Carry Ford, if she remembers where the letters to Mrs. Manston were directed. He never posted his letters to her in the parish it was remarked at the time. I was thinking if something relating to her address might not be found in the report of the inquest in the Casterbridge Chronicle of the date. Some facts about the inquest were given in the papers to a certainty. Her brother caught eagerly at the suggestion. Who has a file of the Chronicles, he said. M. R. Ronham used to file them, said Cytheria. He was rather friendly disposed towards me, too. Owen could not, on any consideration, escape from his attendance at the church building till Saturday evening, and thus it became necessary, unless they actually wasted time, that Cytheria herself should assist. I act under your orders, Owen, she said. 16 The events of one week. March the 6th. The next morning the opening move of the game was made. Cytheria, under cover of a thick veil, hired a conveyance and drove to within a mile or so of Carry Ford. It was with a renewed sense of depression that she saw again the objects which had become familiar to her eye during her sojourn under Miss Aldclyffe's roof the outline of the hills, the meadow streams, the old park trees. She hastened by a lonely path to the rectory house, and asked if Mr. Ronham was at home. Now the rector, though a solitary bachelor, was as gallant and courteous to womankind as an ancient Iberian, and, moreover, he was Cytheria's friend in particular to an extent far greater than she had ever surmised. Rarely visiting his relative, Miss Aldclyffe, except on parish matters, more rarely still being called upon by Miss Aldclyffe, Cytheria had learnt very little of him whilst she lived at Knapwater. The relationship was on the impecunious paternal side, and for this branch of her family the lady of the estate had never evinced much sympathy. In looking back upon our line of descent it is an instinct with us to feel that all our vitality was drawn from the richer party to any unequal marriage in the chain. Since the death of the old captain, 
the rector's bearing in Knapp Waterhouse had been almost that of a stranger, a circumstance which he himself was the last man in the world to regret. This polite indifference was so frigid on both sides that the rector did not concern himself to preach at her, which was a great deal in a rector, and she did not take the trouble to think his sermons poor stuff, which in a cynical woman was a great deal more. Though barely fifty years of age, his hair was as white as snow, contrasting strangely with the redness of his skin, which was as fresh and healthy as a lad's. Cytheria's bright eyes, mutely and demurely glancing up at him Sunday after Sunday, had been the means of driving away many of the Saturnine humours that creep into an empty heart during the hours of a solitary life, in this case, however, to supplant them, when she left his parish, by those others of a more aching nature which accompany an overfull one. In short, he had been on the verge of feeling towards her that passion to which his dignified self-respect would not give its true name, even in the privacy of his own thought. He received her kindly, but she was not disposed to be frank with him. He saw her wish to be reserved, and with genuine good taste and good nature made no comment whatever upon her request to be allowed to see the chronicle for the year before the last. He placed the papers before her on his study table, with a timidity as great as her own, and then left her entirely to herself. She turned them over till she came to the first heading connected with the subject of her search disastrous fire and loss of life at Carry Ford. The sight, and its calamitous bearing upon her own life, made her so dizzy that she could, for a while, hardly decipher the letters. Stifling recollection by an effort she nerved herself to her work, and carefully read the column. The account reminded her of no other fact than was remembered already. She turned on to the following week's report of the inquest. After a miserable perusal she could find no more pertaining to Mrs. Manston's address than this. Abraham Brown, of Hoxton, London, at whose house the deceased woman had been living, deposed, etc. Nobody else from London had attended the inquest. She arose to depart, first sending a message of thanks to Mr. Ronham, who was out of doors gardening. He stuck his spade into the ground, and accompanied her to the gate. Can I help you in anything, Cytheria, he said, using her Christian name by an intuition that unpleasant memories might be revived if he called her Miss Gray after wishing her goodbye as Mrs. Manston at the wedding. Cytheria saw the motive and appreciated it, nevertheless replying evasively. I only guess and fear. He earnestly looked at her again. Promise me that if you want assistance, and you think I can give it, you will come to me. I will, she said. The gate closed between them. You don't want me to help you in anything now, Cytheria, he repeated. If he had spoken what he felt, I want very much to help you, Cytheria, and have been watching Manston on your account, she would gladly have accepted his offer. As it was, she was perplexed, and raised her eyes to his not so fearlessly as before her trouble, but as modestly, and with still enough brightness in them to do fearful execution as she said over the gate. No, thank you. She returned to Toll Church weary with her day's work. Owen's greeting was anxious. Well, Cytheria. She gave him the words from the report of the inquest, penciled on a slip of paper. Now to find out the name of the street and number, Owen remarked. Owen she said, will you forgive me for what I am going to say? I don't think I can indeed I don't think I can take any further steps towards disentangling the mystery. I still think it a useless task, and it does not seem any duty of mine to be revenged upon Mr. Manston in any way. She added more gravely, it is beneath my dignity as a woman to labor for this, I have felt it so all day. Very well, he said, somewhat shortly, I shall work without you then. There's dignity in justice. He caught sight of her pale tired face, and the dilated eye which always appeared in her with weariness. Darling, he continued warmly, and kissing her, you shall not work so hard again you are worn out quite. But you must let me do as I like. March the 10th. On Saturday evening Gray hurried off to Casterbridge, and called at the house of the reporter to the Chronicle. The reporter was at home and came out to Gray in the passage. Owen explained who and what he was, 
and asked the man if he would oblige him by turning to his notes of the inquest at Carry Ford in the December of the year preceding the last just adding that a family entanglement, of which the reporter probably knew something, made him anxious to ascertain some additional details of the event, if any existed. Certainly, said the other, without hesitation, though I am afraid I haven't much beyond what we printed at the time. Let me see my old notebooks are in my drawer at the office of the paper, if you will come with me I can refer to them there. His wife and family were at tea inside the room, and with the dimity of decent poverty everywhere he seemed glad to get a stranger out of his domestic groove. They crossed the street, entered the office, and went thence to an inner room. Here, after a short search, was found the book required. The precise address, not given in the condensed report that was printed, but written down by the reporter, was as follows. Abraham Brown Lodging House Keeper Charles Square Hoxton Owen copied it, and gave the reporter a small fee. I want to keep this inquiry private for the present, he said hesitatingly. You will perhaps understand why, and oblige me. The reporter promised. News is shop with me, he said, and to escape from handling it is my greatest social enjoyment. It was evening, and the outer room of the publishing office was lighted up with flaring jets of gas. After making the above remark, the reporter came out from the inner apartment in Gray's company, answering an expression of obligation from Owen with the words that it was no trouble. At the moment of his speech, he closed behind him the door between the two rooms, still holding his notebook in his hand. Before the counter of the front room stood a tall man, who was also speaking, when they emerged. He said to the youth in attendance, I will take my paper for this week now I am here, so that you needn't post it to me. The stranger then slightly turned his head, saw Owen, and recognized him. Owen passed out without recognizing the other as Manston. Manston then looked at the reporter, who, after walking to the door with Owen, had come back again to lock up his books. Manston did not need to be told that the shabby marble-covered book which he held in his hand, opening endways and interleaved with blotting paper, was an old reporting book. He raised his eyes to the reporter's face, whose experience had not so schooled his features but that they betrayed a consciousness, to one half initiated as the other was, that his late proceeding had been connected with events in the life of the steward. Manston said no more, but, taking his newspaper, followed Owen from the office, and disappeared in the gloom of the street. Edward Springrove was now in London again, and on this same evening, before leaving Casterbridge, Owen wrote a careful letter to him, stating therein all the facts that had come to his knowledge, and begging him, as he valued Cytherea, to make cautious inquiries. A tall man was standing under the lamp post, about half a dozen yards above the post office, when he dropped the letter into the box. That same night, too, for a reason connected with the Renko Hunter with Owen Gray, the steward entertained the idea of rushing off suddenly to London by the mail train, which left Casterbridge at ten o'clock. But remembering that letters posted after the hour at which Owen had obtained his information whatever that was could not be delivered in London till Monday morning, he changed his mind and went home to nap water. Making a confidential explanation to his wife, arrangements were set on foot for his departure by the mail on Sunday night. March the 11th Starting for church the next morning several minutes earlier than was usual with him, the steward intentionally loitered along the road from the village till old Mr. Springrove overtook him. Manston spoke very civilly of the morning, and of the weather, asking how the farmer's barometer stood, and when it was probable that the wind might change. It was not in Mr. Springrove's nature going to church as he was, to to return anything but a civil answer to such civil questions, however his feelings might have been biased by late events. The conversation was continued on terms of greater friendliness. You must be feeling settled again by this time, Mr. Springrove, after the rough turnout you had on that terrible night in November. I, but I don't know about feeling settled, either, Mr. Manston. The old window in the chimney corner of the old house I shall never forget. No window in the chimney corner where I am now, and I had been used to it for more than fifty years. Ted says tis a great loss to me, 
and he knows exactly what I feel. Your son is again in a good situation, I believe, said Manston, imitating that inquisitiveness into the private affairs of the natives which passes for high breeding in country villages. Yes, sir. I hope he'll keep it, or do something else and stick to it. Tis to be hoped he'll be steady now. He's always been that, I assure ee, said the old man tartly. Yes yes I mean intellectually steady. Intellectual wild oats will thrive in a soil of the strictest morality. Intellectual gingerbread Ted's steady enough that's all I know about it. Of course of course. Has he respectable lodgings? My own experience has shown me that that's a great thing to a young man living alone in London. Warwick Street, Charing Cross that's where he is. Well, to be sure strange a very dear friend of mine used to live at number 52 in that very same street. Edward lives at number 49 how very near being the same house said the old farmer, pleased in spite of himself. Very, said Manston. Well, I suppose we had better step along a little quicker, Mr. Springrove, the parson's bell has just begun. Number 49, he murmured. March the 12th. Edward received Owen's letter in due time but on account of his daily engagements he could not attend to any request till the clock had struck five in the afternoon. Rushing then from his office in Westminster, he called a hansom and proceeded to Hoxton. A few minutes later he knocked at the door of number 41, Charles Square, the old lodging of Mrs. Manston. A tall man who would have looked extremely handsome had he not been clumsily and closely wrapped up in garments that were much too elderly in style for his years stood at the corner of the quiet square at the same instant, having, too, alighted from a cab, that had been driven along Old Street in Edward's rear. He smiled confidently when Springgrove knocked. Nobody came to the door. Springgrove knocked again. This brought out two people one at the door he had been knocking upon, the other from the next on the right. Is Mr. Brown at home? said Springgrove. No, sir. When will he be in? Quite uncertain. Can you tell me where I may find him? No, oh, here he is coming, sir. That's Mr. Brown. Edward looked down the pavement in the direction pointed out by the woman, and saw a man approaching. He proceeded a few steps to meet him. Edward was impatient, and to a certain extent still a countryman, who had not, after the manner of city men, subdued the natural impulse to speak out the ruling thought without preface. He said in a quiet tone to the stranger, One word with you do you remember a lady lodger of yours of the name of Mrs. Manston? Mr. Brown half closed his eyes at Springgrove, somewhat as if he were looking into a telescope at the wrong end. I have never let lodgings in my life, he said, after his survey. Didn't you attend an inquest a year and a half ago, at Carry Ford? Never knew there was such a place in the world, sir, and as to lodgings, I have taken acres first and last during the last thirty years, but I have never let an inch. I suppose there is some mistake, Edward murmured, and turned away. He and Mr. Brown were now opposite the door next to the one he had knocked at. The woman who was still standing there had heard the inquiry and the result of it. I expect it is the other Mr. Brown, who used to live there, that you want, sir she said. The Mr. Brown that was inquired for the other day. Very likely that is the man, said Edward, his interest reawakening. He couldn't make a do of lodging letting here, and at last he went to Cornwall, where he came from, and where his brother still lived, who had often asked him to come home again. But there was little luck in the change, for after London they say he couldn't stand the rainy west winds they get there, and he died in the December following. Will you step into the passage? That's unfortunate, said Edward, going in. But perhaps you remember a Mrs. Manston living next door to you. Oh yes, said the landlady, closing the door. The lady who was supposed to have met with such a horrible fate, and was alive all the time. I saw her the other day. Since the fire at Carry Ford. Yes. Her husband came to ask if Mr. Brown was still living here just as you might. He seemed anxious about it, and then one evening, a week or fortnight afterwards, when he came again to make further inquiries, 
she was with him. But I did not speak to her she stood back, as if she were shy. I was interested, however, for old Mr. Brown had told me all about her when he came back from the inquest. Did you know Mrs. Manston before she called the other day? No. You see she was only Mr. Brown's lodger for two or three weeks, and I didn't know she was living there till she was near upon leaving again we don't notice next door people much here in London. I much regretted I had not known her when I heard what had happened. It led me and Mr. Brown to talk about her a great deal afterwards. I little thought I should see her alive after all. And when do you say they came here together? I don't exactly remember the day though I remember a very beautiful dream I had that same night ah, uh, I shall never forget it shoals of lodgers coming along the square with angels' wings and bright golden sovereigns in their hands wanting apartments at West End prices. They would not give any less, no, not if you. Yes. Did Mrs. Manston leave anything, such as papers, when she left these lodgings originally, said Edward, though his heart sank as he asked. He felt that he was outwitted. Manston and his wife had been there before him, clearing the ground of all traces. I have always said no hitherto, replied the woman, considering I could say no more if put upon my oath, as I expected to be. But speaking in a common everyday way now the occurrence is past. I believe a few things of some kind though I doubt if they were papers were left in a workbox she had, because she talked about it to Mr. Brown, and was rather angry at what occurred you see, she had a temper by all account, and so I didn't like to remind the lady of this workbox when she came the other day with her husband. And about the workbox? Well, from what was casually dropped, I think Mrs. Manston had a few articles of furniture she didn't want and when she was leaving they were put in a sale just by. Amongst her things were two work boxes very much alike. One of these she intended to sell, the other she didn't, and Mr. Brown, who collected the things together, took the wrong one to the sale. What was in it? Oh, nothing in particular, or of any value some accounts, and her usual sewing materials I think nothing more. She didn't take much trouble to get it back she said the bills were worth nothing to her or anybody else, but that she should have liked to keep the box because her husband gave it her when they were first married, and if he found she had parted with it, he would be vexed. Did Mrs. Manston, when she called recently with her husband, allude to this, or inquire for it, or did Mr. Manston? No and I rather wondered at it. But she seemed to have forgotten it indeed. She didn't make any inquiry at all, only standing behind him, listening to his, and he probably had never been told anything about it. Whose sale were these articles of hers taken to? Who was the auctioneer? Mr. Halway. His place is the third turning from the end of that street you see there. Anybody will tell you the shop his name is written up. Edward went off to follow up his clue with a promptness which was dictated more by a dogged will to do his utmost than by a hope of doing much. When he was out of sight, the tall and cloaked man, who had watched him, came up to the woman's door, with an appearance of being in breathless haste. Has a gentleman been here inquiring about Mrs. Manston? Yes, he's just gone. Dear me I want him. He's gone to Mr. Halway's. I think I can give him some information upon the subject. Does he pay pretty liberally? He gave me half a crown. That scale will do. I'm a poor man, and will see what my little contribution to his knowledge will fetch. But, by the way, perhaps you told him all I know where she lived before coming to live here. I didn't know where she lived before coming here. Oh no I only said what Mr. Brown had told me. He seemed a nice gentle young man, or I shouldn't have been so open as I was. I shall now about catch him at Mr. Halway's, said the man, and went away as hastily as he had come. Edward in the meantime had reached the auction room. He found some difficulty, on account of the inertness of those whose only inducement to an action is a mere wish from another, in getting the information he stood in need of, but it was at last accorded him. The auctioneer's book gave the name of Mrs. Higgins, Canley Passage, as the purchaser of the lot which had included Mrs. Manston's workbox. Thither Edward went, followed by the man. Four bell poles, one above the other like waistcoat buttons, 
appeared on the doorpost. Edward seized the first he came to. Who did you want, said a thin voice from somewhere. Edward looked above and around him, nobody was visible. Who did you want, said the thin voice again. He found now that the sound proceeded from below the grating covering the basement window. He dropped his glance through the bars, and saw a child's white face. Who did you want, said the voice the third time, with precisely the same languid inflection. M.R.S. Higgins, said Edward. Third bell up, said the face, and disappeared. He pulled the third bell from the bottom, and was admitted by another child, the daughter of the woman he was in search of. He gave the little thing sixpence, and asked for her mama. The child led him upstairs. Mrs. Higgins was the wife of a carpenter who from want of employment one winter had decided to marry. Afterwards they both took to drink, and sank into desperate circumstances. A few chairs and a table were the chief articles of furniture in the third floor back room which they occupied. A roll of baby linen lay on the floor, beside it a pap clogged spoon and an overturned tin pap cup. Against the wall a Dutch clock was fixed out of level, and ticked wildly in longs and shorts, its entrails hanging down beneath its white face and wiry hands, like the feces of a harpy photosim of ventris proluvis, unseek manus, et pallida semper ora. A baby was crying against every chair leg, the whole family of six or seven being small enough to be covered by a washing tub. Mrs. Higgins sat helpless, clothed in a dress which had hooks and eyes in plenty, but never one opposite the other thereby rendering the dress almost useless as a screen to the bosom. No work box was visible anywhere. It was a depressing picture of married life among the very poor of a city. Only for one short hour in the whole twenty-four did husband and wife taste genuine happiness. It was in the evening, when, after the sale of some necessary article of furniture, they were under the influence of a quartern of gin. Of all the ingenious and cruel satires that from the beginning till now have been stuck like knives into womankind, surely there is not one so lacerating to them, and to us who love them, as the trite old fact, that the most wretched of men can, in the twinkling of an eye, find a wife ready to be more wretched still for the sake of his company. Edward hastened to dispatch his errand. Mrs. Higgins had lately pawned the workbox with other useless articles of lumber, she said. Edward bought the duplicate of her, and went downstairs to the pawnbroker's. In the back division of a musty shop, amid the heterogeneous collection of articles and odors invariably crowding such places, he produced his ticket, and with a sense of satisfaction out of all proportion to the probable worth of his acquisition, took the box and carried it off under his arm. He attempted to lift the cover as he walked, but found it locked. It was dusk when Springgrove reached his lodging. Entering his small sitting room, the front apartment on the ground floor, he struck a light, and proceeded to learn if any scrap or mark within or upon his purchase rendered it of moment to the business in hand. Breaking open the cover with a small chisel, and lifting the tray, he glanced eagerly beneath, and found nothing. He next discovered that a pocket or portfolio was formed on the underside of the cover. This he unfastened, and slipping his hand within, found that it really contained some substance. First he pulled out about a dozen tangled silk and cotton threads. Under them were a short household account, a dry moss rosebud, and an old pair of carte de visite photographs. One of these was a likeness of Mrs. Manston Eunice being written under it in ink the other of Manston himself. He sat down dispirited. This was all the fruit of his task not a single letter, date, or address of any kind to help him and was it likely there would be. However, thinking he would send the fragments, such as they were, to Gray, in order to satisfy him that he had done his best so far, he scribbled a line, and put all except the silk and cotton into an envelope. Looking at his watch, he found it was then twenty minutes to seven, by affixing an extra stamp he would be enabled to dispatch them by that evening's post. He hastily directed the packet, and ran with it at once to the post office at Charing Cross. On his return he took up the workbox again to examine it more leisurely. He then found there was also a small cavity in the tray under the pincushion, which was movable by a bit of ribbon. Lifting this he uncovered a flattened sprig of myrtle, and a small scrap of crumpled paper. 
the paper contained a verse or two in a man's handwriting. He recognized it as Manston's, having seen notes and bills from him at his father's house. The stanza was of a complimentary character, descriptive of the lady who was now Manston's wife. Eunice. Whoso for hours or lengthy days. Shall catch her aspect's changeful rays. Then turn away, can none recall. Beyond a galaxy of all. In hazy portraiture. Lit by the light of azure eyes. Like summer days by summer skies. Her sweet transitions seem to be. A kind of pictured melody. And not a set contour. A. M. To shake, pull, and ransack the box till he had almost destroyed it was now his natural action. But it contained absolutely nothing more. Disappointed again, he said, flinging down the box, the bit of paper, and the withered twig that had lain with it. Yet valueless as the new acquisition was, on second thoughts he considered that it would be worthwhile to make good the statement in his late note to Gray that he had sent everything the box contained except the sewing thread. Thereupon he enclosed the verse and myrtle twig in another envelope, with the remark that he had overlooked them in his first search, and put it on the table for the next day's post. In his hurry and concentration upon the matter that occupied him, Springgrove, on entering his lodging and obtaining a light, had not waited to pull down the blind or close the shutters. Consequently all that he had done had been visible from the street. But as on an average not one person a minute passed along the quiet pavement at this time of the evening, the discovery of the omission did not much concern his mind. But the real state of the case was that a tall man had stood against the opposite wall and watched the whole of his proceeding. When Edward came out and went to the Charing Cross post office, the man followed him and saw him drop the letter into the box. The stranger did not further trouble himself to follow Springgrove back to his lodging again. Manston now knew that there had been photographs of some kind in his wife's workbox, and though he had not been near enough to see them, he guessed whose they were. The least reflection told him to whom they had been sent. He paused a minute under the portico of the post office, looking at the two or three omnibuses stopping and starting in front of him. Then he rushed along the Strand, through Holywell Street, and on to Old Boswell Court. Kicking aside the shoe blacks who began to importune him as he passed under the colonnade, he turned up the narrow passage to the publishing office of the post office directory. He begged to be allowed to see the directory of the southwest counties of England for a moment. The shopman immediately handed down the volume from a shelf, and Manston retired with it to the window bench. He turned to the county, and then to the parish of Tolchurch. At the end of the historical and topographical description of the village he read. Postmistress Mrs. Hurston. Letters received at. A.M. by foot post from Anglebury. Returning his thanks, he handed back the book and quitted the office, thence pursuing his way to an obscure coffee house by the Strand, where he now partook of a light dinner. But rest seemed impossible with him. Some absorbing intention kept his body continually on the move. He paid his bill, took his bag in his hand, and went out to idle about the streets and over the river till the time should have arrived at which the night mail left the Waterloo station, by which train he intended to return homeward. There exists, as it were, an outer chamber to the mind, in which, when a man is occupied centrally with the most momentous question of his life, casual and trifling thoughts are just allowed to wander softly for an interval, before being banished altogether. Thus, amid his concentration did Manston receive perceptions of the individuals about him in the lively thoroughfare of the Strand, tall men looking insignificant, little men looking great and profound, lost women of miserable repute looking as happy as the days are long, wives, happy by assumption, looking careworn and miserable. Each and all were alike in this one respect, that they followed a solitary trail like the inwoven threads which form a banner and all were equally unconscious of the significant whole they collectively showed forth. At ten o'clock he turned into Lancaster Place, crossed the river, and entered the railway station, where he took his seat in the down mail train, which bore him, and Edward Springrove's letter to Gray, far away from London. 17 The Events of One Day March the 13th 3 to 6 o'clock a.m. They entered Anglebury Station in the dead, 
still time of early morning, the clock over the booking office pointing to 25 minutes to 3. Manston lingered on the platform and saw the mail bags brought out, noticing, as a pertinent pastime, the many shabby blotches of wax from innumerable seals that had been set upon their mouths. The guard took them into a fly, and was driven down the road to the post office. It was a raw, damp, uncomfortable morning, though, as yet, little rain was falling. Manston drank a mouthful from his flask and walked at once away from the station, pursuing his way through the gloom till he stood on the side of the town adjoining, at a distance from the last house in the street of about two hundred yards. The station road was also the turnpike road into the country, the first part of its course being across a heath. Having surveyed the highway up and down to make sure of its bearing, Manston methodically set himself to walk backwards and forwards a stone's throw in each direction. Although the spring was temperate, the time of day, and the condition of suspense in which the steward found himself, caused a sensation of chilliness to pervade his frame in spite of the overcoat he wore. The drizzling rain increased, and drops from the trees at the wayside fell noisily upon the hard road beneath them which reflected from its glassy surface the faint halo of light hanging over the lamps of the adjacent town. Here he walked and lingered for two hours, without seeing or hearing a living soul. Then he heard the market house clock strike five, and soon afterwards, quick hard footsteps smote upon the pavement of the street leading towards him. They were those of the postman for the toll church beat. He reached the bottom of the street, gave his bags a final hitch up, stepped off the pavement, and struck out for the country with a brisk shuffle. Manston then turned his back upon the town, and walked slowly on. In two minutes a flickering light shone upon his form, and the postman overtook him. The newcomer was a short, stooping individual of above five and forty, laden on both sides with leather bags large and small, and carrying a little lantern strapped to his breast, which cast a tiny patch of light upon the road ahead. A try and mournin' for travellers the postman cried, in a cheerful voice, without turning his head or slackening his trot. It is, indeed, said Manston, stepping out abreast of him. You have a long walk every day. Yes a long walk for though the distance is only sixteen miles on the straight that is, eight to the furthest place and eight back, what with the ins and outs to the gentlemen's houses, it makes two and twenty for my legs. Two and twenty miles a day. How many a year? I used to reckon it, but I never do now. I don't care to think o' oh my wear and tear, now it do begin to tell upon me. Thus the conversation was begun, and the postman proceeded to narrate the different strange events that marked his experience. Manston grew very friendly. Postman, I don't know what your custom is, he said, after a while, but between you and me. I always carry a drop of something warm in my pocket when I am out on such a morning as this. Try it. He handed the bottle of brandy. If you'll excuse me, please. I haven't took no stimulants these five years. Tis never too late to mend. Against the regulations, I be afraid. Who'll know it? That's true nobody will know it. Still, honesty's the best policy. Ah it is certainly. But, thank God, I've been able to get on without it yet. You'll surely drink with me. Really, tis a most too early for that sort o' thing however, to oblige a friend, I don't object to the faintest shatter of a drop. The postman drank, and Manston did the same to a very slight degree. Five minutes later, when they came to a gate, the flask was pulled out again. Well done said the postman, beginning to feel its effect but guide my soul, I be afraid twill hardly do. Not unless tis well followed, like any other line you take up, said Manston. Besides, there's a way of liking a drop of liquor, and of being good even religious at the same time. I, for some thimble and button in and out fellers, but I could never get into the knack o' it, not I dot. Well, you needn't be troubled. It isn't necessary for the higher class of mind to be religious they have so much common sense that they can risk playing with fire. That hits me exactly. In fact, a man I know, who always had no other god but me, and devoutly loved his neighbor's wife, says now that believing is a mistake. Well, to be sure however, 
believing in God is a mistake made by very few people, after all. A true remark. Not one Christian in our parish would walk half a mile in a rain like this to know whether the scripture had concluded him under sin or grace. Nor in mine. Ah, you may depend upon it they'll do away wi God he mighty altogether afore long, although we've had him over us so many years. There's no knowing. And I suppose the queen ill be done away wi then. A pretty concern that'll be nobody's head to put on your letters, and then your honest man who do pay his penny will never be known from your scamp who don't. Oh, tis a nation. Warm the cockles of your heart, however. Here's the bottle waiting. I'll oblige you, my friend. The drinking was repeated. The postman grew livelier as he went on, and at length favored the steward with a song, Manston himself joining in the chorus. He flung his mallet against the wall. Said, The Lord make churches and chapels to fall. And there'll be work for tradesmen all. When Jones Ale was new. My boys. When Jones Ale was new. You understand, friend, the postman added, I was originally a mason by trade, no offense to you if you be a parson. None at all, said Manston. The rain now came down heavily, but they pursued their path with alacrity, the produce of the several fields between which the lane wound its way being indicated by the peculiar character of the sound emitted by the falling drops. Sometimes a soaking hiss proclaimed that they were passing by a pasture, then a patter would show that the rain fell upon some large leafed root crop, then a paddling plash announced the naked arable, the low sound of the wind in their ears rising and falling with each pace they took. Besides the small private bags of the county families, which were all locked, the postman bore the large general budget for the remaining inhabitants along his beat. At each village or hamlet they came to, the postman searched for the packet of letters destined for that place, and thrust it into an ordinary letter hole cut in the door of the receiver's cottage the village post offices being mostly kept by old women who had not yet risen, the lights moving in other cottage windows showed that such people as carters, woodmen, and stab lemon had long been stirring. The postman had by this time become markedly unsteady, but he still continued to be too conscious of his duties to suffer the steward to search the bag. Manston was perplexed, and at lonely points in the road cast his eyes keenly upon the short bowed figure of the man trotting through the mud by his side, as if he were half inclined to run a very great risk indeed. It frequently happened that the houses of farmers, clergymen, etc., lay a short distance up or down a lane or path branching from the direct track of the postman's journey. To save time and distance, at the point of junction of some of these paths with the main road, the gate post was hollowed out to form a letter box, in which the postman deposited his missives in the morning, looking in the box again in the evening to collect those placed there for the return post. Tollchurch Vicarage and Farmstead, lying back from the village street, were served on this principle. This fact the steward now learnt by conversing with the postman, and the discovery relieved Manston greatly, making his intentions much clearer to himself than they had been in the earlier stages of his journey. They had reached the outskirts of the village. Manston insisted upon the flask being emptied before they proceeded further. This was done, and they approached the church, the vicarage, and the farmhouse in which Owen and Cytheria were living. The postman paused, fumbled in his bag, took out by the light of his lantern some half-dozen letters, and tried to sort them. He could not perform the task. We be crippled disciples of believe, he said, with a sigh and a stagger. Not drunk, but market merry said Manston cheerfully. Well done if I bain't so weak that I can't see the clouds much less letters. Guide my soul, if so be anybody should tell the Queen's postmaster general of me the whole story will have to go through Parliament House, and I shall be high treasoned as safe as houses and be fined, and who'll pay for a poor Martello, tis a world. Trust in the Lord he'll pay. He pay a believe why should he when he didn't drink the drink. He pay a believe to ye think the man's a fool. Well, well, I had no intention of hurting your feelings but how was I to know you were so sensitive? True you were not to know I was so sensitive. Here's a cattle wi these letters guide my soul, what will Billy do? Manston offered his services. They are to be divided, the man said. How, 
said Manston. These, for the village, to be carried on into it, any for the vicarage or vicarage farm must be left in the box of the gate post just here. There's none for the vicarage house this morning, but I saw when I started there was one for the clerk o' works at the new church. This is it, isn't it? He held up a large envelope, directed in Edward Springrove's handwriting. M.R.O. Gray. Clerk of Works. Toll Church. Near Engleberry. The letter box was scooped in an oak gate post about a foot square. There was no slit for inserting the letters, by reason of the opportunity such a lonely spot would have afforded mischievous peasant boys of doing damage had such been the case but at the side was a small iron door, kept closed by an iron reversible strap locked across it. One side of this strap was painted black, the other white and white or black outwards implied respectively that there were letters inside, or none. The postman had taken the key from his pocket and was attempting to insert it in the keyhole of the box. He touched one side, the other, above, below, but never made a straight hit. Let me unlock it said Manston, taking the key from the postman. He opened the box and reached out with his other hand for Owen's letter. No, no. Oh no no, the postman said. As one of Majesty's servants care Majesty's male's duty put letters own hands. He slowly and solemnly placed the letter in the small cavity. Now lock it, he said, closing the door. The steward placed the bar across, with the black side outwards, signifying empty, and turned the key. You've put the wrong side outwards, said the postman. Tisn't he empty? And dropped the key in the mud, so that I can't alter it, said the steward, letting something fall. What an awkward thing! It is an awkward thing. They both went searching in the mud, which their own trampling had reduced to the consistency of pap, the postman unstrapping his little lantern from his breast, and thrusting it about close to the ground, the rain still drizzling down, and the dawn so tardy on account of the heavy clouds that daylight seemed delayed indefinitely. The rays of the lantern were rendered individually visible upon the thick mist, and seemed almost tangible as they passed off into it, after illuminating the faces and knees of the two stooping figures dripping with wet, the postman's cape and private bags, and the steward's valise, glistening as if they had been varnished. It fell on the grass, said the postman. No, it fell in the mud, said Manston. They searched again. I'm afraid we shan't find it by this light, said the steward at length, washing his muddy fingers in the wet grass of the bank. I'm afraid we shan't, said the other, standing up. I'll tell you what we had better do, said Manston. I shall be back this way in an hour or so, and since it was all my fault, I'll look again, and shall be sure to find it in the daylight and I'll hide the key here for you. He pointed to a spot behind the post. It will be too late to turn the index then, as the people will have been here, so that the box had better stay as it is. The letter will only be delayed a day, and that will not be noticed, if it is, you can say you placed the iron the wrong way without knowing it, and all will be well. This was agreed to by the postman as the best thing to be done under the circumstances, and the pair went on. They had passed the village and come to a crossroad, when the steward, telling his companion that their paths now diverged, turned off to the left towards Carry Ford. No sooner was the postman out of sight and hearing than Manston stalked back to the vicarage letter box by keeping inside a fence, and thus avoiding the village, arrived here, he took the key from his pocket, where it had been concealed all the time, and abstracted Owen's letter. This done, he turned towards home by the help of what he carried in his valise adjusting himself to his ordinary appearance as he neared the quarter in which he was known. An hour and a half's sharp walking brought him to his own door in Knapwater Park. 8 o'clock a.m. Seated in his private office he wetted the flap of the stolen letter, and waited patiently till the adhesive gum could be loosened. He took out Edward's note, the accounts, the rosebud, and the photographs, regarding them with the keenest interest and anxiety. The note, the accounts, the rosebud, and his own photograph, he restored to their places again. The other photograph he took between his finger and thumb, and held it towards the bars of the grate. There he held it for half a minute or more, meditating. 
It is a great risk to run, even for such an end, he muttered. Suddenly, impregnated with a bright idea, he jumped up and left the office for the front parlor. Taking up an album of portraits, which lay on the table, he searched for three or four likenesses of the lady who had so lately displaced Cytheria, which were interspersed among the rest of the collection, and carefully regarded them. They were taken in different attitudes and styles, and he compared each singly with that he held in his hand. One of them, the one most resembling that abstracted from the letter in general tone, size and attitude, he selected from the rest, and returned with it to his office. Pouring some water into a plate, he set the two portraits afloat upon it, and sitting down tried to read. At the end of a quarter of an hour, after several ineffectual attempts, he found that each photograph would peel from the card on which it was mounted. This done, he threw into the fire the original likeness and the recent card, stuck upon the original card the recent likeness from the album, dried it before the fire, and placed it in the envelope with the other scraps. The result he had obtained, then, was this, in the envelope were now two photographs, both having the same photographer's name on the back and consecutive numbers attached. At the bottom of the one which showed his own likeness, his own name was written down, on the other his wife's name was written, whilst the central feature, and whole matter to which this latter card and writing referred, the likeness of a lady mounted upon it, had been changed. Mrs. Manston entered the room, and begged him to come to breakfast. He followed her and they sat down. During the meal he told her what he had done, with scrupulous regard to every detail, and showed her the result. It is indeed a great risk to run, she said, sipping her tea. But it would be a greater not to do it. Yes. The envelope was again fastened up as before, and Manston put it in his pocket and went out. Shortly afterwards he was seen, on horseback, riding in a direction towards Tolchurch. Keeping to the fields, as well as he could, for the greater part of the way, he dropped into the road by the vicarage letter box, and looking carefully about, to ascertain that no person was near, he restored the letter to its nook, placed the key in its hiding place, as he had promised the postman, and again rode homewards by a roundabout way. Afternoon The letter was brought to Owen Gray, the same afternoon, by one of the vicar's servants who had been to the box with a duplicate key, as usual, to leave letters for the evening post. The man found that the index had told falsely that morning for the first time within his recollection, but no particular attention was paid to the mistake, as it was considered. The contents of the envelope were scrutinized by Owen and flung aside as useless. The next morning brought Springgrove's second letter, the existence of which was unknown to Manston. The sight of Edward's handwriting again raised the expectations of brother and sister, till Owen had opened the envelope and pulled out the twig and verse. Nothing that's of the slightest use, after all, he said to her, we are as far as ever from the merest shadow of legal proof that would convict him of what I am morally certain he did, marry you, suspecting, if not knowing, her to be alive all the time. What has Edward sent? said Cytheria. An old amatory verse in Manston's writing. Fancy, he said bitterly, this is the strain he addressed her in when they were courting as he did you, I suppose. He handed her the verse and she read. Eunice. Whoso for hours or lengthy days. Shall catch her aspect's changeful rays. Then turn away, can none recall. Beyond a galaxy of all. In hazy portraiture. Lit by the light of azure eyes. Like summer days by summer skies. Her sweet transitions seem to be. A kind of pictured melody. And not a set contour. A. M. A strange expression had overspread Cytheria's countenance. It rapidly increased to the most death-like anguish. She flung down the paper, seized Owen's hand tremblingly, and covered her face. Cytheria what is it, for heaven's sake? Owen suppose oh, you don't know what I think. What? The light of azure eyes, she repeated with ashy lips. Well, the light of azure eyes, he said, astounded at her manner. M.R.S. Morris said in her letter to me that her eyes are black. Hmm. 
Mrs. Morris must have made a mistake nothing likelier. She didn't. They might be either in this photograph, said Owen, looking at the card bearing Mrs. Manston's name. Blue eyes would scarcely photograph so deep in tone as that, said Cytheria. No, they seem black here, certainly. Well, then, Manston must have blundered in writing his verses. But could he? Say a man in love may forget his own name, but not that he forgets the color of his mistress's eyes. Besides she would have seen the mistake when she read them, and have had it corrected. That's true, she would, mused Owen. Then, Cytheria, it comes to this you must have been misinformed by Mrs. Morris, since there is no other alternative. I suppose I must. Her looks belied her words. What makes you so strange ill, said Owen again. I can't believe Mrs. Morris wrong. But look at this, Cytheria. If it is clear to us that the woman had blue eyes two years ago, she must have blue eyes now whatever Mrs. Morris or anybody else may fancy. Anyone would think that Manston could change the color of a woman's eyes to hear you. Yes, she said, and paused. You say yes, as if he could, said Owen impatiently. By changing the woman herself, she exclaimed. Owen, don't you see the horrid what I dread, that the woman he lives with is not Mrs. Manston that she was burnt after all and that I am his wife. She tried to support a stoicism under the weight of this new trouble, but no the unexpected revulsion of ideas was so overwhelming that she crept to him and leant against his breast. Before reflecting any further upon the subject Gray led her upstairs and got her to lie down. Then he went to the window and stared out of it up the lane, vainly endeavoring to come to some conclusion upon the fantastic enigma that confronted him. Cytheria's new view seemed incredible yet it had such a hold upon her that it would be necessary to clear it away by positive proof before contemplation of her fear should have preyed too deeply upon her. Cytheria, he said, this will not do. You must stay here alone all the afternoon whilst I go to carry Ford. I shall know all when I return. No, no, don't go she implored. Soon, then, not directly. He saw her subtle reasoning that it was folly to be wise. Reflection still convinced him that good would come of persevering in his intention and dispelling his sister's idle fears. Anything was better than this absurd doubt in her mind. But he resolved to wait till Sunday, the first day on which he might reckon upon seeing Mrs. Manston without suspicion. In the meantime he wrote to Edward Springrove, requesting him to go again to Mrs. Manston's former lodgings. 18 The Events of Three Days March the 18th Sunday morning had come, and Owen was trudging over the six miles of hill and dale that lay between Tolchurch and Carry Ford. Edward Springrove's answer to the last letter, after expressing his amazement at the strange contradiction between the verses and Mrs. Morris's letter, had been to the effect that he had again visited the neighbor of the dead Mr. Brown, and had received as near a description of Mrs. Manston as it was possible to get at second hand, and by hearsay. She was a tall woman white at the shoulders, and full-chested, and she had a straight and rather large nose. The color of her eyes the informant did not know, for she had only seen the lady in the street as she went in or out. This confusing remark was added. The woman had almost recognized Mrs. Manston when she had called with her husband lately, but she had kept her veil down. Her residence, before she came to Hoxton, was quite unknown to this next-door neighbor and Edward could get no manner of clue to it from any other source. Owen reached the church door a few minutes before the bells began chiming. Nobody was yet in the church, and he walked round the aisles. From Cytheria's frequent description of how and where herself and others used to sit, he knew where to look for Manston's seat, and after two or three errors of examination he took up a prayer book in which was written Eunice Manston. The book was nearly new, and the date of the writing about a month earlier. One point was at any rate established, that the woman living with Manston was presented to the world as no other than his lawful wife. The quiet villagers of Carry Ford required no pew opener in their place of worship, natives and indwellers had their own seats, and strangers sat where they could. Gray took a seat in the nave, on the north side, close behind a pillar dividing it from the north aisle, 
which was completely allotted to Miss Aldclyffe, her farmers, and her retainers, Manston's pew being in the midst of them. Owen's position on the other side of the passage was a little in advance of Manston's seat, and so situated that by leaning forward he could look directly into the face of any person sitting there, though, if he sat upright, he was wholly hidden from such a one by the intervening pillar. Aiming to keep his presence unknown to Manston if possible, Owen sat, without once turning his head, during the entrance of the congregation. A rustling of silk round by the north passage and into Manston's seat, told him that some woman had entered there, and as it seemed from the accompaniment of heavier footsteps, Manston was with her. Immediately upon rising up, he looked intently in that direction, and saw a lady standing at the end of the seat nearest himself. Portions of Manston's figure appeared on the other side of her. In two glances Gray read thus many of her characteristics, and in the following order. She was a tall woman. She was broad at the shoulders. She was full-bosomed. She was easily recognizable from the photograph but nothing could be discerned of the color of her eyes. With a preoccupied mind he withdrew into his nook, and heard the service continued only conscious of the fact that in opposition to the suspicion which one odd circumstance had bred in his sister concerning this woman, all ostensible and ordinary proofs and probabilities tended to the opposite conclusion. There sat the genuine original of the portrait could he wish for more? Cytheria wished for more. Eunice Manston's eyes were blue, and it was necessary that this woman's eyes should be blue also. Unskilled labor wastes in beating against the bars ten times the energy exerted by the practiced hand in the effective direction. Owen felt this to be the case in his own and Edward's attempts to follow up the clue afforded them. Think as he might, he could not think of a crucial test in the matter absorbing him, which should possess the indispensable attribute a capability of being applied privately, that in the event of its proving the lady to be the rightful owner of the name she used he might recede without obloquy from an untenable position. But to see Mrs. Manston's eyes from where he sat was impossible, and he could do nothing in the shape of a direct examination at present. Miss Aldclyffe had possibly recognized him, but Manston had not, and feeling that it was indispensable to keep the purport of his visit a secret from the steward, he thought it would be as well, too, to keep his presence in the village a secret from him, at any rate, till the day was over. At the first opening of the doors, Gray left the church and wandered away into the fields to ponder on another scheme. He could not call on Farmer Springgrove, as he had intended, until this matter was set at rest. Two hours intervened between the morning and afternoon services. This time had nearly expired before Owen had struck out any method of proceeding, or could decide to run the risk of calling at the old house and asking to see Mrs. Manston point blank but he had drawn near the place, and was standing still in the public path, from which a partial view of the front of the building could be obtained, when the bells began chiming for afternoon service. Whilst Gray paused, two persons came from the front door of the half-hidden dwelling whom he presently saw to be Manston and his wife. Manston was wearing his old garden hat, and carried one of the monthly magazines under his arm. Immediately they had passed the gateway he branched off and went over the hill in a direction away from the church, evidently intending to ramble along, and read as the humor moved him. The lady meanwhile turned in the other direction, and went into the church path. Owen resolved to make something of this opportunity. He hurried along towards the church, doubled round a sharp angle, and came back upon the other path, by which Mrs. Manston must arrive. In about three minutes she appeared in sight without avail. He discovered, as she drew nearer, a difficulty which had not struck him at first that it is not an easy matter to particularize the color of a stranger's eyes in a merely casual encounter on a path out of doors. That Mrs. Manston must be brought close to him, and not only so, but to look closely at him, if his purpose were to be accomplished. He shaped a plan. It might by chance be effectual, if otherwise it would not reveal his intention to her. When Mrs. Manston was within speaking distance, he went up to her and said, Will you kindly tell me which turning will take me to Casterbridge? The second on the right, said Mrs. Manston. Owen put on a blank look, he held his hand to his ear conveying to the lady the idea that he was deaf. She came closer and said more distinctly, 
the second turning on the right. Owen flushed a little. He fancied he had beheld the revelation he was in search of. But had his eyes deceived him? Once more he used the ruse, still drawing nearer and intimating by a glance that the trouble he gave her was very distressing to him. How very deaf she murmured. She exclaimed loudly. The second turning to the right. She had advanced her face to within a foot of his own, and in speaking mouthed very emphatically, fixing her eyes intently upon his. And now his first suspicion was indubitably confirmed. Her eyes were as black as midnight. All this feigning was most distasteful to Gray. The riddle having been solved, he unconsciously assumed his natural look before she had withdrawn her face. She found him to be peering at her as if he would read her very soul expressing with his eyes the notification of which, apart from emotion, the eyes are more capable than any other inquiry. Her face changed its expression then its color. The natural tint of the lighter portions sank to an ashy gray, the pink of her cheeks grew purpler. It was the precise result which would remain after blood had left the face of one whose skin was dark, and artificially coated with pearl powder and carmine. She turned her head and moved away, murmuring a hasty reply to Owen's farewell remark of good day, and with a kind of nervous twitch lifting her hand and smoothing her hair, which was of a light brown color. She wears false hair, he thought, or has changed its color artificially. Her true hair matched her eyes. And now, in spite of what Mr. Brown's neighbors had said about nearly recognizing Mrs. Manston on her recent visit which might have meant anything or nothing, in spite of the photograph, and in spite of his previous incredulity, in consequence of the verse, of her silence and backwardness at the visit to Hoxton with Manston, and of her appearance and distress at the present moment, Gray had a conviction that the woman was an impostor. What could be Manston's reason for such an astounding trick he could by no stretch of imagination divine? He changed his direction as soon as the woman was out of sight, and plodded along the lanes homeward to Tollchurch. One new idea was suggested to him by his desire to allay Cytheria's dread of being claimed, and by the difficulty of believing that the first Mrs. Manston lost her life as supposed, notwithstanding the inquest and verdict. Was it possible that the real Mrs. Manston, who was known to be a Philadelphian by birth, had returned by the train to London, as the porter had said, and then left the country under an assumed name, to escape that worst kind of widowhood the misery of being wedded to a fickle, faithless, and truant husband? In her complicated distress at the news brought by her brother, Cytheria's thoughts at length reverted to her friend, the rector of Carrie Ford. She told Owen of Mr. Ronham's warm-hearted behavior towards herself, and of his strongly expressed wish to aid her. He is not only a good, but a sensible man. We seem to want an old head on our side. And he is a magistrate, said Owen in a tone of concurrence. He thought, too, that no harm could come of confiding in the rector, but there was a difficulty in bringing about the confidence. He wished that his sister and himself might both be present at an interview with Mr. Ronham, yet it would be unwise for them to call on him together, in the sight of all the servants and parish of Carrie Ford. There could be no objection to their writing him a letter. No sooner was the thought born than it was carried out. They wrote to him at once, asking him to have the goodness to give them some advice they sadly needed, and begging that he would accept their assurance that there was a real justification for the additional request they made that instead of their calling upon him, he would any evening of the week come to their cottage at Tollchurch. March the 20th. 6 to 9 o'clock p.m. Two evenings later, to the total disarrangement of his dinner hour, Mr. Ronham appeared at Owen's door. His arrival was hailed with genuine gratitude. The horse was tied to the palings, and the rector ushered indoors and put into the easy chair. Then Gray told him the whole story, reminding him that their first suspicions had been of a totally different nature, and that in endeavoring to obtain proof of their truth they had stumbled upon marks which had surprised them into these new uncertainties, thrice as marvelous as the first, yet more prominent. Cytheria's heart was so full of anxiety that it superinduced a manner of confidence which was a death blow to all formality. Mr. Ronham took her hand pityingly. It is a serious charge, he said, as a sort of original twig on which his thoughts might precipitate themselves. 
assuming for a moment that such a substitution was rendered an easy matter by fortuitous events, he continued, there is this consideration to be placed beside it what earthly motive can Mr. Manston have had which would be sufficiently powerful to lead him to run such a very great risk. The most abandoned Rue could not, at that particular crisis, have taken such a reckless step for the mere pleasure of a new companion. Owen had seen that difficulty about the motive, Cytheria had not. Unfortunately for us, the rector resumed, no more evidence is to be obtained from the porter, Chinny. I suppose you know what became of him? He got to Liverpool and embarked, intending to work his way to America, but on the passage he fell overboard and was drowned. But there is no doubt of the truth of his confession in fact, his conduct tends to prove it true and no moral doubt of the fact that the real Mrs. Manston left here to go back by that morning's train. This being the case, then, why, if this woman is not she, did she take no notice of the advertisement I mean not necessarily a friendly notice, but from the information it afforded her have rendered it impossible that she should be personified without her own connivance? I think that argument is overthrown, Gray said, by my earliest assumption of her hatred of him, weariness of the chain which bound her to him, and a resolve to begin the world anew. Let's suppose she has married another man somewhere abroad, say, she would be silent for her own sake. You've hit the only genuine possibility, said Mr. Ronham, tapping his finger upon his knee. That would decidedly dispose of the second difficulty. But his motive would be as mysterious as ever. Cytheria's pictured dreads would not allow her mind to follow their conversation. She's burnt, she said. Oh yes, I fear I fear she is. I don't think we can seriously believe that now, after what has happened, said the rector. Still straining her thought towards the worst, then, perhaps, the first Mrs. Manston was not his wife, she returned, and then I should be his wife just the same, shouldn't I? They were married safely enough, said Owen. There is abundance of circumstantial evidence to prove that. Upon the whole, said Mr. Ronham, I should advise your asking in a straightforward way for legal proof from the steward that the present woman is really his original wife a thing which, to my mind, you should have done at the outset. He turned to Cytheria kindly, and asked her what made her give up her husband so unceremoniously. She could not tell the rector of her aversion to Manston, and of her unquenched love for Edward. Your terrified state no doubt, he said, answering for her, in the manner of those accustomed to the pulpit. But into such a solemn compact as marriage, all important considerations, both legally and morally, enter, it was your duty to have seen everything clearly proved. Doubtless Mr. Manston is prepared with proofs, but as it concerns nobody but yourself that her identity should be publicly established and by your absenteeism you act as if you were satisfied he has not troubled to exhibit them. Nobody else has taken the trouble to prove what does not affect them in the least that's the way of the world always. You, who should have required all things to be made clear, ran away. That was partly my doing, said Owen. The same explanation her want of love for Manston applied here too, but she shunned the revelation. But never mind, added the rector, it was all the greater credit to your womanhood, perhaps. I say, then, get your brother to write a line to Mr. Manston, saying you wish to be satisfied that all is legally clear in case you should want to marry again, for instance, and I have no doubt that you will be. Or, if you would rather, I'll write myself. Oh no, sir, no, pleaded Cytheria, beginning to blanch, and breathing quickly. Please don't say anything. Let me live here with Owen. I am so afraid it will turn out that I shall have to go to Knapwater and be his wife, and I don't want to go. Do conceal what we have told you. Let him continue his deception it is much the best for me. Mr. Ronham at length divined that her love for Manston, if it had ever existed, had transmuted itself into a very different feeling now. At any rate, he said, as he took his leave and mounted his mare, I will see about it. Rest content, Miss Gray, and depend upon it that I will not lead you into difficulty. Conceal it, she still pleaded. We'll see but of course I must do my duty. No don't do your duty she looked up at him through the gloom, 
illuminating her own face and eyes with the candle she held. I will consider, then, said Mr. Ronham, sensibly moved. He turned his horse's head, bade them a warm adieu, and left the door. The rector of Carryford trotted homewards under the cold and clear March sky, its countless stars fluttering like bright birds. He was unconscious of the scene. Recovering from the effect of Cytheria's voice and glance of entreaty, he laid the subject of the interview clearly before himself. The suspicions of Cytheria and Owen were honest, and had foundation that he must own. Was he a clergyman, magistrate, and conscientious man justified in yielding to Cytheria's importunities to keep silence, because she dreaded the possibility of a return to Manston? Was she wise in her request? Holding her present belief, and with no definite evidence either way, she could, for one thing, never conscientiously marry anyone else. Suppose that Cytheria were Manston's wife i.e., that the first wife was really burnt? The adultery of Manston would be proved, and, Mr. Ronham thought, cruelty sufficient to bring the case within the meaning of the statute. Suppose the new woman was, as stated, Mr. Manston's restored wife? Cytheria was perfectly safe as a single woman whose marriage had been void. And if it turned out that, though this woman was not Manston's wife, his wife was still living, as Owen had suggested, in America or elsewhere, Cytheria was safe. The first supposition opened up the worst contingency. Was she really safe as Manston's wife? Doubtful. But, however that might be, the gentle, defenseless girl, whom it seemed nobody's business to help or defend, should be put in a track to proceed against this man. She had but one life, and the superciliousness with which all the world now regarded her should be compensated in some measure by the man whose carelessness to set him in the best light had caused it. Mr. Ronham felt more and more positively that his duty must be done. An inquiry must be made into the matter. Immediately on reaching home, he sat down and wrote a plain and friendly letter to Mr. Manston, and dispatched it at once to him by hand. Then he flung himself back in his chair, and went on with his meditation. Was there anything in the suspicion? There could be nothing, surely. Nothing is done by a clever man without a motive, and what conceivable motive could Manston have for such abnormal conduct? Corinthian that he might be, who had preyed on virginity like St. George's dragon, he would never have been absurd enough to venture on such a course for the possession alone of the woman there was no reason for it she was inferior to Cytheria in every respect, physical and mental. On the other hand, it seemed rather odd, when he analyzed the action, that a woman who deliberately hid herself from her husband for more than a twelve month should be brought back by a mere advertisement. In fact, the whole business had worked almost too smoothly and effectually for unpremeditated sequence. It was too much like the indiscriminate writing of everything at the end of an old play. And there was that curious business of the keys and watch. Her way of accounting for their being left behind by forgetfulness had always seemed to him rather forced. The only unforced explanation was that suggested by the newspaper writers that she left them behind on purpose to blind people as to her escape, a motive which would have clashed with the possibility of her being fished back by an advertisement, as the present woman had been. Again, there were the two charred bones. He shuffled the books and papers in his study, and walked about the room, restlessly musing on the same subject. The parlor maid entered. Can young Mr. Springrove from London see you tonight, sir? Young Mr. Springrove, said the rector, surprised. Yes, sir. Yes, of course he can see me. Tell him to come in. Edward came so impatiently into the room, as to show that the few short moments his announcement had occupied had been irksome to him. He stood in the doorway with the same black bag in his hand, and the same old grey cloak on his shoulders, that he had worn fifteen months earlier when returning on the night of the fire. This appearance of his conveyed a true impression, he had become a stagnant man. But he was excited now. I have this moment come from London, he said as the door was closed behind him. The prophetic insight, which so strangely accompanies critical experiences, prompted Mr. Ronham's reply. About the Greys and Manston. Yes. That woman is not Mrs. 
Manston. Prove it. I can prove that she is somebody else that her name is Anne Seaway. And are their suspicions true indeed? And I can do what's more to the purpose at present. Suggest Manston's motive. Only suggest it, remember. But my assumption fits so perfectly with the facts that have been secretly unearthed and conveyed to me, that I can hardly conceive of another. There was in Edward's bearing that entire unconsciousness of himself which, natural to wild animals, only prevails in a sensitive man at moments of extreme intentness. The rector saw that he had no trivial story to communicate, whatever the story was. Sit down, said Mr. Ronham. My mind has been on the stretch all the evening to form the slightest guess at such an object, and all to no purpose entirely to no purpose. Have you said anything to Owen Gray? Nothing nor to anybody. I could not trust to the effect a letter might have upon yourself, either, the intricacy of the case brings me to this interview. Whilst Springrove had been speaking the two had sat down together. The conversation, hitherto distinct to every corner of the room, was carried on now in tones so low as to be scarcely audible to the interlocutors, and in phrases which hesitated to complete themselves. Three quarters of an hour passed. Then Edward arose, came out of the rector's study and again flung his cloak around him. Instead of going thence homeward, he went first to the Carryford Road station with a telegram, having dispatched which he proceeded to his father's house for the first time since his arrival in the village. From 9 to 10 o'clock p.m. The next presentation is the interior of the old house on the evening of the preceding section. The steward was sitting by his parlour fire, and had been reading the letter arrived from the rectory. Opposite to him sat the woman known to the village and neighbourhood as Mrs. Manston. Things are looking desperate with us, he said gloomily. His gloom was not that of the hypochondriac, but the legitimate gloom which has its origin in a syllogism. As he uttered the words he handed the letter to her. I almost expected some such news as this, she replied in a tone of much greater indifference. I knew suspicion lurked in the eyes of that young man who stared at me so in the church path, I could have sworn it. Manston did not answer for some time. His face was worn and haggard, latterly his head had not been carried so uprightly as of old. If they prove you to be who you are. Yes, if they do, he murmured. They must not find that out, she said, in a positive voice, and looking at him. But supposing they do, the trick does not seem to me to be so serious as to justify that wretched, miserable, horrible look of yours. It makes my flesh creep, it is perfectly death-like. He did not reply, and she continued, if they say and prove that Eunice is indeed living and dear, you know she is she is sure to come back. This remark seemed to awaken and irritate him to speech. Again, as he had done a hundred times during their residence together, he categorized the events connected with the fire at the Three Tranters. He dwelled on every incident of that night's history, and endeavored, with an anxiety which was extraordinary in the apparent circumstances, to prove that his wife must, by the very nature of things, have perished in the flames. She arose from her seat, crossed the hearthrug, and set herself to soothe him, then she whispered that she was still as unbelieving as ever. Come. Supposing she escaped just supposing she escaped where is she, coaxed the lady. Why are you so curious continually, said Manston. Because I am a woman and want to know. Now where is she? In the flying isle of San Boran Dan. Witty cruelty is the cruelest of any. Ah, well if she is in England, she will come back. She is not in England. But she will come back. No, she won't. Come, madam, he said, arousing himself, I shall not answer any more questions. Ah, ah, ah she is not dead, the woman murmured again poutingly. She is, I tell you. I don't think so, love. She was burnt, I tell you, he exclaimed. Now to please me, admit the bare possibility of her being alive just the possibility. Oh yes to please you I will admit that, he said quickly. Yes, I admit the possibility of her being alive, to please you. She looked at him in utter perplexity. The words could only have been said in jest, 
and yet they seemed to savor of a tone the furthest removed from jesting. There was his face plain to her eyes, but no information of any kind was to be read there. It is only natural that I should be curious, she murmured pettishly, if I resemble her as much as you say I do. You are handsomer, he said, though you are about her own height and size. But don't worry yourself. You must know that you are body and soul united with me, though you are but my housekeeper. She bridled a little at the remark. Wife, she said, most certainly wife, since you cannot dismiss me without losing your character and position, and incurring heavy penalties. I own it it was well said, though mistakenly very mistakenly. Don't riddle to me about mistakenly and such dark things. Now what was your motive, dearest, in running the risk of having me here? Your beauty, he said. She thanks you much for the compliment, but will not take it. Come, what was your motive? Your wit. No, no, not my wit. Wit would have made a wife of me by this time instead of what I am. Your virtue. Or virtue either. I tell you it was your beauty really. But I cannot help seeing and hearing, and if what people say is true, I am not nearly so good looking as Cytherea, and several years older. The aspect of Manston's face at these words from her was so confirmatory of her hint, that his forced reply of oh no, tended to develop her chagrin. Mere liking or love for me, she resumed, would not have sprung up all of a sudden, as your pretended passion did. You had been to London several times between the time of the fire and your marriage with Cytherea you had never visited me or thought of my existence or cared that I was out of a situation and poor. But the week after you married her and were separated from her, off you rushed to make love to me not first to me either, for you went to several places. No, not several places. Yes, you told me so yourself that you went first to the only lodging in which your wife had been known as Mrs. Manston, and when you found that the lodging housekeeper had gone away and died, and that nobody else in the street had any definite ideas as to your wife's personal appearance, and came and proposed the arrangement we carried out that I should personate her. Your taking all this trouble shows that something more serious than love had to do with the matter. Humbug what trouble after all did I take? When I found Cytherea would not stay with me after the wedding I was much put out at being left alone again. Was that unnatural? No. And those favoring accidents you mentioned that nobody knew my first wife seemed an arrangement of providence for our mutual benefit, and merely perfected a half-formed impulse that I should call you my first wife to escape the scandal that would have arisen if you had come here as anything else. My love, that story won't do. If Mrs. Manston was burnt, Cytherea, whom you love better than me, could have been compelled to live with you as your lawful wife. If she was not burnt, why should you run the risk of her turning up again at any moment and exposing your substitution of me, and ruining your name and prospects? Why because I might have loved you well enough to run the risk assuming her not to be burnt, which I deny. No you would have run the risk the other way. You would rather have risked her finding you with Cytherea as a second wife, than with me as a personator of herself the first one. You came easiest to hand remember that. Not so very easy either, considering the labor you took to teach me your first wife's history. All about how she was a native of Philadelphia then making me read up the guidebook to Philadelphia, and details of American life and manners, in case the birthplace and history of your wife, Eunice, should ever become known in this neighborhood unlikely as it was. Ah and then about the handwriting of hers that I had to imitate, and the dyeing my hair, and rouging, to make the transformation complete? You mean to say that that was taking less trouble than there would have been in arranging events to make Cytherea believe herself your wife, and live with you? You were a needy adventuress, who would dare anything for a new pleasure and an easy life and I was fool enough to give in to you. Good heavens above did I ask you to insert those advertisements for your old wife, and to make me answer it as if I was she? Did I ask you to send me the letter for me to copy and send back to you when the third advertisement appeared purporting to come from the long-lost wife, and giving a detailed history of her escape and subsequent life all which you had invented yourself? You deluded me into loving you, and then enticed me here ah, and this is another thing. How did you know the real wife wouldn't answer it, 
and upset all your plans. Because I knew she was burnt. Why didn't you force Cytheria to come back, then? Now, my love, I have caught you, and you may just as well tell first as last, what was your motive in having me here as your first wife? Silence he exclaimed. She was silent for the space of two minutes, and then persisted in going on to mutter, and why was it that Miss Aldclyffe allowed her favourite young lady, Scythe, to be overthrown and supplanted without an expostulation or any show of sympathy? Do you know I often think you exercise a secret power over Miss Aldclyffe? And she always shuns me as if I shared the power. A poor, ill-used creature like me sharing power, indeed. She thinks you are Mrs. Manston. That wouldn't make her avoid me. Yes it would, he exclaimed impatiently. I wish I was dead dead he had jumped up from his seat in uttering the words, and now walked wearily to the end of the room. Coming back more decisively, he looked in her face. We must leave this place if Ronham suspects what I think he does, he said. The request of Cytheria and her brother may simply be for a satisfactory proof, to make her feel legally free but it may mean more. What may it mean? How should I know? Well, well, never mind, old boy, she said, approaching him to make up the quarrel. Don't be so alarmed anybody would think that you were the woman and I the man. Suppose they do find out what I am we can go away from here and keep house as usual. People will say of you, his first wife was burnt to death or ran away to the colonies, as the case may be, he married a second, and deserted her for Anne Seaway. A very everyday case nothing so horrible, after all. He made an impatient movement. Whichever way we do it, nobody must know that you are not my wife Eunice. And now I must think about arranging matters. Manston then retired to his office, and shut himself up for the remainder of the evening. 19 The Events of A Day and Night March the 21st Morning Next morning the steward went out as usual. He shortly told his companion, Anne, that he had almost matured their scheme, and that they would enter upon the details of it when he came home at night. The fortunate fact that the rector's letter did not require an immediate answer would give him time to consider. Anne Seaway then began her duties in the house. Besides daily superintending the cook and housemaid one of these duties was, at rare intervals, to dust Manston's office with her own hands, a servant being supposed to disturb the books and papers unnecessarily. She softly wandered from table to shelf with the duster in her hand, afterwards standing in the middle of the room, and glancing around to discover if any noteworthy collection of dust had still escaped her. Her eye fell upon a faint layer which rested upon the ledge of an old-fashioned chestnut cabinet of French Renaissance workmanship, placed in a recess by the fireplace. At a height of about four feet from the floor the upper portion of the front receded, forming the ledge alluded to, on which opened at each end two small doors, the center space between them being filled out by a panel of similar size, making the third of three squares. The dust on the ledge was nearly on a level with the woman's eye, and, though insignificant in quantity, showed itself distinctly on account of this obliquity of vision. Now opposite the central panel, concentric quarter circles were traced in the deposited film, expressing to her that this panel, too, was a door like the others, that it had lately been opened, and had schemed the dust with its lower edge. At last, then, her curiosity was slightly rewarded. For the right of the matter was that Anne had been incited to this exploration of Manston's office rather by a wish to know the reason of his long seclusion here, after the arrival of the rector's letter, and their subsequent discourse, than by any immediate desire for cleanliness. Still, there would have been nothing remarkable to Anne in this sight but for one recollection. Manston had once casually told her that each of the two side lockers included half the middle space, the panel of which did not open, and was only put in for symmetry. It was possible that he had opened this compartment by candlelight the preceding night, or he would have seen the marks in the dust, and effaced them, that he might not be proved guilty of telling her an untruth. She balanced herself on one foot and stood pondering. She considered that it was very vexing and unfair in him to refuse her all knowledge of his remaining secrets, under the peculiar circumstances of her connection with him. 
she went close to the cabinet. As there was no keyhole, the door must be capable of being opened by the unassisted hand. The circles in the dust told her at which edge to apply her force. Here she pulled with the tips of her fingers, but the panel would not come forward. She fetched a chair and looked over the top of the cabinet, but no bolt, knob, or spring was to be seen. Oh, never mind, she said, with indifference, I'll ask him about it, and he will tell me. Down she came and turned away. Then looking back again she thought it was absurd such a trifle should puzzle her. She retraced her steps, and opened a drawer beneath the ledge of the cabinet, pushing in her hand and feeling about on the underside of the board. Here she found a small round sinking, and pressed her finger into it. Nothing came of the pressure. She withdrew her hand and looked at the tip of her finger, it was marked with the impress of the circle, and, in addition, a line ran across it diametrically. How stupid of me, it is the head of a screw. Whatever mysterious contrivance had originally existed for opening the puny cupboard of the cabinet, it had at some time been broken, and this rough substitute provided. Stimulated curiosity would not allow her to recede now. She fetched a screwdriver, withdrew the screw, pulled the door open with a penknife, and found inside a cavity about ten inches square. The cavity contained letters from different women, with unknown signatures, Christian names only surnames being despised in Paphos. Letters from his wife Eunice. Letters from Anne herself, including that she wrote in answer to his advertisement. A small pocket book. Sundry scraps of paper. The letters from the strange women with pet names she glanced carelessly through, and then put them aside. They were too similar to her own regretted delusion, and curiosity requires contrast to excite it. The letters from his wife were next examined. They were dated back as far as Eunice's first meeting with Manston, and the early ones before their marriage contained the usual pretty effusions of women at such a period of their existence. Some little time after he had made her his wife, and when he had come to nap water, the series began again, and now their contents arrested her attention more forcibly. She closed the cabinet, carried the letters into the parlor, reclined herself on the sofa, and carefully perused them in the order of their dates. John Street October My dearest husband I received your hurried line of yesterday, and was of course content with it. But why don't you tell me your exact address instead of that post office, Budmouth? This matter is all a mystery to me, and I ought to be told every detail. I cannot fancy it is the same kind of occupation you have been used to hitherto. Your command that I am to stay here a while until you can see how things look and can arrange to send for me, I must necessarily abide by. But if, as you say, a married man would have been rejected by the person who engaged you, and that hence my existence must be kept a secret until you have secured your position, why did you think of going at all? The truth is, this keeping our marriage a secret is troublesome, vexing, and wearisome to me. I see the poorest woman in the street bearing her husband's name openly living with him in the most matter-of-fact ease, and why shouldn't I? I wish I was back again in Liverpool. Today I bought a grey waterproof cloak. I think it is a little too long for me, but it was cheap for one of such a quality. The weather is gusty and dreary, and till this morning I had hardly set foot outside the door since you left. Please do tell me when I am to come very affectionately yours, Eunice. John Street. October. My dear husband why don't you write? Do you hate me? I have not had the heart to do anything this last week. That I, your wife, should be in this strait, and my husband well to do I have been obliged to leave my first lodging for debt among other things, they charged me for a lot of brandy which I am quite sure I did not taste. Then I went to Camberwell and was found out by them. I went away privately from thence, and changed my name the second time. I am now Mrs. Rondley. But the new lodging was the wretchedest and dearest I ever set foot in, and I left it after being there only a day. I am now at No. In the same street that you left me in originally. All last night the sash of my window rattled so dreadfully that I could not sleep, but I had not energy enough to get out of bed to stop it. 
This morning I have been walking I don't know how far but far enough to make my feet ache. I have been looking at the outside of two or three of the theatres, but they seem forbidding if I regard them with the eye of an actress in search of an engagement. Though you said I was to think no more of the stage, I believe you would not care if you found me there. But I am not an actress by nature, and art will never make me one. I am too timid and retiring, I was intended for a Kataker's wife. I certainly shall not try to go on the boards again whilst I am in this strange place. The idea of being brought on as far as London and then left here alone why didn't you leave me in Liverpool? Perhaps you thought I might have told somebody that my real name was Mrs. Manston. As if I had a living friend to whom I could impart it no such good fortune in fact, my nearest friend is no nearer than what most people would call a stranger. But perhaps I ought to tell you that a week before I wrote my last letter to you, after wishing that my uncle and aunt in Philadelphia the only near relatives I had were still alive, I suddenly resolved to send a line to my cousin James, who, I believe, is still living in that neighborhood. He has never seen me since we were babies together. I did not tell him of my marriage, because I thought you might not like it, and I gave my real maiden name, and an address at the post office here. But God knows if the letter will ever reach him. Do write me an answer, and send something your affectionate wife, Eunice. Friday, October. My dear husband the order for ten pounds has just come, and I am truly glad to get it. But why will you write so bitterly? Ah well, if I had only had the money I should have been on my way to America by this time, so don't think I want to bore you of my own free will. Who can you have met with at that new place? Remember I say this in no malignant tone, but certainly the facts go to prove that you have deserted me you are inconstant I know it. Oh, why are you so? Now I have lost you, I love you in spite of your neglect. I am weakly fond that's my nature. I fear that upon the whole my life has been wasted. I know there is another woman supplanting me in your heart yes, I know it. Come to me do come. Eunice. Charles Square. Hoxton. November. Dear Aeneas here I am back again after my visit. Why should you have been so enraged at my finding your exact address? Any woman would have tried to do it you know she would have. And no woman would have lived under assumed names so long as I did. I repeat that I did not call myself Mrs. Manston until I came to this lodging at the beginning of this month what could you expect? A helpless creature I, had not fortune favored me unexpectedly. Banished as I was from your house at dawn, I did not suppose the indignity was about to lead to important results. But in crossing the park I overheard the conversation of a young man and woman who had also risen early. I believe her to be the girl who has won you away from me. Well, their conversation concerned you and Miss Aldclyffe, very peculiarly. The remarkable thing is that you yourself, without knowing it, told me of what, added to their conversation, completely reveals a secret to me that neither of you understand. Two negatives never made such a telling positive before. One clue more, and you would see it. A single consideration prevents my revealing it just one doubt as to whether your ignorance was real, and was not feigned to deceive me. Civility now, please. Eunice. Charles Square. Tuesday, November. My darling husband Monday will suit me excellently for coming. I have acted exactly up to your instructions, and have sold my rubbish at the brokers in the next street. All this movement and bustle is delightful to me after the weeks of monotony I have endured. It is a relief to wish the place goodbye London always has seemed so much more foreign to me than Liverpool the midday train on Monday will do nicely for me. I shall be anxiously looking out for you on Sunday night. I hope so much that you are not angry with me for writing to Miss Aldclyffe. You are not, dear, are you? Forgive me your loving wife, Eunice. This was the last of the letters from the wife to the husband. One other, in Mrs. Manston's handwriting, and in the same packet, was differently addressed. Three Tranters in, Carrie Ford. November. Dear Cousin James thank you indeed for answering my letters so promptly. When I called at the post office yesterday I did not in the least think there would be one. But I must leave this subject. 
I write again at once under the strangest and saddest conditions it is possible to conceive. I did not tell you in my last that I was a married woman. Don't blame me it was my husband's influence. I hardly know where to begin my story. I had been living apart from him for a time then he sent for me this was last week and I was glad to go to him. Then this is what he did. He promised to fetch me, and did not leaving me to do the journey alone. He promised to meet me at the station here he did not. I went on through the darkness to his house, and found his door locked and himself away from home. I have been obliged to come here, and I write to you in a strange room in a strange village and I choose the present moment to write to drive away my misery. Sorrow seems a sort of pleasure when you detail it on paper poor pleasure though. But this is what I want to know and I am ashamed to tell it. I would gladly do as you say, and come to you as a housekeeper, but I have not the money even for a steerage passage. James, do you want me badly enough do you pity me enough to send it? I could manage to subsist in London upon the proceeds of my sale for another month or six weeks. Will you send it to the same address at the post office? But how do I know that you? Thus the letter ended. From creases in the paper it was plain that the writer, having got so far, had become dissatisfied with her production, and had crumpled it in her hand. Was it to write another, or not to write at all? The next thing Anne Seaway perceived was that the fragmentary story she had coaxed out of Manston, to the effect that his wife had left England for America, might be truthful, according to two of these letters, corroborated by the evidence of the railway porter. And yet, at first, he had sworn in a passion that his wife was most certainly consumed in the fire. If she had been burnt, this letter, written in her bedroom, and probably thrust into her pocket when she relinquished it, would have been burnt with her. Nothing was surer than that. Why, then, did he say she was burnt, and never show Anne herself this letter? The question suddenly raised a new and much stranger one kindling a burst of amazement in her. How did Manston become possessed of this letter? That fact of possession was certainly the most remarkable revelation of all in connection with this epistle, and perhaps had something to do with his reason for never showing it to her. She knew by several proofs, that before his marriage with Cytherea, and up to the time of the porter's confession, Manston believed honestly believed that Cytherea would be his lawful wife, and hence, of course, that his wife Eunice was dead. So that no communication could possibly have passed between his wife and himself from the first moment that he believed her dead on the night of the fire, to the day of his wedding. And yet he had that letter. How soon afterwards could they have communicated with each other? The existence of the letter as much as, or more than its contents implying that Mrs. Manston was not burnt, his belief in that calamity must have terminated at the moment he obtained possession of the letter, if no earlier. Was, then, the only solution to the riddle that Anne could discern, the true one, that he had communicated with his wife somewhere about the commencement of Anne's residence with him, or at any time since? It was the most unlikely thing on earth that a woman who had forsaken her husband should countenance his scheme to personify her whether she were in America, in London, or in the neighborhood of Knapwater. Then came the old and harassing question, what was Manston's real motive in risking his name on the deception he was practicing as regarded Anne? It could not be, as he had always pretended, mere passion. Her thoughts had reverted to Mr. Ronham's letter asking for proofs of her identity with the original Mrs. Manston. She could see no loophole of escape for the man who supported her. True, in her own estimation, his worst alternative was not so very bad after all the getting the name of Libertine, a possible appearance in the divorce or some other court of law, and a question of damages. Such an exposure might hinder his worldly progress for some time. Yet to him this alternative was, apparently, terrible as death itself. She restored the letters to their hiding place, scanned anew the other letters and memoranda, from which she could gain no fresh information, fastened up the cabinet, and left everything in its former condition. Her mind was ill at ease. More than ever she wished that she had never seen Manston. Where the person suspected of mysterious moral obliquity is the possessor of great physical and intellectual attractions, the mere sense of incongruity adds an extra shudder to dread. 
the man's strange bearing terrified Anne as it had terrified Cytheria, for with all the woman Anne's faults, she had not descended to such depths of depravity as to willingly participate in crime. She had not even known that a living wife was being displaced till her arrival at Knapwater put retreat out of the question, and had looked upon personation simply as a mode of subsistence a degree better than toiling in poverty and alone, after a bustling and somewhat pampered life as housekeeper in a gay mansion. Non illa Colorado Calathis Minervi. Fomania's Asweta Manus. Afternoon. Mr. Ronham and Edward Springrove had by this time set in motion a machinery which they hoped to find working out important results. The rector was restless and full of meditation all the following morning. It was plain, even to the servants about him, that Springrove's communication wore a deeper complexion than any that had been made to the old magistrate for many months or years past. The fact was that, Having arrived at the stage of existence in which the difficult intellectual feat of suspending one's judgment becomes possible, he was now putting it in practice, though not without the penalty of watchful effort. It was not till the afternoon that he determined to call on his relative, Miss Aldclyffe, and cautiously probe her knowledge of the subject occupying him so thoroughly. Cytheria, he knew, was still beloved by this solitary woman. Miss Aldclyffe had made several private inquiries concerning her former companion, and there was ever a sadness in her tone when the young lady's name was mentioned, which showed that from whatever cause the elder Cytheria's renunciation of her favourite and namesake proceeded, it was not from indifference to her fate. Have you ever had any reason for supposing your steward anything but an upright man, he said to the lady. Never the slightest. Have you, said she reservedly. Well I have. What is it? I can say nothing plainly, because nothing is proved. But my suspicions are very strong. Do you mean that he was rather cool towards his wife when they were first married, and that it was unfair in him to leave her? I know he was, but I think his recent conduct towards her has amply atoned for the neglect. He looked Miss Aldclyffe full in the face. It was plain that she spoke honestly. She had not the slightest notion that the woman who lived with the steward might be other than Mrs. Manston much less that a greater matter might be behind. That's not it I wish it was no more. My suspicion is, first, that the woman living at the old house is not Mr. Manston's wife. Not Mr. Manston's wife. That is it. Miss Aldclyffe looked blankly at the rector. Not Mr. Manston's wife who else can she be, she said simply. An improper woman of the name of Anne Seaway. Mr. Ronham had, in common with other people, noticed the extraordinary interest of Miss Aldclyffe in the well being of her steward, and had endeavoured to account for it in various ways. The extent to which she was shaken by his information, whilst it proved that the understanding between herself and Manston did not make her a sharer of his secrets, also showed that the tie which bound her to him was still unbroken. Mr. Ronham had lately begun to doubt the latter fact, and now, on finding himself mistaken, regretted that he had not kept his own counsel in the matter. This it was too late to do, and he pushed on with his proofs. He gave Miss Aldclyffe in detail the grounds of his belief. Before he had done, she recovered the cloak of reserve that she had adopted on his opening the subject. I might possibly be convinced that you were in the right, after such an elaborate argument, she replied, were it not for one fact, which bears in the contrary direction so pointedly, that nothing but absolute proof can turn it. It is that there is no conceivable motive which could induce any sane man leaving alone a man of Mr. Manston's clear-headedness and integrity to venture upon such an extraordinary course of conduct no motive on earth. That was my own opinion till after the visit of a friend last night a friend of mine and poor little Cytherea's. Ah and Cytherea! said Miss Aldclyffe, catching at the idea raised by the name. That he loved Cytherea yes and loves her now, wildly and devotedly, I am as positive as that I breathe. Cytherea is years younger than Mrs. Manston as I shall call her twice as sweet in disposition, three times as beautiful. Would he have given her up quietly and suddenly for a common Mr. Ronham, your story is monstrous, and I don't believe it she glowed in her earnestness. The rector might now have advanced his second proposition the possible motive but for reasons of his own he did not. Very well, madam. 
I only hope that facts will sustain you in your belief. Ask him the question to his face, whether the woman is his wife or no, and see how he receives it. I will tomorrow, most certainly, she said. I always let these things die of wholesome ventilation, as every fungus does. But no sooner had the rector left her presence, than the grain of mustard seed he had sown grew to a tree. Her impatience to set her mind at rest could not brook a night's delay. It was with the utmost difficulty that she could wait till evening arrived to screen her movements. Immediately the sun had dropped behind the horizon, and before it was quite dark, she wrapped her cloak around her, softly left the house, and walked erect through the gloomy park in the direction of the old manor house. The same minute saw two persons sit down in the rectory house to share the rector's usually solitary dinner. One was a man of official appearance, commonplace in all except his eyes. The other was Edward Springrove. The discovery of the carefully concealed letters rankled in the mind of Anne Seaway. Her woman's nature insisted that Manston had no right to keep all matters connected with his lost wife a secret from herself. Perplexity had bred vexation, vexation, resentment, curiosity had been continuous. The whole morning this resentment and curiosity increased. The steward said very little to his companion during their luncheon at midday. He seemed reckless of appearances almost indifferent to whatever fate awaited him. All his actions betrayed that something portentous was impending, and still he explained nothing. By carefully observing every trifling action, as only a woman can observe them, the thought at length dawned upon her that he was going to run away secretly. She feared for herself, her knowledge of law and justice was vague, and she fancied she might in some way be made responsible for him. In the afternoon he went out of the house again, and she watched him drive away in the direction of the county town. She felt a desire to go there herself, and, after an interval of half an hour, followed him on foot notwithstanding the distance ostensibly to do some shopping. One among her several trivial errands was to make a small purchase at the druggist's. Near the druggist's stood the county bank. Looking out of the shop window, between the colored bottles, she saw Manston come down the steps of the bank, in the act of withdrawing his hand from his pocket, and pulling his coat close over its mouth. It is an almost universal habit with people, when leaving a bank, to be carefully adjusting their pockets if they have been receiving money, if they have been paying it in, their hands swing laxly. The steward had in all likelihood been taking money possibly on Miss Aldclyffe's account that was continual with him. And he might have been removing his own, as a man would do who was intending to leave the country. From 5 to 8 o'clock p.m., Anne reached home again in time to preside over preparations for dinner. Manston came in half an hour later. The lamp was lighted, the shutters were closed, and they sat down together. He was pale and worn almost haggard. The meal passed off in almost unbroken silence. When preoccupation withstands the influence of a social meal with one pleasant companion, the mental scene must be surpassingly vivid. Just as she was rising a tap came to the door. Before a maid could attend to the knock, Manston crossed the room and answered it himself. The visitor was Miss Aldclyffe. Manston instantly came back and spoke to Anne in an undertone. I should be glad if you could retire to your room for a short time. It is a dry, starlight evening, she replied. I will go for a little walk if your object is merely a private conversation with Miss Aldclyffe. Very well, do, there's no accounting for tastes, he said. A few commonplaces then passed between her and Miss Aldclyffe, and Anne went upstairs to bonnet and cloak herself. She came down, opened the front door, and went out. She looked around to realize the night. It was dark, mournful, and quiet. Then she stood still. From the moment that Manston had requested her absence, a strong and burning desire had prevailed in her to know the subject of Miss Aldclyffe's conversation with him. Simple curiosity was not entirely what inspired her. Her suspicions had been thoroughly aroused by the discovery of the morning. A conviction that her future depended on her power to combat a man who, in desperate circumstances, would be far from a friend to her prompted a strategic movement to acquire the important secret that was in handling now. The woman thought and thought, and regarded the dull dark trees, 
anxiously debating how the thing could be done. Stealthily reopening the front door she entered the hall, and advancing and pausing alternately, came close to the door of the room in which Miss Aldclyffe and Manston conversed. Nothing could be heard through the keyhole or panels. At a great risk she softly turned the knob and opened the door to a width of about half an inch, performing the act so delicately that three minutes, at least, were occupied in completing it. At that instant Miss Aldclyffe said. There's a draft somewhere. The door is ajar, I think. Anne glided back under the staircase. Manston came forward and closed the door. This chance was now cut off, and she considered again. The parlor, or sitting room, in which the conference took place, had the window shutters fixed on the outside of the window, as is usual in the back portions of old country houses. The shutters were hinged one on each side of the opening, and met in the middle, where they were fastened by a bolt passing continuously through them and the wood mullion within, the bolt being secured on the inside by a pin, which was seldom inserted till Manston and herself were about to retire for the night, sometimes not at all. If she returned to the door of the room she might be discovered at any moment, but could she listen at the window, which overlooked a part of the garden never visited after nightfall, she would be safe from disturbance. The idea was worth a trial. She glided round to the window, took the head of the bolt between her finger and thumb, and softly screwed it round until it was entirely withdrawn from its position. The shutters remained as before, whilst, where the bolt had come out, was now a shining hole three quarters of an inch in diameter, through which one might see into the middle of the room. She applied her eye to the orifice. Miss Aldclyffe and Manston were both standing, Manston with his back to the window, his companion facing it. The lady's demeanour was severe, condemnatory, and haughty. No more was to be seen, and then turned sideways, leant with her shoulder against the shutters and placed her ear upon the hole. You know where, said Miss Aldclyffe. And how could you, a man, act a double deceit like this? Men do strange things sometimes. What was your reason come? A mere whim. I might even believe that, if the woman were handsomer than Cytherea or if you had been married some time to Cytherea and had grown tired of her. And can't you believe it, too, under these conditions, that I married Cytherea, gave her up because I heard that my wife was alive, found that my wife would not come to live with me, and then, not to let any woman I love so well as Cytherea run any risk of being displaced and ruined in reputation, should my wife ever think fit to return, induced this woman to come to me, as being better than no companion at all. I cannot believe it. Your love for Cytherea was not of such a kind as that excuse would imply. It was Cytherea or nobody with you. As an object of passion, you did not desire the company of this Anne Seaway at all, and certainly not so much as to madly risk your reputation by bringing her here in the way you have done. I am sure you didn't, Aeneas. So am I, he said bluntly. Miss Aldclyffe uttered an exclamation of astonishment the confession was like a blow in its suddenness. She began to reproach him bitterly, and with tears. How could you overthrow my plans, disgrace the only girl I ever had any respect for, by such inexplicable doings? That woman must leave this place the country perhaps. Heavens the truth will leak out in a day or two. She must do no such thing, and the truth must be stifled somehow nobody knows how. If I stay here, or on any spot of the civilized globe, as Aeneas Manston, this woman must live with me as my wife, or I am damned past redemption. I will not countenance your keeping her, whatever your motive may be. You must do something, he murmured. You must. Yes, you must. I never will, she said. It is a criminal act. He looked at her earnestly. Will you not support me through this deception if my very life depends upon it? Will you not? Nonsense life it will be a scandal to you, but she must leave this place. It will out sooner or later, and the exposure had better come now. Manston repeated gloomily the same words. My life depends upon your supporting me my very life. He then came close to her, and spoke into her ear. Whilst he spoke he held her head to his mouth with both his hands. 
strange expressions came over her face, the workings of her mouth were painful to observe. Still he held her and whispered on. The only words that could be caught by Anne Seaway, confused as her hearing frequently was by the moan of the wind and the waterfall in her outer ear, were these of Miss Aldclyffe, in tones which absolutely quivered, they have no money. What can they prove? The listener tasked herself to the utmost to catch his answer, but it was in vain. Of the remainder of the colloquy one fact alone was plain to Anne, and that only inductively that Miss Aldclyffe, from what he had revealed to her, was going to scheme body and soul on Manston's behalf. Miss Aldclyffe seemed now to have no further reason for remaining, yet she lingered a while as if loath to leave him. When, finally, the crestfallen and agitated lady made preparations for departure, Anne quickly inserted the bolt, ran round to the entrance archway, and down the steps into the park. Here she stood close to the trunk of a huge lime tree, which absorbed her dark outline into its own. In a few minutes she saw Manston, with Miss Aldclyffe leaning on his arm, cross the glade before her and proceed in the direction of the house. She watched them ascend the rise and advance, as two black spots, towards the mansion. The appearance of an oblong space of light in the dark mass of walls denoted that the door was opened. Miss Aldclyffe's outline became visible upon it, the door shut her in, and all was darkness again. The form of Manston returning alone arose from the gloom, and passed by Anne in her hiding place. Waiting outside a quarter of an hour longer, that no suspicion of any kind might be excited, Anne returned to the old manor house. From 8 to 11 o'clock p.m. Manston was very friendly that evening. It was evident to her, now that she was behind the scenes, that he was making desperate efforts to disguise the real state of his mind. Her terror of him did not decrease. They sat down to supper, Manston still talking cheerfully. But what is keener than the eye of a mistrustful woman? A man's cunning is to it as was the armor of Cicera to the thin tent nail. She found, in spite of his adroitness, that he was attempting something more than a disguise of his feeling. He was trying to distract her attention, that he might be unobserved in some special movement of his hands. What a moment it was for her then the whole surface of her body became attentive. She allowed him no chance whatever. We know the duplicated condition at such times when the existence divides itself into two, and the ostensibly innocent chatterer stands in front, like another person, to hide the timorous spy. Manston played the same game, but more palpably. The meal was nearly over when he seemed possessed of a new idea of how his object might be accomplished. He tilted back his chair with a reflective air, and looked steadily at the clock standing against the wall opposite to him. He said sententiously, few faces are capable of expressing more by dumb show than the face of a clock. You may see in it every variety of incentive from the softest seductions to negligence to the strongest hints for action. Well, in what way, she inquired. His drift was, as yet, quite unintelligible to her. Why? For instance, look at the cold, methodical, unromantic, business-like air of all the right-angled positions of the hands. They make a man set about work in spite of himself. Then look at the piquant shyness of its face when the two hands are over each other. Several attitudes imply make ready. The make ready of ten minutes to one differs from the make ready of ten minutes to twelve, as youth differs from age. Upward and onward says twenty-five minutes to eleven. Midday or midnight expresses distinctly it is done. You surely have noticed that. Yes, I have. He continued with affected quaintness. The easy dash of ten minutes past seven, the rakish recklessness of a quarter past, the drooping weariness of twenty-five minutes past, must have been observed by everybody. Whatever amount of truth there may be, there is a good deal of imagination in your fancy, she said. He still contemplated the clock. Then, again, the general finish of the face has a great effect upon the eye. This old-fashioned brass-faced one we have here, with its arched top, half-moon slit for the day of the month, and ship rocking at the upper part, impresses me with the notion of its being an old cynic, elevating his brows, whose thoughts can be seen wavering between good and evil. A thought now enlightened her, the clock was behind her 
and he wanted to get her back turned. She dreaded turning, yet, not to excite his suspicion, she was on her guard, she quickly looked behind her at the clock as he spoke, recovering her old position again instantly. The time had not been long enough for any action whatever on his part. Ah, he casually remarked, and at the same minute began to pour her out a glass of wine. Speaking of the clock has reminded me that it must nearly want winding up. Remember that it is wound tonight. Suppose you do it at once, my dear. There was no possible way of evading the act. She resolutely turned to perform the operation, anything was better than that he should suspect her. It was an old-fashioned eight-day clock, of workmanship suited to the rest of the antique furniture that Manston had collected there, and ground heavily during winding. Anne had given up all idea of being able to watch him during the interval, and the noise of the wheels prevented her learning anything by her ears. But, as she wound, she caught sight of his shadow on the wall at her right hand. What was he doing? He was in the very act of pouring something into her glass of wine. He had completed the maneuver before she had done winding. She methodically closed the clock case and turned round again. When she faced him he was sitting in his chair as before she had risen. In a familiar scene which has hitherto been pleasant it is difficult to realize that an added condition, which does not alter its aspect, can have made it terrible. The woman thought that his action must have been prompted by no other intent than that of poisoning her, and yet she could not instantly put on a fear of her position. And before she had grasped these consequences, another supposition served to make her regard the first as unlikely, if not absurd. It was the act of a madman to take her life in a manner so easy of discovery, unless there were far more reason for the crime than any that Manston could possibly have. Was it not merely his intention, in tampering with her wine, to make her sleep soundly that night? This was in harmony with her original suspicion, that he intended secretly to abscond. At any rate, he was going to set about some stealthy proceeding, as to which she was to be kept in utter darkness. The difficulty now was to avoid drinking the wine. By means of one pretext and another she put off taking her glass for nearly five minutes, but he eyed her too frequently to allow her to throw the potion under the grate. It became necessary to take one sip. This she did, and found an opportunity of absorbing it in her handkerchief. Plainly he had no idea of her counter-moves. The scheme seemed to him in proper train, and he turned to poke out the fire. She instantly seized the glass, and poured its contents down her bosom. When he faced round again she was holding the glass to her lips, empty. In due course he locked the doors and saw that the shutters were fastened. She attended to a few closing details of housewifery, and a few minutes later they retired for the night. From eleven o'clock to midnight. When Manston was persuaded, by the faint heaviness of her breathing, that Anne Seaway was asleep, he softly arose, and dressed himself in the gloom. With ears strained to their utmost she heard him complete this operation, then he took something from his pocket, put it in the drawer of the dressing table, went to the door, and down the stairs. She glided out of bed and looked in the drawer. He had only restored to its place a small phial she had seen there before. It was labeled Batley's solution of opium. She felt relieved that her life had not been attempted. That was to have been her sleeping draft. No time was to be lost if she meant to be a match for him. She followed him in her nightdress. When she reached the foot of the staircase he was in the office and had closed the door, under which a faint gleam showed that he had obtained a light. She crept to the door, but could not venture to open it, however slightly. Placing her ear to the panel, she could hear him tearing up papers of some sort, and a brighter and quivering ray of light coming from the threshold an instant later, implied that he was burning them. By the slight noise of his footsteps on the uncarpeted floor, she at length imagined that he was approaching the door. She flitted upstairs again and crept into bed. Manston returned to the bedroom close upon her heels, and entered it again without a light. Standing motionless for an instant to assure himself that she still slept, he went to the drawer in which their ready money was kept, and removed the casket that contained it. Anne's ear distinctly caught the rustle of notes, and the chink of the gold as he handled it. Some he placed in his pocket, 
some he returned to its place. He stood thinking, as it were weighing a possibility. While lingering thus, he noticed the reflected image of his own face in the glass pale and spectre-like in its indistinctness. The sight seemed to be the feather which turned the balance of indecision, he drew a heavy breath, retired from the room, and passed downstairs. She heard him unbar the back door, and go out into the yard. Feeling safe in a conclusion that he did not intend to return to the bedroom again, she arose, and hastily dressed herself. On going to the door of the apartment she found that he had locked it behind him. A precaution it can be no more, she muttered. Yet she was all the more perplexed and excited on this account. Had he been going to leave home immediately, he would scarcely have taken the trouble to lock her in, holding the belief that she was in a drugged sleep. The lock shot into a mortise, so that there was no possibility of her pushing back the bolt. How should she follow him? Easily. An inner closet opened from the bedroom, it was large, and had some time heretofore been used as a dressing or bathroom, but had been found inconvenient from having no other outlet to the landing. The window of this little room looked out upon the roof of the porch, which was flat and covered with lead. Anne took a pillow from the bed, gently opened the casement of the inner room and stepped forth on the flat. There, leaning over the edge of the small parapet that ornamented the porch, she dropped the pillow upon the gravel path, and let herself down over the parapet by her hands till her toes swung about two feet from the ground. From this position she adroitly alighted upon the pillow, and stood in the path. Since she had come indoors from her walk in the early part of the evening the moon had risen. But the thick clouds overspreading the whole landscape rendered the dim light pervasive and grey, it appeared as an attribute of the air. Anne crept round to the back of the house, listening intently. The steward had had at least ten minutes start of her. She had waited here whilst one might count fifty, when she heard a movement in the outhouse a fragment once attached to the main building. This outhouse was partitioned into an outer and an inner room, which had been a kitchen and a scullery before the connecting erections were pulled down, but they were now used respectively as a brewhouse and workshop, the only means of access to the latter being through the brewhouse. The outer door of this first apartment was usually fastened by a padlock on the exterior. It was now closed, but not fastened. Manston was evidently in the outhouse. She slightly moved the door. The interior of the brewhouse was wrapped in gloom, but a streak of light fell towards her in a line across the floor from the inner or workshop door, which was not quite closed. This light was unexpected, none having been visible through hole or crevice. Glancing in, the woman found that he had placed cloths and mats at the various apertures, and hung a sack at the window to prevent the egress of a single ray. She could also perceive from where she stood that the bar of light fell across the brewing copper just outside the inner door, and that upon it lay the key of her bedroom. The illuminated interior of the workshop was also partly visible from her position through the two half-open doors. Manston was engaged in emptying a large cupboard of the tools, golly pots, and old iron it contained. When it was quite cleared he took a chisel, and with it began to withdraw the hooks and shoulder nails holding the cupboard to the wall. All these being loosened, he extended his arms, lifted the cupboard bodily from the brackets under it, and deposited it on the floor beside him. That portion of the wall which had been screened by the cupboard was now laid bare. This, it appeared, had been plastered more recently than the bulk of the outhouse. Manston loosened the plaster with some kind of tool, flinging the pieces into a basket as they fell. Having now stripped clear about two feet area of wall, he inserted a crowbar between the joints of the bricks beneath, softly wriggling it until several were loosened. There was now disclosed the mouth of an old oven, which was apparently contrived in the thickness of the wall, and having fallen into disuse, had been closed up with bricks in this manner. It was formed after the simple old-fashioned plan of oven building a mere oblate cavity without a flue. Manston now stretched his arm into the oven, dragged forth a heavy weight of great bulk, and let it slide to the ground. The woman who watched him could see the object plainly. It was a common corn sack, nearly full, and was tied at the mouth in the usual way. The steward had once or twice started up, as if he had heard sounds, and his motions now became more cat-like still. 
On a sudden he put out the light. Anne had made no noise, yet a foreign noise of some kind had certainly been made in the intervening portion of the house. She heard it. One of the rats, she thought. He seemed soon to recover from his alarm, but changed his tactics completely. He did not light his candle going on with his work in the dark. She had only sounds to go by now, and, judging as well as she could from these, he was piling up the bricks which closed the oven's mouth as they had been before he disturbed them. The query that had not left her brain all the interval of her inspection how should she get back into her bedroom again, now received a solution. Whilst he was replacing the cupboard, she would glide across the brew house, take the key from the top of the copper, run upstairs, unlock the door, and bring back the key again, if he returned to bed, which was unlikely, he would think the lock had failed to catch in the staple. This thought and intention, occupying such length of words, flashed upon her in an instant, and hardly disturbed her strong curiosity to stay and learn the meaning of his actions in the workshop. Slipping sideways through the first door and closing it behind her, she advanced into the darkness towards the second, making every individual footfall with the greatest care, lest the fragments of rubbish on the floor should crackle beneath her tread. She soon stood close by the copper, and not more than a foot from the door of the room occupied by Manston himself, from which position she could distinctly hear him breathe between each exertion, although it was far too dark to discern anything of him. To secure the key of her chamber was her first anxiety, and accordingly she cautiously reached out with her hand to where it lay. Instead of touching it, her fingers came in contact with the boot of a human being. She drooped faint in a cold sweat. It was the foot either of a man or woman, standing on the brewing copper where the key had lain. A warm foot, covered with a polished boot. The startling discovery so terrified her that she could hardly repress a sound. She withdrew her hand with a motion like the flight of an arrow. Her touch was so light that the leather seemed to have been thick enough to keep the owner of the foot in entire ignorance of it, and the noise of Manston's scraping might have been quite sufficient to drown the slight rustle of her dress. The person was obviously not the steward, he was still busy. It was somebody who, since the light had been extinguished, had taken advantage of the gloom, to come from some dark recess in the brewhouse and stand upon the brickwork of the copper. The fear which had at first paralyzed her lessened with the birth of a sense that fear now was utter failure, she was in a desperate position and must abide by the consequences. The motionless person on the copper was, equally with Manston, quite unconscious of her proximity, and she ventured to advance her hand again, feeling behind the feet, till she found the key. On its return to her side, her fingertip schemed the lower verge of a trouser's leg. It was a man, then, who stood there. To go to the door just at this time was impolitic, and she shrank back into an inner corner to wait. The comparative security from discovery that her new position ensured resuscitated reason a little, and empowered her to form some logical inferences. The man who stood on the copper had taken advantage of the darkness to get there, as she had to enter. The man must have been hidden in the outhouse before she had reached the door. He must be watching Manston with much calculation and system, and for purposes of his own. She could now tell by the noises that Manston had completed his re-erection of the cupboard. She heard him replacing the articles it had contained bottle by bottle, tool by tool after which he came into the brew house, went to the window, and pulled down the cloths covering it, but the window being rather small, this unveiling scarcely relieved the darkness of the interior. He returned to the workshop, hoisted something to his back by a jerk, and felt about the room for some other article. Having found it, he emerged from the inner door, crossed the brew house, and went into the yard. Directly he stepped out she could see his outline by the light of the clouded and weakly moon. The sack was slung at his back, and in his hand he carried a spade. Anne now waited in her corner in breathless suspense for the proceedings of the other man. In about half a minute she heard him descend from the copper, and then the square opening of the doorway showed the outline of this other watcher passing through it likewise. The form was that of a broad-shouldered man enveloped in a long coat. He vanished after the steward. The woman vented a sigh of relief, and moved forward to follow. Simultaneously, 
she discovered that the watcher whose foot she had touched was, in his turn, watched and followed also. It was by one of her own sex. Anne Seaway shrank backward again. The unknown woman came forward from the further side of the yard, and pondered a while in hesitation. Tall, dark, and closely wrapped, she stood up from the earth like a cypress. She moved, crossed the yard without producing the slightest disturbance by her footsteps, and went in the direction the others had taken. Anne waited yet another minute then in her turn noiselessly followed the last woman. But so impressed was she with the sensation of people in hiding, that in coming out of the yard she turned her head to see if any person were following her, in the same way. Nobody was visible, but she discerned, standing behind the angle of the stable, Manston's horse and gig, ready harnessed. He did intend to fly after all, then, she thought. He must have placed the horse in readiness, in the interval between his leaving the house and her exit by the window. However, there was not time to weigh this branch of the night's events. She turned about again, and continued on the trail of the other three. From midnight to half past one a.m. Intentness pervaded everything, night herself seemed to have become a watcher. The four persons proceeded across the glade, and into the park plantation, at equidistances of about seventy yards. Here the ground, completely overhung by the foliage, was coated with a thick moss which was as soft as velvet beneath their feet. The first watcher, that is, the man walking immediately behind Manston, now fell back, when Manston's housekeeper, knowing the ground pretty well, dived circuitously among the trees and got directly behind the steward, who, encumbered with his load, had proceeded but slowly. The other woman seemed now to be about opposite to Anne, or a little in advance, but on Manston's other hand. He reached a pit, midway between the waterfall and the engine house. There he stopped, wiped his face, and listened. Into this pit had drifted uncounted generations of withered leaves, half filling it. Oak, beech, and chestnut, rotten and brown alike, mingled themselves in one fibrous mass. Manston descended into the midst of them, placed his sack on the ground, and raking the leaves aside into a large heap, began digging. Anne softly drew nearer, crept into a bush, and turning her head to survey the rest, missed the man who had dropped behind, and whom we have called the first watcher. Concluding that he, too, had hidden himself, she turned her attention to the second watcher, the other woman, who had meanwhile advanced near to where Anne lay in hiding, and now seated herself behind a tree, still closer to the steward than was Anne Seaway. Here and thus Anne remained concealed. The crunch of the steward's spade, as it cut into the soft vegetable mold, was plainly perceptible to her ears when the periodic cessations between the creaks of the engine concurred with a lull in the breeze, which otherwise brought the subdued roar of the cascade from the further side of the bank that screened it. A large hole some four or five feet deep had been excavated by Manston in about twenty minutes. Into this he immediately placed the sack, and then began filling in the earth, and treading it down. Lastly he carefully raked the whole mass of dead and dry leaves into the middle of the pit, burying the ground with them as they had buried it before. For a hiding place the spot was unequalled. The thick accumulation of leaves, which had not been disturbed for centuries, might not be disturbed again for centuries to come, whilst their lower layers still decayed and added to the mold beneath. By the time this work was ended the sky had grown clearer, and Anne could now see distinctly the face of the other woman, stretching from behind the tree, seemingly forgetful of her position in her intense contemplation of the actions of the steward. Her countenance was white and motionless. It was impossible that Manston should not soon notice her. At the completion of his labor he turned, and did so. Ho oh, you here he exclaimed. Don't think I am a spy upon you, she said, in an imploring whisper. Anne recognized the voice as Miss Aldclyffe's. The trembling lady added hastily another remark, which was drowned in the recurring creak of the engine close at hand the first watcher, if he had come no nearer than his original position, was too far off to hear any part of this dialogue, on account of the roar of the falling water, which could reach him unimpeded by the bank. The remark of Miss Aldclyffe to Manston had plainly been concerning the first watcher, for Manston, with his spade in his hand, 
instantly rushed to where the man was concealed, and, before the latter could disengage himself from the bows, the steward struck him on the head with the blade of the instrument. The man fell to the ground. Fly said Miss Aldclyffe to Manston. Manston vanished amidst the trees. Miss Aldclyffe went off in a contrary direction. Anne Seaway was about to run away likewise, when she turned and looked at the fallen man. He lay on his face, motionless. Many of these women who own to no moral code show considerable magnanimity when they see people in trouble. To act right simply because it is one's duty is proper, but a good action which is the result of no law of reflection shines more than any. She went up to him and gently turned him over, upon which he began to show signs of life. By her assistance he was soon able to stand upright. He looked about him with a bewildered air, endeavouring to collect his ideas. Who are you? he said to the woman, mechanically. It was bad policy now to attempt disguise. I am the supposed Mrs. Manston, she said. Who are you? I am the officer employed by Mr. Ronham to sift this mystery which may be criminal. He stretched his limbs, pressed his head, and seemed gradually to awake to a sense of having been incautious in his utterance. Never you mind who I am, he continued. Well, it doesn't matter now, either it will no longer be a secret. He stooped for his hat and ran in the direction the steward had taken coming back again after the lapse of a minute. It's only an aggravated assault, after all, he said hastily, until we have found out for certain what's buried here. It may be only a bag of building rubbish, but it may be more. Come and help me dig. He seized the spade with the awkwardness of a town man, and went into the pit, continuing a muttered discourse. It's no use my running after him single-handed, he said. He's ever so far off by this time. The best step is to see what is here. It was far easier for the detective to reopen the hole than it had been for Manston to form it. The leaves were raked away, the loam thrown out, and the sack dragged forth. Hold this, he said to Anne, whose curiosity still kept her standing near. He turned on the light of a dark lantern he had brought and gave it into her hand. The string which bound the mouth of the sack was now cut. The officer laid the bag on its side, seized it by the bottom, and jerked forth the contents. A large package was disclosed, carefully wrapped up in impervious tarpaulin, also well tied. He was on the point of pulling open the folds at one end, when a light-colored thread of something, hanging on the outside, arrested his eye. He put his hand upon it it felt stringy, and adhered to his fingers. Hold the light close, he said. She held it close. He raised his hand to the glass, and they both peered at an almost intangible filament he held between his finger and thumb. It was a long hair, the hair of a woman. God I couldn't believe it no, I couldn't believe it the detective whispered, horror struck. And I have lost the man for the present through my unbelief. Let's get into a sheltered place. Now wait a minute whilst I prove it. He thrust his hand into his waistcoat pocket, and withdrew thence a minute packet of brown paper. Spreading it out he disclosed, coiled in the middle, another long hair. It was the hair the clerk's wife had found on Manston's pillow nine days before the Carry Ford fire. He held the two hairs to the light, they were both of a pale brown hue. He laid them parallel and stretched out his arms they were of the same length to a nicety. The detective turned to Anne. It is the body of his first wife, he said quietly. He murdered her, as Mr. Springrove and the rector suspected but how and when, God only knows. And I exclaimed Anne Seaway, a probable and natural sequence of events and motives explanatory of the whole crime events and motives shadowed forth by the letter, Manston's possession of it, his renunciation of Cytherea an installment of herself flashing upon her mind with the rapidity of lightning. Ah I see, said the detective, standing unusually close to her, and a handcuff was on her wrist. You must come with me, madam. Knowing as much about a secret murder as God knows is a very suspicious thing, it doesn't make you a god as far from it. He directed the bull's eye into her face. Pull lead on, she said scornfully and don't lose your principal actor for the sake of torturing a poor subordinate like me. 
he loosened her hand, gave her his arm, and dragged her out of the grove making her run beside him till they had reached the rectory. A light was burning here, and an auxiliary of the detectives awaiting him, a horse-ready harness to a spring cart was standing outside. You have come I wish I had known that, the detective said to his assistant, hurriedly and angrily. Well, we've blundered he's gone you should have been here, as I said I was sold by that woman, Miss Aldclyffe she watched me. He hastily gave directions in an undertone to this man. The concluding words were, go into the rector he's up. Detain Miss Aldclyffe. I, in the meantime, am driving to Casterbridge with this one, and for help. We shall be sure to have him when it gets light. He assisted Anne into the vehicle, and drove off with her. As they went, the clear, dry road showed before them, between the grassy quarters at each side, like a white riband, and made their progress easy. They came to a spot where the highway was overhung by dense firs for some distance on both sides. It was totally dark here. There was a smash, and a rude shock. In the very midst of its length, at the point where the road began to drop down a hill, the detective drove against something with a jerk which nearly flung them both to the ground. The man recovered himself, placed Anne on the seat, and reached out his hand. He found that the off-wheel of his gig was locked in that of another conveyance of some kind. Hoy said the officer. Nobody answered. Hoy, you man asleep there he said again. No reply. Well, that's odd this comes of the folly of traveling without gig lamps because you expect the dawn. He jumped to the ground and turned on his lantern. There was the gig which had obstructed him, standing in the middle of the road, a jaded horse harnessed to it but no human being in or near the vehicle. Do you know whose gig this is, he said to the woman. No, she said sullenly. But she did recognize it as the steward's. I'll swear it's Manston's come, I can hear it by your tone. However, you needn't say anything which may criminate you. What forethought the man must have had how carefully he must have considered possible contingencies why? he must have got the horse and gig ready before he began shifting the body. He listened for a sound among the trees. None was to be heard but the occasional scamper of a rabbit over the withered leaves. He threw the light of his lantern through a gap in the hedge, but could see nothing beyond an impenetrable thicket. It was clear that Manston was not many yards off, but the question was how to find him. Nothing could be done by the detective just then, encumbered as he was by the horse and Anne. If he had entered the thicket on a search unaided, Manston might have stepped unobserved from behind a bush and murdered him with the greatest ease. Indeed, there were such strong reasons for the exploit in Manston's circumstances at that moment that without showing cowardice, his pursuer felt it hazardous to remain any longer where he stood. He hastily tied the head of Manston's horse to the back of his own vehicle, that the steward might be deprived of the use of any means of escape other than his own legs and drove on thus with his prisoner to the county town. Arrived there, he lodged her in the police station, and then took immediate steps for the capture of Manston. XX The events of three hours. March the 23rd. Midday. Thirty-six hours had elapsed since Manston's escape. It was market day at the county town. The farmers outside and inside the corn exchange looked at their samples of wheat, and poured them critically as usual from one palm to another, but they thought and spoke of Manston. Grocers serving behind their counters, instead of using their constant phrase, the next article, please, substituted, have you heard if he's caught? Dairymen and drovers standing beside the sheep and cattle pens, spread their legs firmly, readjusted their hats, thrust their hands into the lowest depths of their pockets, regarded the animals with the utmost keenness of which the eye was capable, and said, I, I, so's, they'll have him of or night. Later in the day Edward Springrove passed along the street hurriedly and anxiously. Well, have you heard any more, he said to an acquaintance who accosted him. They tracked him in this way, said the other young man. A vagrant first told them that Manston had passed a rick at daybreak, under which this man was lying. They followed the track he pointed out and ultimately came to a stile. On the other side was a heap of half-hardened mud, scraped from the road. On the surface of the heap, 
where it had been smoothed by the shovel, was distinctly imprinted the form of a man's hand, the buttons of his waistcoat, and his watch chain, showing that he had stumbled in hurrying over the stile, and fallen there. The pattern of the chain proved the man to have been Manston. They followed on till they reached a ford crossed by stepping stones on the further bank were the same footmarks that had shown themselves beside the stile. The whole of this course had been in the direction of Budmouth. On they went, and the next clue was furnished them by a shepherd. He said that wherever a clear space three or four yards wide ran in a line through a flock of sheep lying about a ewe lease, it was a proof that somebody had passed there not more than half an hour earlier. At twelve o'clock that day he had noticed such a feature in his flock. Nothing more could be heard of him, and they got into Budmouth. The steam packet to the Channel Islands was to start at eleven last night, and they at once concluded that his hope was to get to France by way of Jersey and St. Malo his only chance, all the railway stations being watched. Well, they went to the boat, he was not on board then. They went again at half past ten, he had not come. Two men now placed themselves under the lamp immediately beside the gangway. Another stayed by the office door, and one or two more up Mary Street the straight cut to the quay. At a quarter to eleven the mail bags were put on board. Whilst the attention of the idlers was directed to the mails, down Mary Street came a man as boldly as possible. The gate was Manston's, but not the clothes. He passed over to the shaded part of the street, heads were turned. I suppose this warned him, for he never emerged from the shadow. They watched and waited, but the steward did not reappear. The alarm was raised they searched the town high and low no Manston. All this morning they have been searching, but there's not a sign of him anywhere. However, he has lost his last chance of getting across the channel. It is reported that he has since changed clothes with a laborer. During this narration, Edward, lost in thought, had let his eyes follow a shabby man in a smock frock, but wearing light boots who was stalking down the street under a bundle of straw which overhung and concealed his head. It was a very ordinary circumstance for a man with a bundle of straw on his shoulders and overhanging his head, to go down the high street. Edward saw him cross the bridge which divided the town from the country, place his shaggy encumbrance by the side of the road, and leave it there. Spring Grove now parted from his acquaintance, and went also in the direction of the bridge, and some way beyond it. As far as he could see stretched the turnpike road, and, while he was looking, he noticed a man to leap from the hedge at a point two hundred, or two hundred and fifty yards ahead, cross the road, and go through a wicket on the other side. This figure seemed like that of the man who had been carrying the bundle of straw. He looked at the straw, it still stood alone. The subjoined facts sprang, as it were, into juxtaposition in his brain. Manston had been seen wearing the clothes of a laboring man a brown smock frock. So had this man, who seemed other than a laborer, on second thoughts, and he had concealed his face by his bundle of straw with the greatest ease and naturalness. The path the man had taken led, among other places, to Tollchurch, where Cytheria was living. If Mrs. Manston was murdered, as some said, on the night of the fire, Cytheria was the steward's lawful wife. Manston at bay, and reckless of results, might rush to his wife and harm her. It was a horrible supposition for a man who loved Cytheria to entertain, but Spring Grove could not resist its influence. He started off for Tollchurch. 1 to 2 o'clock p.m. On that self-same midday, whilst Edward was proceeding to Tollchurch by the footpath across the fields, Owen Gray had left the village and was riding along the turnpike road to the county town, that he might ascertain the exact truth of the strange rumor which had reached him concerning Manston. Not to disquiet his sister, he had said nothing to her of the matter. She sat by the window reading. From her position she could see up the lane for a distance of at least a hundred yards. Passers-by were so rare in this retired nook, that the eyes of those who dwelt by the wayside were invariably lifted to every one on the road, great and small, as to a novelty. A man in a brown smock frock turned the corner and came towards the house. It being market day at Casterbridge, the village was nearly deserted, and more than this, the old farmhouse in which Owen and his sister were staying, stood, as has been stated, 
apart from the body of cottages. The man did not look respectable, Cytheria arose and bolted the door. Unfortunately he was near enough to see her cross the room. He advanced to the door, knocked, and, receiving no answer, came to the window, he next pressed his face against the glass, peering in. Cytheria's experience at that moment was probably as trying a one as ever fell to the lot of a gentlewoman to endure. She recognized in the peering face that of the man she had married. But not a movement was made by her, not a sound escaped her. Her fear was great, but had she known the truth that the man outside, feeling he had nothing on earth to lose by any act, was in the last stage of recklessness, terrified nature must have given way. Cytheria, he said. Let me come in, I am your husband. No, she replied, still not realizing the magnitude of her peril. If you want to speak to us, wait till my brother comes. Oh, he's not at home. Cytheria, I can't live without you all my sin has been because I love you so will you fly with me? I have money enough for us both only come with me. Not now not now. I am your husband, I tell you and I must come in. You cannot, she said faintly. His words began to terrify her. I will, I say he exclaimed. Will you let me in, I ask once more. No I will not, said Cytheria. Then I will let myself in he answered resolutely. I will, if I die for it. The windows were glazed in lattice panes of lead work, hung in casements. He broke one of the panes with a stone, thrust his hand through the hole, unfastened the latch which held the casement close, and began opening the window. Instantly the shutters flew together with a slam, and were barred with desperate quickness by Cytheria on the inside. Damn you he exclaimed. He ran round to the back of the house. His impatience was greater now, he thrust his fist through the pantry window at one blow, and opened it in the same way as the former one had been opened before the terror-stricken girl was aware that he had gone round. In an instant he stood in the pantry, advanced to the front room where she was, flung back the shutters, and held out his arms to embrace her. In extremely trying moments of bodily or mental pain, Cytheria either flushed hot or faded pale, according to the state of her constitution at the moment. Now she burned like fire from head to foot, and this preserved her consciousness. Never before had the poor child's natural agility served her in such good stead as now. A heavy oblong table stood in the middle of the room. Round this table she flew, keeping it between herself and Manston, her large eyes wide open with terror, their dilated pupils constantly fixed upon Manston's, to read by his expression whether his next intention was to dart to the right or the left. Even he, at that heated moment, could not endure the expression of unutterable agony which shone from that extraordinary gaze of hers. It had surely been given her by God as a means of defense. Manston continued his pursuit with a lowered eye. The panting and maddened desperado blind to everything but the capture of his wife went with a rush under the table, she went over it like a bird. He went heavily over it, she flew under it, and was out at the other side. One on her youth and pliant limbs relies. One on his sinews and his giant size. But his superior strength was sure to tire her down in the long run. She felt her weakness increasing with the quickness of her breath, she uttered a wild scream, which in its heart-rending intensity seemed to echo for miles. At the same juncture her hair became unfastened, and rolled down about her shoulders. The least accident at such critical periods is sufficient to confuse the overwrought intelligence. She lost sight of his intended direction for one instant, and he immediately outman overed her. At last my Cytheria he cried, overturning the table, springing over it, seizing one of the long brown tresses, pulling her towards him, and clasping her round. She writhed downwards between his arms and breast, and fell fainting on the floor. For the first time his action was leisurely. He lifted her upon the sofa, exclaiming, Rest there for a while, my frightened little bird. And then there was an end of his triumph. He felt himself clutched by the collar, and whizzed backwards with the force of a battering ram against the fireplace. Springgrove, wild, red, and breathless, had sprung in at the open window, 
and stood once more between man and wife. Manston was on his legs again in an instant. A fiery glance on the one side, a glance of pitiless justice on the other, passed between them. It was again the meeting in the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, Hast thou found me, O mine enemy? And he answered, I have found thee, because thou hast sold thyself to work evil in the sight of the Lord. A desperate wrestle now began between the two men. Manston was the taller, but there was in Edward much hard tough muscle which the delicate flesh of the steward lacked. They flew together like the jaws of a gin. In a minute they were both on the floor, rolling over and over, locked in each other's grasp as tightly as if they had been one organic being at war with itself Edward trying to secure Manston's arms with a small thong he had drawn from his pocket, Manston trying to reach his knife. Two characteristic noises pervaded the apartment through this momentous space of time. One was the sharp panting of the two combatants, so similar in each as to be undistinguishable, the other was the stroke of their heels and toes, as they smote the floor at every contortion of body or limbs. Cytheria had not lost consciousness for more than half a minute. She had then leapt up without recognizing that Edward was her deliverer, unfastened the door, and rushed out, screaming wildly, Come help oh, help! Three men stood not twenty yards off, looking perplexed. They dashed forward at her words. Have you seen a shabby man with a smock frock on lately? they inquired. She pointed to the door, and ran on the same as before. Manston, who had just loosened himself from Edward's grasp, seemed at this moment to renounce his intention of pushing the conflict to a desperate end. I give it all up for life dear life he cried, with a hoarse laugh. A reckless man has a dozen lives see how I'll baffle you all yet. He rushed out of the house, but no further. The boast was his last. In one half minute more he was helpless in the hands of his pursuers. Edward staggered to his feet, and paused to recover breath. His thoughts had never forsaken Cytherea, and his first act now was to hasten up the lane after her. She had not gone far. He found her leaning upon a bank by the roadside, where she had flung herself down in sheer exhaustion. He ran up and lifted her in his arms, and thus aided she was enabled to stand upright clinging to him. What would Springgrove have given to imprint a kiss upon her lips then? They walked slowly towards the house. The distressing sensation of whose wife she was could not entirely quench the resuscitated pleasure he felt at her grateful recognition of him and her confiding seizure of his arm for support. He conveyed her carefully into the house. A quarter of an hour later, whilst she was sitting in a partially recovered, half-dozing state in an armchair, Edward beside her waiting anxiously till Grey should arrive, they saw a spring cart pass the door. Old and dry mud splashes from long-forgotten rains disfigured its wheels and sides, the varnish and paint had been scratched and dimmed, Ornament had long been forgotten in a restless contemplation of use. Three men sat on the seat, the middle one being Manston. His hands were bound in front of him, his eyes were set directly forward, his countenance pallid, hard, and fixed. Springgrove had told Cytherea of Manston's crime in a few short words. He now said solemnly, He is to die. And I cannot mourn for him, she replied with a shudder leaning back and covering her face with her hands. In the silence that followed the two short remarks, Springgrove watched the cart round the corner, and heard the rattle of its wheels gradually dying away as it rolled in the direction of the county town. XXI The Events of 18 Hours March the 29th Noon Exactly seven days after Edward Springgrove had seen the man with the bundle of straw walking down the streets of Casterbridge, Old Farmer Springgrove was standing on the edge of the same pavement, talking to his friend, Farmer Baker. There was a pause in their discourse. Mr. Springgrove was looking down the street at some object which had attracted his attention. Ah, tis what we shall all come to he murmured. The other looked in the same direction. True, neighbor Springgrove, true. Two men, advancing one behind the other in the middle of the road were what the farmers referred to. They were carpenters, and bore on their shoulders an empty coffin, covered by a thin black cloth. I always feel a satisfaction at being breasted by such a sight as that, said Springgrove, 
still regarding the men's sad burden. I call it a sort of medicine. And it is medicine. I have not heard of anybody being ill up this way lately. D seem as if the person died suddenly. Maybe so. Ah, Baker, we say sudden death, don't we? But there's no difference in their nature between sudden death and death of any other sort. There's no such thing as a random snapping off of what was laid down to last longer. We only suddenly light upon an end thoughtfully formed as any other which has been existing at that very same point from the beginning, though unseen by us to be so soon. It is just a discovery to your own mind, and not an alteration in the Lord's. That's it. Unexpected is not as to the thing, but as to our sight. Now you'll hardly believe me, neighbor, but this little scene in front of us makes me feel less anxious about pushing on W.I. that threshing and winnowing next week, that I was speaking about. Why should we not stand still, says I to myself, and fling a quiet eye upon the whys and the wherefores, before the end o' oh it all, and we go down into the mouldering place, and are forgotten. Tis a feeling that will come. But twon't bear looking into. There's a backyard current in the world, and we must do our utmost to advance in order just to bide where we be. But, Baker, they are turning in here with the coffin, look. The two carpenters had borne their load into a narrow way close at hand. The farmers, in common with others, turned and watched them along the way. Tis a man's coffin, and a tall man's, too, continued Farmer Springrove. His was a fine frame, whoever he was. A very plain box for the poor soul just the rough elm, you see. The corner of the cloth had blown aside. Yes, for a very poor man. Well, death's all the less insult to him. I have often thought how much smaller the richer class are made to look than the poor at last pinches like this. Perhaps the greatest of all the reconcilers of a thoughtful man to poverty and I speak from experience is the grand quiet it fills him with when the uncertainty of his life shows itself more than usual. As Springrove finished speaking, the bearers of the coffin went across a graveled square facing the two men and approached a grim and heavy archway. They paused beneath it, rang a bell, and waited. Over the archway was written in Egyptian capitals. County Jail the small rectangular wicket, which was constructed in one of the two iron-studded doors, was opened from the inside. The men severally stepped over the threshold, the coffin dragged its melancholy length through the aperture, and both entered the court, and were covered from sight. Somebody in the jail, then. Yes, one of the prisoners, said a boy, scudding by at the moment, who passed on whistling. Do you know the name of the man who is dead? inquired Baker of a third bystander. Yes, tis all over town surely you know, Mr. Springrove? Why, Manston, Miss Aldclyffe's steward. He was found dead the first thing this morning. He had hung himself behind the door of his cell, in some way, by a handkerchief and some strips of his clothes. The turnkey says his features were scarcely changed, as he looked at M with the early sun a shining in at the grating upon him. He has left a full account of the murder, and all that led to it. So there's an end of him. It was perfectly true, Manston was dead. The previous day he had been allowed the use of writing materials, and had occupied himself for nearly seven hours in preparing the following confession. Last words. Having found man's life to be a wretchedly conceived scheme, I renounce it, and, to cause no further trouble, I write down the facts connected with my past proceedings. After thanking God, on first entering my house, on the night of the fire at Carryford, for my release from bondage to a woman I detested, I went, a second time, to the scene of the disaster, and, finding that nothing could be done by remaining there, shortly afterwards I returned home again in the company of Mr. Ronham. He parted from me at the steps of my porch, and went back towards the rectory. Whilst I still stood at the door, musing on my strange deliverance, I saw a figure advance from beneath the shadow of the park trees. It was the figure of a woman. When she came near, the twilight was sufficient to show me her attire, it was a cloak reaching to the bottom of her dress, and a thick veil covering her face. These features, together with her size and gait, 
aided also by a flash of perception as to the chain of events which had saved her life, told me that she was my wife Eunice. I gnashed my teeth in a frenzy of despair, I had lost Cytherea, I had gained one whose beauty had departed, whose utterance was complaint, whose mind was shallow, and who drank brandy every day. The revulsion of feeling was terrible. Providence, whom I had just thanked, seemed a mocking tormentor laughing at me. I felt like a madman. She came close started at seeing me outside then spoke to me. Her first words were reproof for what I had unintentionally done, and sounded as an earnest of what I was to be cursed with as long as we both lived. I answered angrily, this tone of mine changed her complaints to irritation. She taunted me with a secret she had discovered, which concerned Miss Aldclyffe and myself. I was surprised to learn it more surprised that she knew it, but concealed my feeling. How could you serve me so, she said, her breath smelling of spirits even then. You love another woman yes, you do. See how you drive me about I have been to the station, intending to leave you forever, and yet I come to try you once more. An indescribable exasperation had sprung up in me as she talked rage and regret were all in all. Scarcely knowing what I did, I furiously raised my hand and swung it round with my whole force to strike her. She turned quickly and it was the poor creature's end. By her movement my hand came edgewise exactly in the nape of the neck as men strike a hare to kill it. The effect staggered me with amazement. The blow must have disturbed the vertebrae, she fell at my feet made a few movements, and uttered one low sound. I ran indoors for water and some wine, I came out and lanced her arm with my penknife. But she lay still, and I found that she was dead. It was a long time before I could realize my horrible position. For several minutes I had no idea of attempting to escape the consequences of my deed. Then a light broke upon me. Had anybody seen her since she left the three tranters? Had they not? she was already believed by the parishioners to be dust and ashes. I should never be found out. Upon this I acted. The first question was how to dispose of the body. The impulse of the moment was to bury her at once in the pit between the engine house and waterfall, but it struck me that I should not have time. It was now four o'clock, and the working men would soon be stirring about the place. I would put off burying her till the next night. I carried her indoors. In turning the outhouse into a workshop, earlier in the season, I found, when driving a nail into the wall for fixing a cupboard, that the wall sounded hollow. I examined it, and discovered behind the plaster an old oven which had long been disused, and was bricked up when the house was prepared for me. To unfix this cupboard and pull out the bricks was the work of a few minutes. Then, bearing in mind that I should have to remove the body again the next night, I placed it in a sack pushed it into the oven, packed in the bricks, and replaced the cupboard. I then went to bed. In bed, I thought whether there were any very remote possibilities that might lead to the supposition that my wife was not consumed by the flames of the burning house. The thing which struck me most forcibly was this, that the searchers might think it odd that no remains whatever should be found. The clinching and triumphant deed would be to take the body and place it among the ruins of the destroyed house. But I could not do this, on account of the men who were watching against an outbreak of the fire. One remedy remained. I arose again, dressed myself, and went down to the outhouse. I must take down the cupboard again. I did take it down. I pulled out the bricks, pulled out the sack, pulled out the corpse, and took her keys from her pocket and the watch from her side. I then replaced everything as before. With these articles in my pocket I went out of the yard, and took my way through the withy copse to the churchyard, entering it from the back. Here I felt my way carefully along till I came to the nook where pieces of bones from newly dug graves are sometimes piled behind the laurel bushes. I had been earnestly hoping to find a skull among these old bones, but though I had frequently seen one or two in the rubbish here, there was not one now. I then groped in the other corner with the same result nowhere could I find a skull. Three or four fragments of leg and backbones were all I could collect, and with these I was forced to be content. Taking them in my hand, I crossed the road, and got round behind the inn, where the couch heap was still smoldering. 
Keeping behind the hedge, I could see the heads of the three or four men who watched the spot. Standing in this place I took the bones, and threw them one by one over the hedge and over the men's heads into the smoking embers. When the bones had all been thrown, I threw the keys, last of all I threw the watch. I then returned home as I had gone, and went to bed once more, just as the dawn began to break. I exulted Cytherea is mine again. At breakfast time I thought, suppose the cupboard should by some unlikely chance get moved today. I went to the mason's yard hard by, while the men were at breakfast, and brought away a shovelful of mortar. I took it into the outhouse, again shifted the cupboard, and plastered over the mouth of the oven behind. Simply pushing the cupboard back into its place, I waited for the next night that I might bury the body, though upon the whole it was in a tolerably safe hiding place. When the night came, my nerves were in some way weaker than they had been on the previous night. I felt reluctant to touch the body. I went to the outhouse, but instead of opening the oven, I firmly drove in the shoulder nails that held the cupboard to the wall. I will bury her tomorrow night, however, I thought. But the next night I was still more reluctant to touch her. And my reluctance increased, and there the body remained. The oven was, after all, never likely to be opened in my time. I married Cytherea Gray, and never did a bridegroom leave the church with a heart more full of love and happiness, and a brain more fixed on good intentions, than I did on that morning. When Cytherea's brother made his appearance at the hotel in Southampton, bearing his strange evidence of the porter's disclosure, I was staggered beyond expression. I thought they had found the body. Am I to be apprehended and to lose her even now? I mourned. I saw my error, and instantly saw, too, that I must act externally like an honorable man. So at his request I yielded her up to him, and meditated on several schemes for enabling me to claim the woman I had a legal right to claim as my wife, without disclosing the reason why I knew myself to have it. I went home to nap water the next day, and for nearly a week lived in a state of indecision. I could not hit upon a scheme for proving my wife dead without compromising myself. M. R. Ronham hinted that I should take steps to discover her whereabouts by advertising. I had no energy for the farce. But one evening I chanced to enter the Rising Sun Inn. Two notorious poachers were sitting in the settle, which screened my entrance. They were half drunk their conversation was carried on in the solemn and emphatic tone common to that stage of intoxication, and I myself was the subject of it. The following was the substance of their disjointed remarks. On the night of the great fire at Carryford, one of them was sent to meet me, and break the news of the death of my wife to me. This he did, but because I would not pay him for his news, he left me in a mood of vindictiveness. When the fire was over, he joined his comrade. The favorable hour of the night suggested to them the possibility of some unlawful gain before daylight came. My foul house stood in a tempting position, and still resenting his repulse during the evening, one of them proposed to operate upon my birds. I was believed to have gone to the rectory with Mr. Ronham. The other was disinclined to go, and the first went off alone. It was now about three o'clock. He had advanced as far as the shrubbery, which grows near the north wall of the house, when he fancied he heard, above the rush of the waterfall, noises on the other side of the building. He described them in these words, ghostly mouths talking then a fall then a groan then the rush of the water and creak of the engine as before. Only one explanation occurred to him, the house was haunted. And, whether those of the living or the dead, voices of any kind were inimical to one who had come on such an errand. He stealthily crept home. His unlawful purpose in being behind the house led him to conceal his adventure. No suspicion of the truth entered his mind till the railway porter had startled everybody by his strange announcement. Then he asked himself, had the horrifying sounds of that night been really an enactment in the flesh between me and my wife? The words of the other man were, Why don't he try to find her if she's alive? True, said the first. Well, I don't forget what I heard, and if she don't turn up alive my mind will be as sure as a Bible upon her murder and the parson shall know it, though I do get six months on the treadmill for being where I was. And if she should turn up alive. 
then I shall know that I am wrong, and believing myself a fool as well as a rogue, hold my tongue. I glided out of the house in a cold sweat. The only pressure in heaven or earth which could have forced me to renounce Cytherea was now put upon me the dread of a death upon the gallows. I sat all that night weaving strategy of various kinds. The only effectual remedy for my hazardous standing that I could see was a simple one. It was to substitute another woman for my wife before the suspicions of that one easily hoodwinked man extended further. The only difficulty was to find a practicable substitute. The one woman at all available for the purpose was a friendless, innocent creature, named Anne Seaway, whom I had known in my youth, and who had for some time been the housekeeper of a lady in London. On account of this lady's sudden death, Anne stood in rather a precarious position, as regarded her future subsistence. She was not the best kind of woman for the scheme, but there was no alternative. One quality of hers was valuable, she was not a talker. I went to London the very next day, called at the Hoxton lodging of my wife the only place at which she had been known as Mrs. Manston, and found that no great difficulties stood in the way of a personation. And thus favoring circumstances determined my course. I visited Anne Seaway, made love to her, and propounded my plan. We lived quietly enough until the Sunday before my apprehension. Anne came home from church that morning, and told me of the suspicious way in which a young man had looked at her there. Nothing could be done beyond waiting the issue of events. Then the letter came from Ronham. For the first time in my life I was half indifferent as to what fate awaited me. During the succeeding day I thought once or twice of running away, but could not quite make up my mind. At any rate it would be best to bury the body of my wife, I thought for the oven might be opened at any time. I went to Casterbridge and made some arrangements. In the evening Miss Aldclyffe who is united to me by a common secret which I have no right or wish to disclose came to my house, and alarmed me still more. She said that she could tell by Mr. Ronham's manner that evening, that he kept back from her a suspicion of more importance even than the one he spoke of, and that strangers were in his house even then. I guessed what this further suspicion was and resolved to enlighten her to a certain extent, and so secure her assistance. I said that I killed my wife by an accident on the night of the fire, dwelling upon the advantage to her of the death of the only woman who knew her secret. Her terror, and fears for my fate, led her to watch the rectory that evening. She saw the detective leave it, and followed him to my residence. This she told me hurriedly when I perceived her after digging my wife's grave in the plantation. She did not suspect what the sack contained. I am now about to enter on my normal condition. For people are almost always in their graves. When we survey the long race of men, it is strange and still more strange to find that they are mainly dead men, who have scarcely ever been otherwise. Aeneas Manston The steward's confession, aided by circumstantial evidence of various kinds, was the means of freeing both Anne Seaway and Miss Aldclyffe from all suspicion of complicity with the murderer. 6 o'clock p.m. It was evening just at sunset on the day of Manston's death. In the cottage at Tollchurch was gathered a group consisting of Cytherea, her brother, Edward Springrove, and his father. They sat by the window conversing of the strange events which had just taken place. In Cytherea's eye there beamed a hopeful ray, though her face was as white as a lily. Whilst they talked, looking out at the yellow evening light that coated the hedges, trees, and church tower, a brougham rolled round the corner of the lane, and came in full view. It reflected the rays of the sun in a flash from its polished panels as it turned the angle, the spokes of the wheels bristling in the same light like bayonets. The vehicle came nearer, and arrived opposite Owen's door, when the driver pulled the rein and gave a shout, and the panting and sweating horses stopped. Miss Aldclyffe's carriage they all exclaimed. Owen went out. Is Miss Gray at home, said the man. A note for her, and I am to wait for an answer. Cytherea read in the handwriting of the rector of Carry Ford. Dear Miss Gray Miss Aldclyffe is ill, though not dangerously. She continually repeats your name, and now wishes very much to see you. If you possibly can, come in the carriage very sincerely yours. John Ronham. How comes she ill? Owen inquired of the coachman. 
She caught a violent cold by standing out of doors in the damp, on the night the steward ran away. Ever since, till this morning, she complained of fullness and heat in the chest. This morning the maid ran in and told her suddenly that Manston had killed himself in jail she shrieked broke a blood vessel and fell upon the floor. Severe internal hemorrhage continued for some time and then stopped. They say she is sure to get over it, but she herself says no. She has suffered from it before. Cytheria was ready in a few moments, and entered the carriage. 7 o'clock p.m. Soft as was Cytheria's motion along the corridors of Knapwater House, the preternaturally keen intelligence of the suffering woman caught the maiden's well-known footfall. She entered the sick chamber with suspended breath. In the room everything was so still, and sensation was as it were so rarefied by solicitude, that thinking seemed acting, and the lady's weak act of trying to live a silent wrestling with all the powers of the universe. Nobody was present but Mr. Ronham, the nurse having left the room on Cytheria's entry, and the physician and surgeon being engaged in a whispered conversation in a side chamber. Their patient had been pronounced out of danger. Cytheria went to the bedside, and was instantly recognized. Oh, what a change Miss Aldclyffe dependent upon pillows and yet not a forbidding change. With weakness had come softness of aspect, the haughtiness was extracted from the frail thin countenance, and a sweeter mild placidity had taken its place. Miss Aldclyffe signified to Mr. Ronham that she would like to be alone with Cytheria. Cytheria, she faintly whispered the instant the door was closed. Cytheria clasped the lady's weak hand, and sank beside her. Miss Aldclyffe whispered again. They say I am certain to live, but I know that I am certainly going to die. They know, I think, and hope. I know best, but we'll leave that. Cytheria oh Cytheria, can you forgive me? Her companion pressed her hand. But you don't know yet you don't know yet, the invalid murmured. It is forgiveness for that misrepresentation to Edward Springrove that I implore, and for putting such force upon him that which caused all the train of your innumerable ills. I know all all. And I do forgive you. Not in a hasty impulse that is revoked when coolness comes, but deliberately and sincerely, as I myself hope to be forgiven, I accord you my forgiveness now. Tears streamed from Miss Aldclyffe's eyes, and mingled with those of her young companion, who could not restrain hers for sympathy. Expressions of strong attachment, interrupted by emotion, burst again and again from the broken-spirited woman. But you don't know my motive. Oh, if you only knew it, how you would pity me then. Cytheria did not break the pause which ensued, and the elder woman appeared now to nerve herself by a superhuman effort. She spoke on in a voice weak as a summer breeze, and full of intermission, and yet there pervaded it a steadiness of intention that seemed to demand firm tones to bear it out worthily. Cytheria, she said, listen to me before I die. A long time ago more than thirty years ago a young girl of seventeen was cruelly betrayed by her cousin, a wild officer of six and twenty. He went to India, and died. One night when that miserable girl had just arrived home with her parents from Germany, where her baby had been born, she took all the money she possessed, pinned it on her infant's bosom, together with a letter, stating, among other things, what she wished the child's Christian name to be, wrapped up the little thing, and walked with it to Clapham. Here, in a retired street, she selected a house. She placed the child on the doorstep and knocked at the door, then ran away and watched. They took it up and carried it indoors. Now that her poor baby was gone, the girl blamed herself bitterly for cruelty towards it, and wished she had adopted her parents' counsel to secretly hire a nurse. She longed to see it. She didn't know what to do. She wrote in an assumed name to the woman who had taken it in, and asked her to meet the writer with the infant at certain places she named. These were hotels or coffee houses in Chelsea, Pimlico, or Hammersmith. The woman, being well paid, always came and asked no questions. At one meeting at an inn in Hammersmith she made her appearance without the child, and told the girl it was so ill that it would not live through the night. The news, and fatigue, brought on a fainting fit. Miss Aldclyffe's sobs choked her utterance, and she became painfully agitated. Cytheria, 
pale and amazed at what she heard, wept for her, bent over her, and begged her not to go on speaking. Yes I must, she cried, between her sobs. I will I must go on and I must tell yet more plainly, you must hear it before I am gone, Cytherea. The sympathizing and astonished girl sat down again. The name of the woman who had taken the child was Manston. She was the widow of a schoolmaster. She said she had adopted the child of a relation. Only one man ever found out who the mother was. He was the keeper of the inn in which she fainted, and his silence she has purchased ever since. A twelve month past fifteen months and the saddened girl met a man at her father's house named Gray your father, Cytherea, then unmarried. Ah, such a man in experience now perceived what it was to be loved in spirit and in truth but it was too late. Had he known her secret he would have cast her out. She withdrew from him by an effort, and pined. Years and years afterwards, when she became mistress of a fortune and estates by her father's death, she formed the weak scheme of having near her the son whom, in her father's lifetime, she had been forbidden to recognize. Cytherea, you know who that weak woman is. By such toilsome labor as this I got him here as my steward. And I wanted to see him your husband, Cytherea the husband of my true lover's child. It was a sweet dream to me. Pity me oh, pity me to die unloved is more than I can bear I loved your father, and I love him now. That was the burden of Cytherea Aldclyffe. I suppose you must leave me again you always leave me, she said, after holding the young woman's hand a long while in silence. No indeed I'll stay always. Do you like me to stay? Miss Aldclyffe in the jaws of death was Miss Aldclyffe still, though the old fire had degenerated to mere phosphorescence now. But you are your brother's housekeeper. Yes. Well, of course you cannot stay with me on a sudden like this. Go home, or he will be at a loss for things. And tomorrow morning come again, won't you, dearest, come again we'll fetch you. But you mustn't stay now, and put Owen out. Oh no it would be absurd. The absorbing concern about trifles of daily routine, which is so often seen in very sick people, was present here. Cytherea promised to go home, and come the next morning to stay continuously. Stay till I die then, will you not? Yes, till I die I shan't die till tomorrow. We hope for your recovery all of us. I know best. Come at six o'clock, darling. As soon as ever I can, return Cytherea tenderly. But six is too early you will have to think of your brother's breakfast. Leave Toll Church at eight, will you? Cytherea consented to this. Miss Aldclyffe would never have known had her companion stayed in the house all night, but the honesty of Cytherea's nature rebelled against even the friendly deceit which such a proceeding would have involved. An arrangement was come to whereby she was to be taken home in the pony carriage instead of the brougham that fetched her, the carriage to put up at Tollchurch Farm for the night, and on that account to be in readiness to bring her back earlier. March the 30th Daybreak The third and last instance of Cytherea's subjection to those periodic terrors of the night which had emphasized her connection with the Aldclyffe name and blood occurred at the present date. It was about four o'clock in the morning when Cytherea, though most probably dreaming, seemed to awake and instantly was transfixed by a sort of spell, that had in it more of awe than of a fright. At the foot of her bed, looking her in the face with an expression of entreaty beyond the power of words to portray, was the form of Miss Aldclyffe wan and distinct. No motion was perceptible in her, but longing earnest longing was written in every feature. Cytherea believed she exercised her waking judgment as usual in thinking, without a shadow of doubt, that Miss Aldclyffe stood before her in flesh and blood. Reason was not sufficiently alert to lead Cytherea to ask herself how such a thing could have occurred. I would have remained with you why would you not allow me to stay Cytherea exclaimed. The spell was broken, she became broadly awake, and the figure vanished. It was in the grey time of dawn. She trembled in a sweat of disquiet, and not being able to endure the thought of her brother being asleep she went and tapped at his door. Owen. He was not a heavy sleeper, and it was verging upon his time to rise. What do you want, Cytherea? I ought not to have left Knapwater last night. 
I wish I had not. I really think I will start at once. She wants me, I know. What time is it? A few minutes past four. You had better not. Keep to the time agreed upon. Consider, we should have such a trouble in rousing the driver, and other things. Upon the whole it seemed wiser not to act on a mere fancy. She went to bed again. An hour later, when Owen was thinking of getting up, a knocking came to the front door. The next minute something touched the glass of Owen's window. He waited the noise was repeated. A little gravel had been thrown against it to arouse him. He crossed the room, pulled up the blind, and looked out. A solemn white face was gazing upwards from the road, expectantly straining to catch the first glimpse of a person within the panes. It was the face of a nap water man sitting on horseback. Owen saw his errand. There is an unmistakable look in the face of every man who brings tidings of death. Gray opened the window. Miss Aldclyffe, said the messenger, and paused. Ah dead. Yes she is dead. When did she die? At ten minutes past four, after another effusion. She knew best, you see, sir. I started directly, by the rector's orders. Sequel. Fifteen months have passed, and we are brought on to Midsummer Night. The picture presented is the interior of the old belfry of Carry Ford Church, at ten o'clock in the evening. Six Carry Ford men and one stranger are gathered there, beneath the light of a flaring candle stuck on a piece of wood against the wall. The six Carry Ford men are the well-known ringers of the fine-toned old bells in the key of F which have been music to the ears of Carry Ford Parish and the outlying districts for the last four hundred years. The stranger is an assistant, who has appeared from nobody knows where. The six natives in their shirt sleeves, and without hats pull and catch frantically at the dancing bell ropes, the locks of their hair waving in the breeze created by their quick motions, the stranger, who has the treble bell, does likewise, but in his right mind and coat. Their ever-changing shadows mingle on the wall in an endless variety of kaleidoscopic forms, and the eyes of all the seven are religiously fixed on a diagram like a large addition sum, which is chalked on the floor. Vividly contrasting with the yellow light of the candle upon the four unplastered walls of the tower, and upon the faces and clothes of the men, is the scene discernible through the screen beneath the tower archway. At the extremity of the long mysterious avenue of the nave and chancel can be seen shafts of moonlight streaming in at the east window of the church blue, phosphoric, and ghostly. A thorough renovation of the bell ringing machinery and accessories had taken place in anticipation of an interesting event. New ropes had been provided, every bell had been carefully shifted from its carriage, and the pivots lubricated. Bright red sallies of woolen texture soft to the hands and easily caught glowed on the ropes in place of the old ragged knots, all of which newness in small details only rendered more evident the irrepressible aspect of age in the mass surrounding them. The triple bob major was ended, and the ringers wiped their faces and rolled down their shirt sleeves, previously to tucking away the ropes and leaving the place for the night. Piff h h h a good forty minutes, said a man with a streaming face and blowing out his breath one of the pair who had taken the tenor bell. Our friend here pulled proper well that a did seeing he's but a stranger, said Clerk Cricket, who had just resigned the second rope, and addressing the man in the black coat. A did, said the rest. I enjoyed it much, said the man modestly. What we should ha done without you words can't tell. The man that d belong by rights to that there bell is ill o two gallons o old cider. And now so's, remarked the fifth ringer, as pertaining to the last allusion, we'll finish this drop o' metheglin and cider, and every man home along straight as a line. W.I. all my heart, Clerk Cricket replied. And the Lord send if I ha' n't done my duty by Master Teddy Springrove that I have so. And the rest o' us, they said, as the cup was handed round. I... I in ringin' but I was spaken in a spiritual sense o' oh, this mornin's business o' oh, mine up by the chancel rails there. Twas very convenient to lug her here and marry her instead o' oh, don't it at that to penny ha'penny town o' oh, budm th. Very convenient. Very. There was a little fee for Master Cricket. Ah well. Money's money very much so very I always have said it. 
but twas a pretty sight for the nation. He colored up like any maid, that a did. Well enough amid color up. Tis no small matter for a man to play W.I. fire. Whatever it may be to a woman, said the clerk absently. Thou art he thinkin' o' thy wife, clerk, said Gadweedy. She'll play W.I. it again when thou est he got mildewed. Well let her, God bless her, for I'm but a poor third man, I. The Lord have mercy upon the fourth. I, Teddy's got his own at last. What little white ears that made H.E.V., to be sure choose your wife as you choose your pig a small ear and a small tail that was always my joke when I was a merry feller, a years agone now but Teddy's got her. Poor chap, he was gettin' as thin as a hermit W.I. grief so was she. Maybe she'll pick up now. True tis nader's law, which no man shall gainsay. Ah, well do I bear in mind what I said to Pa-son Ronham, about thy mother's family o seven, Gad, the very first week of his common here, when I was just in my prime. And how many daughters has that poor weedy got, clerk, he says. Six, sir, says I, and every one of em has a brother poor woman, says he, a dozen children give her this half-sovereign from me. Clerk. A laughed a good five minutes afterwards, when he found out my merry nader a did. But there, tis over w.i. me now. Enter in the church is the ruin of a man's wit for wits nothing without a faint shatter o' sin. If so be Teddy and the lady had been kept apart for life, they'd both ha died, said Gad emphatically. But now instead o' death there'll be increase o' life, answered the clerk. It all went proper well said the fifth bell ringer. They didn't flee off to Babylonish places not they. He struck up an attitude here's Master Springrove standin so, here's the married woman standin likewise, here they de walk across to Knapp Water House, and there they de bite in the chimney corner, hard and fast. Yes, twas a pretty weddin', and well attended, added the clerk. Here was my lady herself red as scarlet, here was Master Springrove, Lucan as if he half wished he'd never a come ah, poor souls the men always do the women do stand it best the maid was in her glory. Though she was so shy the glory shone plain through that shy skin. Ah, it did so's. I, said Gad, and there was Tim Tankins and his five journeyman carpenters, standin' on tiptoe and peepin' in at the chancel winders. There was Derryman Dodman waitin' in his new spring cart to see em come out whip in hand that a was. Then up comes two master tailors. Then there was Christopher Runt W.I. his pickaxe and shovel. There was women folk and there was men folk traipsin' up and down churchyard till they wore a path W.I. traipsin' so lettin' the squallin' children slip down through their arms and nearly skin an O.M. And these were all over and above the gentry and Sunday clothes folk inside. Well, I seed Mr. Gray at last dressed up quite the dand. Well, Mr. Gray says I from the top o' churchyard wall, how's yourself? Mr. Gray never spoke he'd prided away his hearin'. Sees the man, I didn't want en to spack. Teddy hears it, and turns round, all right, Gad says he, and laughed like a boy. There's more in Teddy. Well, said Clerk Cricket, turning to the man in black, now you've been among us so long, and de know us so well. Won't ye tell us what ye ve come here for, and what your trade is? I am no trade, said the thin man, smiling, and I came to see the wickedness of the land. I said thou wast one o' the devil's brood w.i. thy black clothes, replied a sturdy ringer, who had not spoken before. No, the truth is, said the thin man, retracting at this horrible translation, I came for a walk because it is a fine evening. Now let's be off, neighbors, the clerk interrupted. The candle was inverted in the socket, and the whole party stepped out into the churchyard. The moon was shining within a day or two of full, and just overlooked the three or four vast yews that stood on the southeast side of the church, and rose in unvaried and flat darkness against the illuminated atmosphere behind them. Good night, the clerk said to his comrades, when the door was locked. My nearest way is through the park. I suppose mine is too, said the stranger. I am going to the railway station. Of course come on. The two men went over a stile to the west, 
the remainder of the party going into the road on the opposite side. And so the romance has ended well, the clerk's companion remarked, as they brushed along through the grass. But what is the truth of the story about the property? Now look here, neighbor, said Clerk Cricket, if so be you'll tell me what your line o' life is, and your purpose in common here today, I'll tell you the truth about the wedding particulars. Very well I will when you have done, said the other man. Tis a bargain, and this is the right o' the story. When Miss Aldclyffe's will was opened, it was found to have been drawn up on the very day that Manston her love child married Miss Cytheria Gray. And this is what that deep woman did. Deep? She was as deep as the North Star. She bequeathed all her property, real and personal, to the wife of Aeneas Manston with one exception, failin' her life to her husband, failin' his life to the heirs of his head body I would say, failin' them to her absolutely and her heirs forever, failin' these to pa son Ronham, and so on to the end o' oh, the human race. Now do you see the depth of her scheme? Why, although upon the surface it appeared her whole property was for Miss Cytheria, by the word wife being used, and not Cytheria's name, whoever was the wife o' Manston would come in for tea. Wasn't that raw depth? It was done, of course, that her son Aeneas, under any circumstances, should be master o' the property, without folk knowing it was her son or suspecting anything, as they would if it had been left to end straightway. A clever arrangement and what was the exception? The payment of a legacy to her relative, Pa son Ronham. And Miss Cytheria was now Manston's widow and only relative, and inherited all absolutely. True, she did. Well, says she, I shan't have it she didn't like the notion o' getting anything through Manston, naturally enough, pretty dear. She waved her right in favour o' Mr. Ronham. Now, if there's a man in the world that d care nothing about land I don't say there is, but if there is tis our Pa son. He's like a snail. He's a growth so to the shape o' that their rectory that a wouldn't think eleven it even in name. Tis yours, Miss Gray, says he. No, tis yours, says she. Tis and mine, says he. The crown had cast his eyes upon the case, thinking o' forfeiture by felony but twas no such thing, and a jid it up, too. Did you ever hear such a tale, three people, a man, and a woman? and a crown neither o'm in a madhouse flingin' an estate backwards and forwards like an apple or nut. Well, it ended in this way. Mr. Ronham took it, young Springgrove was had as agent and steward, and put to live in Knapp Water House, close here at hand just as if twas his own. He does just what he'd like Mr. Ronham never interferin' and hither today he's brought his new wife, Cytheria. And a settlement ha been drawn up this very day, whereby their children, heirs, etc., be to inherit after Mr. Ronham's death. Good fortune came at last. Her brother, too, is done well. He came in first man in some architectural competition, and is about to move to London. Here's the house, look. Stap out from these bushes, and you'll get a clear sight o't. They emerged from the shrubbery, breaking off towards the lake, and down the south slope. When they arrived exactly opposite the centre of the mansion, they halted. It was a magnificent picture of the English country house. The whole of the severe regular front, with its columns and cornices, was built of a white smoothly faced freestone, which appeared in the rays of the moon as pure as pentelic marble. The sole objects in the scene rivalling the fairness of the façade were a dozen swans floating upon the lake. At this moment the central door at the top of the steps was opened and two figures advanced into the light. Two contrasting figures were they. A young lithe woman in an airy fairy dress Cytheria Springgrove, a young man in black stereotype Raymond Edward, her husband. They stood at the top of the steps together, looking at the moon, the water, and the general loveliness of the prospect. That's the married man and wife there, I've illustrated my story by raw livened specimens, the clerk whispered. To be sure. How close together they do stand you couldn't slip a penny piece between em that you couldn't beautiful to see it, isn't it beautiful? But this is a private path, and we won't let em see us, as all the ringers be gone there to a supper and dance tomorrow night. 
the speaker and his companion softly moved on, passed through the wicket, and into the coach road. Arrived at the clerk's house at the further boundary of the park, they paused to part. Now for your half o' the bargain, said Clerk Cricket. What's your line o' life, and what do ye come here for? I'm the reporter to the Casterbridge Chronicle, and I come to pick up the news. Good night. Meanwhile Edward and Cytheria, after lingering on the steps for several minutes, slowly descended the slope to the lake. The skiff was lying alongside. Oh, Edward, said Cytheria. You must do something that has just come into my head. Well, dearest I know. Yes give me one half minute's row on the lake here now, just as you did on Budmouth Bay three years ago. He handed her into the boat, and almost noiselessly pulled off from shore. When they were halfway between the two margins of the lake, he paused and looked at her. Ah, darling, I remember exactly how I kissed you that first time, said Springrove. You were there as you are now. I unshipped the skulls in this way. Then I turned round and sat beside you in this way. Then I put my hand on the other side of your little neck. I think it was just on my cheek, in this way. Ah, so it was. Then you moved that soft red mouth round to mine. But, dearest you pressed it round if you remember, and of course I couldn't then help letting it come to your mouth without being unkind to you, and I wouldn't be that. And then I put my cheek against that cheek, and turned my two lips round upon those two lips, and kissed them so.